If you had the immense powers of Yamamoto Shijikuni Genryusai, the captain commander of the Gate 13, and the leader of the Shinigami Soul Society, could you solo the Narutoverse? What's up, guys? It's your boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to the full series of What If I Reincarnated as Yamamoto Genryusai in Naruto and Save the Uzumaki Clan. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel, and for more exclusive content. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. The Uzumaki country was enveloped in a thick haze. Within the Uzumaki family's meeting room, the third elder suggested, we must relocate to a new location and live in secrecy. The first elder disagreed, leaving is not an option. They have surely considered our escape, and fleeing now would only hasten our demise. Let us wait for Kanoha. They will surely provide us with support once they learn of our situation. The second elder chimed in happily, yes, you are right. Kanoha is our ally. They will undoubtedly come to our aid. The fourth elder eagerly added, just wait until Kanoha arrives. We will show Karigakur, Awagakur, and Kumagakur what the Yuzumaki clan is truly capable of. He could already envision his fantasies becoming reality. The third elder furrowed his brow and responded, but what about the safety of our people? The longer we stay here, the more vulnerable we become. The first elder nodded in understanding, I know it's a difficult decision, but we must trust in our allies. Kanoha has always been there for us in times of need. The second elder chimed in again, we must have faith in our village and our allies. They will not abandon us. The fourth elder's eyes glinted with excitement, yes, and when they arrive, we will fight with all our might. We will not let our enemies trample over our homeland. The Uzumaki family patriarch, who also held the title of Daimyo of the Uzumaki country, watched as the elders discussed their options. Unlike them, he was not naive and fully understood the workings of politics. He knew that the Uzumaki family did not have much to offer Kanoha, and therefore, it was unlikely that Kanoha would risk offending three major villages, just to protect them. The Patriarch understood that if the Hokage had been from the Senju family, there might have been some hope as they had promised to be eternal friends with the Uzumaki family. However, with Saratobi here as in his Hokage, who was obviously not from the Senju family, the Patriarch's hopes were dwindling. He knew that they had to be realistic and face the situation at hand. The Patriarch observed the conversation with a stoic expression. Finally, he spoke up, I understand your concerns, but we must be practical. We do not have much to offer Kanoha, and it is unlikely that they will risk offending three major villages for our sake. The first elder looked taken aback, but surely, our long-standing alliance with Kanoha the Patriarch interrupted, alliances can only go so far. We must face the reality of the situation. We need to focus on protecting our people and finding a solution that does not rely solely on Kanoha's aid. The third elder nodded in agreement, he's right. We need to think of a plan that takes into account our own strengths and resources. The Patriarch looked at them with a sense of urgency, we need to act fast. We cannot rely on others to solve our problems. We must find a solution ourselves. The fourth elder looked uncertain, but what can we do? We are surrounded by powerful enemies. The Patriarch's expression softened, we may not have much, but we still have our strength, our determination, and our will to protect our people. We will find a way. At this moment, a messenger entered the meeting room. Patriarch, as per your orders, I went to Kanoha to request assistance. I met with the Hokage of Kanoha and made the request, but they said they would send support after high-level discussions within Kanoha. On my way back, I encountered a team of Kanoha ninjas who were stationed at our borders. When I inquired, they told me they had received orders to go to Sunagakur, reported the messenger. The meeting room fell silent upon hearing the messenger's words. How could they? said the second elder with an ugly expression. Not only are they refusing to support us, but they have also removed their army from our borders, added the third elder. The second Hokage stationed that army on our borders to support us if needed. This is a clear abandonment of our alliance, said the first elder. The fourth elder asked the messenger if he had informed Mido of the situation. I met with her, but she told me that leaving Kanoha may cause other villages to perceive Kanoha as a threat, potentially disrupting the peace of the ninja world. 
As a strategic asset of Kanoha, she cannot leave, replied the messenger. Upon hearing this, the faces of the elders turned ugly. They had not expected Mido, who was not just any member of the Yuzumaki family, but also the princess of the Yuzumaki country and elder sister of the patriarch, to refuse to take action. The second elder chimed in, we have been allies for generations, and they are breaking their word. This is unacceptable. The fourth elder turned to the messenger and asked, did you tell them the urgency of the situation? Yes, I explained everything to the hookage and requested immediate assistance, replied the messenger. The second elder voiced his concerns, must we really accept the conditions put forth by Karigakur, Awagakur, and Kumagakur? The first elder responded firmly, absolutely not. We cannot give away our sealing technique or our children. Our Yuzumaki family is known for our sealing technique, and if we give it away, what value will our clan have in this ninja world? And what of our children's future? We cannot allow them to be treated as bargaining chips. The fourth elder agreed, the thought of how our children might be treated is terrifying. We cannot accept these conditions. The patriarch interjected, we need not discuss this matter any further. As for the issue with Kanoha, we must keep it under wraps to avoid causing panic. He then turned to the messenger and thanked him for his report, assuring him that they would take appropriate action. As the messenger left, the patriarch rose from his seat and announced, I will seek counsel from my uncle. Perhaps he can offer some advice. With that, he left the meeting room, leaving the elders to continue their discussion and devise a plan to protect their clan and their values. A century has passed since I arrived in this world through transmigration. Initially, my excitement was akin to any Anime fans if they could visit their favorite Anime world. Specifically, I landed in the Naruto universe. However, my joy was short-lived upon discovering that I was born during the bleak Warring States period. Despite this, I believed I could become a powerful ninja with the aid of a cheat, only to realize I had none. Nevertheless, I was born with the purest Yuzumaki blood in my family, which made me a genius, and allowed me to live up to my potential. At the age of 15, I discovered that the Ichiha Patriarch had a son named Ichiha Tajima, who was father of the dance king Ichiha Madara. Similarly, the Senju Patriarch had a son named Bitsuma Senju, who was the father of the ninja god, Senju Hashirama. I lived my life to the fullest, pursuing my passions and even marrying and having a son. However, at the age of 40, I received devastating news of my son's death. He was merely 18 years old, killed by a clan led by a single cage level powerhouse. Overcome by fury, I destroyed the clan in my wrath. As I excelled in fire ninjutsu and employed it to annihilate the clan, I was bestowed with the title of fire god by the world. Madara and Hashirama were born around the same time. Following my son's death, my wife was deeply affected and passed away within five years. In response, I retreated from the ninja world and lived in seclusion. My younger brother, who was of similar age to Tajima and Bitsuma, was appointed as the patriarch as I had no desire to take on the role. His son is the current patriarch, and his eldest daughter, Yuzumaki Mido, became the wife of Senju Hashirama. I gave up everything and lived like an ordinary old man who waited for his last days. I relinquished everything and lived out my remaining years as an ordinary old man, waiting for my time to come. However, when Kanoha was formally established, I heard a sound and was astonished to find a panel before my eyes displaying a timer indicating 28 years to come. Therefore, from that day forward, I refrained from participating in any clan-related activities as I anticipated the day to arrive. Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi was remembering his past. At this moment he saw the timer on the panel. 0030020010 clock ding. Congratulations on your 100th birthday. Ding. Congratulations on getting template of the captain of the first division of the Gatei 13 Shijikuni Yamamoto Genryusai. Ding. Congratulations on getting absolute fire control. Ding. Congratulations on getting 30% template progress for the first time. Ding. Congratulations on increasing your lifespan by 100 years. Upon hearing a series of ding ding, Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi's heart was filled with shock and disbelief. He could feel a strange energy coursing through his veins, invigorating him like never before. Even mundane tasks, such as walking, now seemed effortless. His eyes widened in surprise as he surveyed the rewards that lay before him. But what really took his breath away was the template he had received. It was none other than Captain Yamamoto's one of the oldest and most powerful Shinigami to have ever existed. As he gazed at the template in awe, he felt his old worn-out crutch begin to transform. 
With a flick of his wrist, he could now transform it into the mighty Zanpakuto known as Ryujin Jaka, one of the most powerful weapons in all of the Soul Society. The sheer power that coursed through his body was almost overwhelming. System generate my panel dot set Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi. Ding. Generating panel. Name. Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi template. Yamamoto G E N R Y U S A I 30%. Strength. Cage level props. Ryujin Jaka ability. Fire control system how can I improve my template progress dot ask Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi. Ding. Host can meditate on his Anthakudo to increase the template progress dot system replied. Reasonable dot thought Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi. The head of the family arrived at a courtyard, which appeared aged and situated in a corner of the Yuzumaki family's property, and proceeded to knock on the door. Knock knock. Come in came a voice from inside. Upon entering, the patriarch beheld an elderly man seated in a chair, with his eyes shut and clutching a crutch with both hands. Despite his age, the man exuded a remarkable grandeur while sitting there. This old man is none other than Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi. You know I don't like to be disturbed, boy. Has something happened in the family? Asked Yuzumaki Kagasuchi. I am sorry for disturbing you uncle, but I want to seek advice from you as our family is facing a huge crisis, said the patriarch of Yuzumaki. What crisis you are talking about that even you, a dignified patriarch of Yuzumaki family, can't solve, that you have to ask an old man such as me for advice, said Kagasuchi. In an infuriated and helpless tone, the Yuzumaki family patriarch declared, Uncle, Iwagakur, Karigakur, and Kumagakur are demanding that we surrender our family's sealing techniques and children, otherwise, they will launch an attack on our Yuzumaki country, and massacre everyone. Who, what gives them the confidence that they could destroy our family? Asked Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi with keen interest. Living for a hundred years had caused his memories of the events in Naruto to become hazy, and he only recalled a few key moments, not the entire story. The reasons are primarily twofold. Firstly, due to the scarcity of geniuses in the Yuzumaki family, I am the only cage-level powerhouse, and even I have begun to feel the effects of aging, which has somewhat diminished my strength. Secondly, Kanoha has abandoned us and not followed the alliance treaty between the Yuzumaki family and Kanoha, explained the patriarch, his tone heavy with concern. Hmm, the lack of talented geniuses is indeed a problem. What about Mido? Has she come to offer support? Inquired Kagasuchi. If my memory serves me correctly, after the passing of Hashirama and Taburama, she should be the most senior person in Kanoha right now. Furthermore, she should be the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, he added. I dispatched a messenger to request her and Kanoha's assistance, but she refused, citing that being the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, makes her a strategic asset to Kanoha, and she cannot leave the village, replied the patriarch. If she genuinely desired to offer her support, she could have exerted pressure on the Hokage, and he would never dare to defy her, remarked Kagatsuchi. The current Hokage is Saratobi Hirzen, a member of the Saratobi family. If she were to exert excessive pressure on him, it could cause instability in the village, which she would not want to see, stated the patriarch, who was attempting to defend his older sister. No, as the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, she must be the most powerful person in Kanoha, and no one would dare to defy her. However, if I'm not mistaken, she shares the same concerns as the Hokage regarding the village's well-being. If Shia Kanoha supports us, they would offend three major villages simultaneously, and if a war breaks out, Kanoha would suffer significant losses, which neither she nor the Hokage desires to see, explained Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi. Although the patriarch was aware that his uncle's analysis was nearly accurate, he was reluctant to accept it. The Yuzumaki patriarch spoke in a sorrowful tone, expressing his uncertainty, Uncle, I find myself in a dilemma. I am unsure whether to send some of our seedlings outside the borders of Yuzumaki country, or to fight until the bitter end. Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi expressed a strong sense of confidence as he responded to the statement made earlier. Your words seem to imply that our family is on the verge of destruction, but let me remind you that I am still alive and well. As long as I exist, the Yuzumaki family will continue to flourish and thrive. You can rest assured that nothing will happen to us, as long as I am here to protect and lead our clan. As the Yuzumaki patriarch spoke hesitantly, Uncle, but you are clearly, his words were abruptly cut off by Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi, who interrupted with a booming voice. At that very moment, a tremendous amount of chakra, combined with an overwhelming spiritual pressure, surged out from his body, leaving the patriarch breathless and struggling to keep his composure. 
With a look of horror, the patriarch stared at his uncle, unable to fathom the sheer magnitude of the power that was being unleashed from an old man who was well over a century old, and could pass away at any moment. The patriarch was left in awe, realizing that age was clearly just a number for the Uzumaki clan, and their powers only grew stronger with time. The Uzumaki patriarch listened intently as Uzumaki Kagetsuchi responded to his dilemma, his voice oozing with confidence, My dear nephew, do not be afraid. The Uzumaki family has survived countless battles, and we will continue to stand strong. We have faced worse threats than this and emerged victorious. The patriarch tried to interject, but uncle, the situation we face Uzumaki Kagetsuchi cut him off, his voice booming, I know the situation, but let me tell you this. I am not just some old man waiting for death. I am still here, with years of experience and a powerful chakra within me. As long as I am alive, the Uzumaki clan will not falter. The chakra emanating from Kagetsuchi's body was almost too much for the patriarch to handle, leaving him breathless and overwhelmed. He couldn't believe that an elderly man could possess such an immense amount of power. The patriarch couldn't help but admire his uncle's unwavering strength and determination. With a newfound sense of hope, the patriarch bowed to his uncle and said, Thank you for your guidance, uncle. I will follow your lead and do everything in my power to protect our clan. Following their conversation, the patriarch left the courtyard and headed towards the meeting room to discuss their next steps. After the patriarch left, Kagasuchi remained in the courtyard, deep in meditation as he focused on honing his Ryujin Jaka, and becoming more familiar with his newfound power. At that moment, within the confines of the Uzumaki family meeting room, the elders sat in a state of profound despair. They had been racking their brains trying to come up with a plan to save their beloved clan from the looming crisis, but so far, all their efforts had been in vain. The room was filled with the tense atmosphere of frustration and helplessness, as the elders exchanged worried glances, unsure of what their next move should be. As he entered the meeting room, the Uzumaki patriarch took in the despondent expressions on the faces of the elders, and felt a wave of disappointment wash over him. He shook his head in dismay before making his way to his seat, and settling in with a heavy sigh. The atmosphere in the room was thick with tension and anxiety, as the elders exchanged worried glances and whispered amongst themselves. The patriarch sat in silence for a few moments, taking in the somber mood of the room before finally speaking up. I know that things look grim right now, but we cannot afford to give up hope. We must continue to work together and come up with a plan to save our family from this crisis. The decision has been made after consulting with my uncle. We have only one option to fight. Therefore, I order all of you to prepare a defensive enchantment that will cover the entire Uzumaki village. Make sure to supplement it with chakra continuously, announced the patriarch. The second elder attempted to speak up, but was interrupted by the patriarch's stern tone. Follow my orders without questioning them, he declared. The other elders, recognizing the patriarch's authority and sense of urgency, remained silent. With that, the patriarch left the meeting room to oversee the preparations for the upcoming battle. Over the course of the next two days, the elders worked tirelessly to fulfill the Uzumaki patriarch's orders. With great effort, they were able to arrange for a powerful enchantment barrier that spanned across the entire Uzumaki village. The barrier enclosed every member of the Uzumaki clan within its protective shield, providing them with a sense of safety and security against the dangers that lurked outside. The elders ensured that the barrier was reinforced with a steady supply of chakra, which would help to keep it strong and impenetrable for as long as possible. At the same time on the nearest island located near the Uzumaki country. Inside a camp sat Jonans from three major villages, and their commanders were sitting side by side. Although unanimously Kanoha isn't going to interfere, but these three villages also have to give face to Kanoha, by not sending any cage level powerhouse, or else Kanoha may also participate in this. Secondly no leader of the village will be foolish enough to enter other countries' territories. The scouts I sent to Uzumaki country have reported back. According to them, the Uzumaki family has raised an enchantment barrier around their village. This is a clear indication that they have no interest in accepting our offer, spoke Raiden, the commander of Kumagakur. I have been saying from the very beginning that we should attack immediately. Why waste time? See, they didn't even listen to us, and now we have wasted precious time, Kai, the leader of Karigakur and also the strongest of the seven swordsmen, spoke up. With the Uzumaki family's clear rejection of our offer, we have no choice but to initiate an attack, declared Daichi, the leader of the Wagakur. Very well. 
All ninjas are to be informed to prepare for tomorrow morning's march towards Uzumaki country, declared Raiden, signaling the end of the meeting. After hearing Raiden's decision, everyone present in the meeting nodded in agreement, and left to inform their respective ninjas, to prepare for the upcoming attack on the Uzumaki country. As the sun began to rise, casting a golden glow across the land, each of the skilled ninjas prepared themselves for the impending attack. With unwavering determination, they made their way onto the ship, their hearts beating with anticipation as they set course towards the Uzumaki country, their minds already strategizing the best plan of action for the battle that awaited them. At the same time inside the meeting room of Uzumaki family, Patriarch the ninja from three major villages have started moving, and they must be coming to attack us. said second elder in panic. Quiet even if an elder like yourself start panicking then what will happen to the ordinary ninja of our family? reprimanded the patriarch. Even if we don't panic, but we have to formulate a plan or something to avoid our extermination. said third elder. Even though other two elders didn't speak, but they also looked towards patriarch for a solution. Okay don't look at me like that uncle said that he will fight himself in this battle. So we can rest assured dot explain patriarch. Hearing words of patriarch every elder present in the meeting room were stunned they didn't know what to say for a second. The first elder cleared his throat before voicing his concerns, careful not to come off as disrespectful. I don't mean to be insensitive, but it's worth considering that the your uncle's age may be well over a century, if not more. We cannot predict when he may pass away, and it's a risk to entrust him with fighting alongside us, while also expecting him to guarantee our safety. It's a lot to ask, he explained, his tone measured and thoughtful. Is it? A voice of great majesty filled the room, causing all heads to turn. At that moment, an old man with long, flowing white hair and a matching beard entered the space, supported by his trusty crutch. As soon as the patriarch caught sight of the venerable figure, he quickly vacated his seat and stood up in deference. The old man made his way to the now vacant seat and settled onto it, commanding the attention of all those present. Seeing such respectful act of the patriarch every elder also stood up and bowed towards the old man. I understand your concerns, first elder, but there is no need to explain. I am well aware of my physical condition, Kagetsuchi interjected, cutting off the first elder mid-sentence. If I say that I am able to fight, then I am able to fight. There is no reason to question my judgment, he declared, his voice strong and unwavering. Excuse me, elder, but have you considered that if we were to flee towards Konoha, they may come to our aid as our allies? The third elder suggested, his tone measured and thoughtful. HMPH, if an ally has abandoned you once, then they can do so again. Let me ask you this, how do you plan to flee with the entire Uzumaki family, including the non-ninja members and children? Are you willing to let them die while you run away on your own? Kagasuchi questioned, his tone stern and rebuking. Upon hearing this, the elders remained silent, as it appeared that what Kagasuchi had said was indeed true. Alright, let's stop discussing irrelevant matters. Kagasuchi inquired about the presence of chunins and higher ranked individuals in the Yuzumaki family. In response to Kagasuchi's question, the patriarch replied, There are 40 jonins and 250 chunins in our clan, uncle. Very well. Leave 10 jonins and 50 chunins to guard the clan, while the remaining ninjas prepare an enchantment barrier around me and the army for the upcoming fight. We cannot allow even a single intruder to escape. As for the monitoring ninjas, I will instruct them further, commanded Kagetsuchi. Uncle, you cannot confront the armies of three major villages alone. I cannot allow it, protested the patriarch. I am not asking you, but telling you. You will remain here with the family and protect them, stated Kagetsuchi in an unwavering tone. I don't mean any disrespect, but look at yourself. At your age, even walking can be considered a luxury. And now you're telling us that you'll fight against the alliance of three major villages alone. Are you kidding us? Asked the fourth elder with a slightly angry tone. Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi glanced at everyone in the meeting room, except for the patriarch. He noticed that all four elders shared the same expression, indicating that they agreed with the fourth elder. Know your place. Izumaki Kagasuchi spoke with such intensity that a huge amount of chakra and spiritual pressure was released from his body, forcing the elders to bow their heads to the ground. Is it just my imagination, or is the pressure emanating from uncle even stronger than before? Wondered the patriarch to himself. If Kagasuchi had known what his nephew was thinking, he wouldn't have been surprised. In the past three days, he had made significant progress and had become fully acquainted with his newfound power. Template. 
Yamamoto Genryusai, 30.3%. Listen to me carefully, patriarch, said Kagetsuchi, his voice low and commanding. I understand your concern, but I have no intention of abandoning my family. We must face this challenge head on, and I will lead the charge. As for the rest of you, I expect you to follow my lead and do everything in your power to protect our clan. The elders nodded in agreement, their heads still bowed. Good. Now, let's focus on the task at hand. We need to fortify our defenses and prepare for battle, continued Kagesuchi. Patriarch, I want you to oversee the preparation of the enchantment barrier. Fourth Elder, I need you to coordinate with the monitoring ninjas and keep me informed of any enemy movements. First and Second Elders, I want you to help me strategize our attack plan. The room fell silent as everyone processed Kagesuchi's orders. After a moment, the Patriarch spoke up. Understood, Uncle. We will do everything in our power to protect our family and our village. Good, said Kagesuchi, a fierce determination in his eyes. Now let's get to work. We have a battle to win. Upon receiving instructions from Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, everyone began carrying out their assigned tasks as directed by him. Kagetsuchi proceeded towards the shoreline, where the three major villages were about to disembark. At that moment, a young girl of approximately six years old, who was carrying a box, accidentally collided with him and fell to the ground. Ow ow ow! exclaimed the young girl as she got back up, gently rubbing her butt to soothe the discomfort caused by the fall. When she looked up, she noticed an elderly man nearby and asked. Grandpa are you alright? You didn't get hurt did you? Without a doubt, I am perfectly fine. I highly doubt that a petite and delicate young girl like yourself could inflict any harm upon my person, replied Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, his voice laced with a sense of reassurance and kindness, as a warm smile spread across his face, reflecting his amiable demeanor. HMPH. I am not a little girl anymore, can't you see that I'm carrying a large box? Retorted the girl, her expression a mixture of a pout and cuteness, as she tried to convey her point of view to Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi chuckled heartily and said, ha ha ha. If you're carrying such a massive box that it obscures your vision, then you're still a little one in my eyes. His jovial tone conveyed a sense of playful teasing, and he flashed a warm smile at the young girl. The young girl's face reddened with embarrassment, and she remained silent, choosing not to respond, and instead let out an indignant snort in response to Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi's playful comment. May I ask what your name is, little girl? inquired Kagetsuchi politely, showing a genuine interest in getting to know the young girl. With a friendly smile on her face, the girl replied, My name is Yuzumaki Kashina. As Yuzumaki Kashina introduced herself, Kagetsuchi's heart skipped a beat as he realized that she was, in fact, Naruto's mother. He couldn't help but wonder if fate would play out the same way it did in his previous experiences. The thought raced through his mind as he gazed upon the young girl before him. May I ask what it is that you are carrying in such a large box? Inquired Kagetsuchi, his interest piqued by the sheer size of the container that Yuzumaki Kashina was carrying. Oh no. I almost forgot. There are some essential supplies and food items in the box that I need to distribute to the people. I should get going now, exclaimed Kashina in a hurried tone, as she picked up the box and began to run off to her destination. As he watched Kashina run off with the box, Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi couldn't help but smile calling out to her with a friendly reminder, be careful on your way, and make sure not to fall again. Following that brief incident, Kagetsuchi proceeded with his voyage towards the shore. However, as soon as he departed from the spellbinding aura that encircled the village, he abruptly came to a halt. Kagetsuchi inquired, System, if I engage in combat while wearing my current attire, wouldn't it be susceptible to burning? And if I employ Ryuji and Jaka, wouldn't the risk be even greater? Ding. Congratulations to the host for obtaining a Shinigami outfit resembling that of Captain Yamamoto's. Kagetsuchi commanded, replace it with my current attire. In accordance with Kagetsuchi's command, a series of swift and seamless alterations were set into motion, culminating in the transformation of his original garb into the distinctive uniform of a Shinigami, complete with all the accompanying details and nuances of Captain Yamamoto's signature style. He persevered on his voyage until he was a considerable distance of three miles away from the shore. Kagetsuchi couldn't help but let out a small chuckle as he pondered the staggering numbers of their opposition. If I'm not mistaken, he mused to himself, there must be close to 4,500 highly skilled ninja assembled here, with roughly 1,500 representing each of the three major villages. 
The team formation of each village seems to consist of 30 skill jonin, 500 skill chunin, and the remaining force comprised primarily of genin. It's truly amusing to think of the reactions that the people of these villages would have, upon learning that their entire contingent, dispatched with the sole purpose of eliminating the Yuzumaki, had themselves been wiped out. He employed the mind's eye of the Kagur, utilizing his heightened sensory perception to detect the presence of the numerous ninja, as he patiently bit his time with his eyes tightly shut. Swish in that moment, the fourth elder, a wise-looking gentleman of around 50 years of age, approached Kagetsuchi and addressed him directly. Master Kagetsuchi, the team responsible for enchantment is fully prepared to commence their task at a moment's notice. All that is required is your command to initiate the process. Indeed, Kagetsuchi pondered for a moment before issuing his command, when the full force of the ninja from the three major villages sets foot upon our Yuzumaki land, and I begin to engage them in combat, that will be the precise moment for you to activate the enchantment, ensnaring them all within its grasp. With a simple acknowledgement, the fourth elder departed from Kagetsuchi's presence. Having relayed the message to Kagetsuchi, the fourth elder returned to the gathering of elders, and informed them of his interaction with the master. I have duly informed Master Kagetsuchi of our readiness to activate the enchantment. The second elder inquired, his tone betraying a hint of uncertainty. Do you truly believe that he is capable of facing off against 4500 highly trained ninja by himself? The first elder responded, urging his colleagues to have faith in their leader. We cannot afford to entertain any doubts at this juncture. Now is the time for us to place our complete trust in him. With a collective sigh, the rest of the elders resigned themselves to the situation, recognizing that they had done all they could, and the rest was simply a matter of fate. After an extensive period of anticipation, lasting nearly an hour, the ships bearing skilled ninjas hailing from three significant villages, finally reached the shores of the Yuzumaki country. Raiden, the esteemed commander of Kumagakur and appointed leader of the Alliance army, spoke with a firm yet compass tone, instructing his troops to disembark from the ship in an orderly fashion, and maintain their formation as they set foot on the shore. It was decided that a sole leader would be responsible for the operation, as multiple leaders could cause confusion and disarray within the army. In an impressively efficient manner, the highly trained ninjas managed to assume their designated positions, and align themselves according to the formation specified by their respected superiors, within a brief time frame of just 15 minutes. Raiden, with an authoritative tone, issued a crucial directive to the sensory ninjas, instructing them to carry out a meticulous search to identify any possible ambushes that the enemy may have set up, in order to mitigate any potential risks, and ensure the safety of the troops. Upon receiving the order, the sensory ninja promptly proceeded to execute the search, however, their findings left them astounded. Commander, I am unable to sense anything. It seems as though my senses are being impeded by some sort of obstruction, reported the sensory ninja to Raiden. TCH, they must have employed a sealing technique to obstruct the senses of our ninjas, speculated Daichi, voicing his thoughts on the matter. In a strategic move to neutralize any potential threats, Raiden promptly issued an order for the formation of two teams to move forward and conduct a meticulous search, with the objective of identifying and disarming any possible ambushes or traps that may have been set up by the enemy. Upon receiving the commander's directive, two teams immediately proceeded to carry out the assigned task. Taking every precaution, they advanced slowly and carefully, their senses on high alert, scouring the area for any potential traps or ambushes. Despite their diligent efforts, they came up empty-handed, and were left bewildered by the lack of any signs of danger. As they pressed on, scanning their surroundings, an unexpected sight caught their attention. An aged man, standing tall and solitary in the middle of an open field, suddenly appeared before them. The team captain shouted at the elderly man, Who the hell are you, old man? With his eyes firmly shut, Kagasuchi's tone was laced with contempt as he cast aside the person standing before him. You dare address me, yet you are not the leader of this army. Your worthiness to engage with me is non-existent, so I suggest you scurry along and summon your superior. His words were brimming with disdain, leaving no room for any further discussion or negotiation. The team captain's countenance contorted into a visage of rage upon hearing the contemptuous tone of the elderly man. Regardless, our objective here is to obliterate the Yuzumaki family. So even if I were to kill you, no one would care, and I would not be held accountable. The captain spat out with venom in his voice. With a sudden burst of aggression, he unsheathed his sword and lunged at Kagetsuchi. 
The tip of his blade was mere centimeters from the old man when a tremendous force struck him, rendering him motionless. Kagetsuchi balled his fist and delivered a powerful blow to the captain's face, causing it to explode in a gruesome display of violence. The entire sequence of events occurred within a matter of moments, leaving those who witnessed it stunned and unable to react. In just a few brief moments, the team had lost one of their elite jonin, without even having the opportunity to fight back. Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi spoke with an indifferent tone, presenting two options. Either the individual faces death by Kagetsuchi's hand or they can leave and contact their leader. Realizing they were no match for the elderly man, the remaining people made the decision to retreat and report their encounter to their commander. One of the team members reported to the commander, there are no traps or ambushes ahead, but we've encountered an elderly man who killed an elite jonin with a single strike. Raiden's eyebrows raised in surprise at this news, prompting him to lead the entire army to the location. They arrived at an open space and stopped at a distance of 50 meters away from the old man. As the army came to a halt, Raiden's eyes scanned the surrounding terrain, searching for any signs of danger. The old man stood in the center of the open area, seemingly unfazed by the presence of the approaching army. Despite the army's overwhelming numbers, the old man exuded an aura of unwavering confidence and strength. Raiden turned to his team and spoke in a hushed tone, be on guard, this man is clearly no ordinary opponent. We must proceed with caution. The team nodded in agreement, their eyes fixed on the old man as they prepared for the worst. As the army arrived at the location, Kagetsuchi turned towards them and asked, who among you is the leader? Raiden stepped forward, positioning himself in front of the others. I am Raiden, the commander of the alliance between three major villages, he announced. He then fixed his gaze on Kagetsuchi and inquired, and may I ask who you are? Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi stared at Raiden, his eyes piercing through him as he spoke with conviction, I am Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, and in this country of the Yuzumaki, my words hold supreme power. None shall defy them. His words hung in the air, a heavy silence settling over the area as both parties stood at a standstill. Raiden inquired, have you and your Yuzumaki family reached a decision on whether you are willing to meet our demands? With a call tone, Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi stated, understand your position, Magad. You and your comrades are nothing more than mere bugs to me, and I can squash you at any time I wish. Speaking to me is something you can only boast about after your demise. Raiden's voice carried a tone of anger as he spoke, Old man, I urge you not to go too far. It would be wise for you to gather all the ninjas from your Yuzumaki family, and retire to the safety of your coffin, where you truly belong. His words were sharp and carried a sense of warning, a clear indication that he was not to be trifled with. Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi responded in a monotone voice, haven't you heard? When it comes to eradicating bugs like you, I alone am more than enough. Is that so? Raiden retorted, a hint of challenge in his voice. Then allow me to demonstrate what happens when thousands of bugs swarm and sting their target. With those words, he swiftly commanded his team to launch a volley of shurikens and kunais at Kagetsuchi. Upon receiving orders from their commander, the ninjas immediately proceeded to hurl a barrage of shurikens and kunais at their target. A vast multitude of kunai and shuriken were launched in the direction of Kagetsuchi's location, hurtling through the air with great speed and precision. Fire Dome Kagetsuchi swiftly waved his hand and summoned a fiery dome, which enveloped him and deflected all the incoming kunai and shuriken. As soon as they made contact with the dome, they melted instantaneously and clattered to the ground, rendered useless. Upon witnessing this impressive display, the entire ninja army was left in a state of momentary shock and sluggishness, their attack having been effortlessly nullified. Once the reign of kunai and shuriken ceased, Kagetsuchi spoke in a tone of indifference. Now it's my turn, Kagetsuchi declared, his voice filled with a sense of calm confidence. After proclaiming, it's my turn now, he strode confidently towards the army, casually strolling past the flowing molten iron, as if it were nothing more than a patch of grass. As he strode confidently towards the opposing army, he began to increase his spiritual pressure. With each step he took, the intensity of his energy grew until it enveloped the entire force. The weaker Jenin and Chunin were the first to feel the effects, as they suddenly found themselves struggling to stand under the weight of the elderly man's presence. To them, he seemed to have grown to the size of a mountain, his sheer power crushing them like mere blades of grass. Despite their training and experience, the majority of the Jenin were forced down to their knees under the immense pressure. And even more than half of the Chunin were unable to resist the force and were forced down as well. 
The Li Chunin were able to maintain their stance, but even they found themselves struggling against the sheer force of the man's energy. Their movements were severely impeded, and they found themselves unable to engage in combat due to the intensity of the pressure. Only the most experienced warriors, the Jonin and above, possessed the fortitude to withstand the pressure. Though even they found themselves struggling with the effects of the energy, it was clear that they were the only ones capable of engaging in combat against this formidable foe. The elderly man had demonstrated his immense power, and it was clear that he would not be taken lightly. As they beheld this scene, the leaders of the three major villages were left utterly astounded. They could scarcely believe that a seemingly frail elderly man had managed to defeat nearly 98% of the opposing army, with nothing more than his sheer pressure. At that moment, Kai's voice shattered the silence. Look upwards, he cried, and everyone turned their gaze skyward. But what they saw there filled them with a deep and abiding sense of horror. A strange and otherworldly enchantment, glowing with a light golden hue, had enveloped them and their entire army. The words of the Jonin rang out across the battlefield, his voice heavy with disbelief and fear. I can't believe it. He exclaimed. He actually wants to trap us all. The other ninjas were equally stunned by this revelation. Amidst their gaffes, Kagetsuchi paid little heed, holding his crutch horizontal to his body. With a serene calmness, he spoke the words, Ryujin Jaka, and at that very moment, the crutch was transformed into a stunning katana, its hilt adorned with a regal shade of purple. Stay calm, everyone. He's just one person, we can surely win this, Raiden's words of reassurance filled his comrades with a renewed sense of courage and determination. Emboldened, he charged forward towards Kagetsuchi, his sword in hand and a fierce determination in his heart. As he ran, he was engulfed in a crackling aura of lightning, powered by the signature ninjutsu of Kumagakur. The lightning release armor technique. With this powerful technique enhancing his speed and strength, Raiden surged forward towards his opponent, ready to strike. The air around him crackled with energy as he closed the distance between himself and Kagetsuchi, his eyes fixed firmly on his target. With the lightning release armor technique at his disposal, he was confident that he could emerge victorious in this battle. Shunpo. Kagasuchi cried out, utilizing the technique to instantly appear right in front of Raiden. He swiftly attacked with his Ryujin Jaka, catching Raiden off guard. However, being a quasi shadow level powerhouse, Raiden quickly regained his composure and attempted to parry Kagasuchi's attack. To his shock and horror, Raiden discovered that the old man possessed incredible physical strength, which sent him staggering backwards with a step. Even worse, Raiden realized that his sword had sustained multiple cracks from the force of the impact. Clearly, Kagetsuchi was not to be underestimated, and Raiden knew that he would need to be at his best, if he hoped to emerge victorious in this battle. Kagetsuchi pressed on with his attack, unleashing a powerful fire slash, despite the fact that his Ryujin Jaka was not yet in its Shikai form. Even without the weapon's full power at his disposal, the heat emanating from the blade was intense enough to be taken seriously. Once again, Raiden attempted to parry Kagetsuchi's attack with his sword. However, this time was different. With a swift and precise strike, Ryujin Jaka sliced right through Raiden's sword, separating Raiden's body. Before Raiden's severed body could even hit the ground, it was engulfed in a massive wave of fire, leaving nothing but ash in its wake. As the flames subsided, the melted remains of Raiden's sword lay on the ground, a testament to the overwhelming power of Kagetsuchi's Ryujin Jaka. Anyone who witnessed the scene would be stunned by the sight of the sword, which had been melted in half at the point where it was cut. It was clear that Kagetsuchi was a force to be reckoned with, and that any who stood in his path would meet a fiery end. The entire sequence of events had transpired in an instant, leaving those who had witnessed it stunned and unable to react. The speed and power of Kagetsuchi's attack had been overwhelming, and the devastating effect it had on Raiden had left everyone in shock. Kagetsuchi aimed Ryujin Jaka at the remaining Jonins, conjuring a massive fireball that measured about 5 meters in size. However, the fireball quickly shrank to the size of a football, before Kagetsuchi hurled it towards them. Kai warned the Jonins present to scatter and avoid the deadly fireball, which they did without hesitation. They were not concerned with the fate of the Chunins who were unable to defend themselves, and were left behind to fend for themselves. The fireball traveled approximately 60 to 70 meters before crashing to the ground, causing a thunderous explosion. Boom boom after huge explosion everything in radius of 30 meters fireball as the center was destroyed. In this destruction almost 40% of the army was annihilated. 
and the aftermath of the explosion uprooted the trees, and the remaining genins and chunins were thrown away like rag dolls. Kai, the leader of Karigakur, expressed his surprise, from where did this old monster emerge? This attack is comparable to that of a tailed beast bomb. If I had even an inkling that an old, yet powerful man like him was still in existence, I would have never dared to set foot in the Yuzumaki country, even if I had a thousand guts, lamented Daichi, the esteemed leader of Iwagakur. Despite the explosion, Kagetsuchi remained indifferent and continued his deadly rampage. He materialized before a jonin and killed them in a single swift strike. Then, he utilized Shunpo to move to another jonin, and repeated the same ruthless process. With each appearance, someone was sure to meet their demise. Kagasuchi's movements were so rapid that it seemed as if he was manipulating space with ninjutsu. The terror-stricken jonin continued to flee in a desperate attempt to escape from Kagasuchi's deadly wrath. We cannot confront this beast, he is more powerful than anything we have ever encountered, said one of the jonin as their end. Kagasuchi was ruthless and showed no mercy. He swiftly materialized in front of a jonin, took their life with a single deadly blow, and disappeared in a blur of motion. The other jonin watched in horror as their comrade fell to the ground, lifeless. As the massacre continued, panic and chaos spread like wildfire. Everywhere Kagasuchi appeared, people ran in fear for their lives. His movements were so fast that it was as if he was manipulating space and time to move from one place to another, taking the lives of anyone in his path. It was a scene of unimaginable horror, and the people were powerless to stop it. Observing that many Janins and Chunins had managed to escape from his spiritual pressure due to the explosion, Kagetsuchi quickly decided to decrease their numbers. He gripped his mighty Ryujin Jaka, and, with a swift horizontal slash, unleashed a devastating shockwave of sword pressure. The arc of fire created by the sword swing, traveled in the direction of the fleeing ninjas. The sword pressure was so potent that it cut through the ninjas like a hot knife through butter, and engulfed them in flames. Even those who attempted to evade the attack by lying down were burned by the fire that covered the sword pressure. The Uzumaki ninjas, who were maintaining the enchantment, also watched in horror as the sword pressure approached. As the attack neared the enchantment, the sword pressure vanished, seemingly of its own accord. Witnessing the scene, everyone was speechless, including the Uzumaki ninjas who had created the barrier. Tragically, under the devastating sword pressure, nearly half of the remaining ninjas were killed, leaving behind a trail of destruction and death. Listen, my fellow ninjas, do not cower in fear and run. Stand your ground and fight with all your might. Kagetsuchi has cast a powerful enchantment that covers even the underground, making it impossible to escape. He may have depleted much of his chakra while using such significant moves, so we must attack him with all our strength, advised Daichi, the leader of Iwagakur. Everyone trusted Daichi's expertise in earth ninjutsu, and as he was the leader, they stopped running and rallied together to fight Kagetsuchi. I must express my gratitude to you. If you hadn't gathered all of them here, I would have had to go around searching for them, which would have been quite a hassle for an old man like me, Kagetsuchi said, his face bearing a cold smile. Kagetsuchi materialized beside Daichi using his Shunpo technique, and sliced him in half. However, to Kagetsuchi's shock, Daichi's body transformed into rocks. Dai, old man, Kai declared, appearing behind Kagetsuchi with his broadsword, attempting to strike him down in a single blow. But Kagetsuchi caught the sword with his bare hands, melting it with his heat. Kai was terrified, realizing that he could not escape Kagetsuchi's grasp, and before he could react, he was consumed by flames. Kai was a member of the Hazuki clan, and he believed that he could easily slip away from the flames, but to his dismay, he found himself unable to escape the fire and perished unwillingly. Daichi emerged from the ground using the earth release. Hiding like a mole technique, and attempted to strike Kagetsuchi's heart with his earth release. Fist rock technique. However, Kagetsuchi caught his fist before it could make contact, and in one swift motion, Kagetsuchi decapitated Daichi. Daichi's final thoughts were a bewildered realization of how an old man like Kagetsuchi could possess such incredibly fast reflexes. After the leader of the three major villages was killed, chaos and confusion reigned as there was no one left to command the army. It was every ninja for themselves, and they were no match for Kagetsuchi's terrifying power. For 30 long minutes, the sound of screams and the clash of steel filled the air, as Kagetsuchi ruthlessly slaughtered anyone who dared to oppose him. Finally, he stopped and surveyed the destruction he had caused. Memories of his past flooded his mind as he looked upon the aftermath of the battle. 
Meanwhile, the elders and all the ninja of the Uzumaki family who were maintaining the enchantment were stunned beyond belief. They could hardly comprehend what they had witnessed in just one hour. The complete annihilation of the armies of the three major villages. Not a single soul had survived. Just an hour earlier, they had been filled with dread and uncertainty, wondering if they would make it out alive. Now, they were left to grapple with the reality of their newfound safety, and the horror of the cost at which it had come. Kagusuchi was faced with a group of other jonins and elders as they approached, the sound of their footsteps echoing on the ground. The first elder expressed gratitude towards Kagetsuchi for rescuing both the Uzumaki family and the Uzumaki country, saying, Thank you Elder Kagetsuchi. The second elder acknowledged Kagetsuchi's crucial role in the rescue, admitting, I can't even imagine what would have happened if you hadn't been there. Keep your flattery to yourself. This is also my family, so I don't need your thank you, said Uzumaki Kagetsuchi with a cold expression. Kagetsuchi further asked, What about the eyeliners from different major villages? Did you let them watch everything? The first elder confirmed that they followed Kagetsuchi's orders to allow the outsiders to witness the battle, but then proceeded to capture all of them, including those who were monitoring the Yuzumaki family compound. The elder stated, yes, as per your instructions, we allowed them to witness the battle. However, we captured all of them afterwards, including the ones monitoring the Yuzumaki family compound. The ninja teams consisting of jonins and shunins who were with us carried out the operation. Kagasuchi inquired whether Patriarch had been informed about the situation, asking, Have you informed Mitsuo about this? We have sent someone to inform the Patriarch, said the third elder. Alright, assemble in the meeting room after three hours. Now, do whatever you need to do, Kagasuchi said before walking over to the nearest rock and sitting down, closing his eyes. He had used up almost 80% of his Riatsu in the battle. Kagasuchi sighed, realizing that with only 30% progress on Captain Yamamoto's template, this outcome was inevitable. If the progress had been at 100%, then the battle wouldn't have even been worth breaking his sweat over. I can sense that once the template reaches 50% progress, I'll be able to awaken the Shikai of Ryujin Jaka, he thought to himself. At the same time inside the Yuzumaki village. Yuzumaki Mitsuo paced back and forth, feeling tense about the battle that was taking place outside. Swish Patriarch, I have good news. We won. Master Kagetsuchi defeated the alliance of three major villages on his own, leaving none of their ninjas alive, reported the ninja, who was sent to deliver the news of Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi's victory. He, that's great news. Uncle really did what he said he would do. But what about him? Was he injured during the battle? He felt relieved that the Yuzumaki family had survived this catastrophic event, but his mind was still preoccupied with the thought of his uncle's safety. The Patriarch will be pleased to know that Master Kagasuchi is unharmed. He wasn't even scratched during the entire battle, reported the ninja. Could you describe the entire process of the battle? Mitsuo inquired. The ninja described the whole process of the battle with a fanatic expression on his face. As Mitsuo listened, he grew increasingly shocked. Although he had heard many stories about his uncle from his father, he had never witnessed his uncle's incredible strength and skill firsthand. Mitsuo's father held his elder brother in high regard, not only because of their familial relationship, but also because of his uncle's exceptional abilities. After hearing that his uncle was fine, Mitsuo breathed a sigh of relief and turned to the ninja. Please, spread this news quickly so that everyone can be relieved. Also, announce that tonight we will have a big celebration, he instructed. The ninja nodded in agreement and left in a hurry. He was also eager to spread the good news, knowing that it would bring happiness to the entire community. Within half an hour, every member of the Yuzumaki family knew that they were safe, and the threat that had been looming over them was gone. Everyone was filled with happiness and danced in joy. As people gathered throughout the Yuzumaki village, they couldn't help but marvel at the incredible strength and bravery of the patriarch's uncle. He is like a god to us, he saved us all, remarked one person. And not only did he save us, but he also punished those bastards, added another. I just want to meet him and personally thank him, chimed in a third. Similar discussions took place in every corner of the village, as everyone felt genuinely grateful and joyous for their deliverance. Three hours later. Kagasuchi, clad in his Shinigami outfit, sat with a calm expression on his face in the main seat within the meeting room of the Yuzumaki family. Beside him, the patriarch, Yuzumaki Mitsuo, sat with a look of reverence and gratitude towards his uncle. 
All four elders and elite Jonin were also present, sitting parallel to each other, their faces displaying a mix of admiration and astonishment at the heroism displayed by Kagetsuchi in defeating the three major villages single-handedly. The first elder asked Kagetsuchi, Master Kagetsuchi, should I bring in all the prisoners we have captured, including the eyeliner? Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi replied, there's no need to bring them all in. Just bring in one ninja from each village who witnessed the battle, and execute the rest. Indeed, as you have commanded, elder. And what shall be done about the Kanoha ninjas? Inquired the first elder. Have you failed to comprehend my words, or are you still entertaining fantasies of Kanoha being our ally? Kagetsuchi asked angrily. The first elder lowered his head in shame and said, I apologize elder. I have made a mistake. Just then, a Jonin entered the meeting room and said, Patriarch, there are individuals from Kanoha outside our village who wish to speak with you. Why are those wretches from Kanoha here? Exclaimed the fourth elder. The very moment we needed them, they did not arrive, but now that we have repelled the invaders, these wretches have shown up, stated the second elder. Silence. Let us ascertain their purpose. Come with me to meet them, commanded Kagetsuchi. Following that, Kagetsuchi departed the meeting room with Yuzumaki Mitsuo, accompanied by the elders and elite Jonin. Few minutes ago, the Yuzumaki country was infiltrated by a group of 20 ninjas dressed in the customary Anbu attire. The leader, who had white hair and wore a mask on his face, spoke to the group, as we approach the Yuzumaki country, stay vigilant for potential ambushes or traps. Our top priority is to rescue any survivors and obtain all of the sealing techniques belonging to the Yuzumaki family. We cannot allow these techniques to be acquired by other villages. Understood, Captain White Fang, replied the other members of the team. If the three major villages have taken any captives, what should our course of action be? Inquired a member of the Anbu team. Attempt to rescue the survivors, but if it proves unfeasible, then White Fang didn't finish his sentence, yet everyone present comprehended the implication. Following White Fang's statement, the team proceeded in silence, exercising the utmost caution and vigilance, as they made their way towards the Yuzumaki country. Upon arriving at the outskirts of the Yuzumaki village, they were taken aback by the sight before them. The houses were intact, and the inhabitants were moving about with smiles on their faces. This was in stark contrast to the team's expectations, as they had envisioned ruined houses, people crying and running for their lives. The reality they encountered was entirely different and completely opposite to what they had imagined. Let's halt here and conduct an investigation first to determine what has occurred before proceeding, stated White Fang. Agreed. If we act recklessly, we may be mistaken for recruits by the three major villages, and that's the last thing we want, added the deputy captain. Hey B, could you dispatch your insects to investigate the situation in the Yuzumaki country? That way, we can make better decisions, requested White Fang. The Anbu member, who went by the codename B, nodded and began to release bugs from his body, sending them towards the Yuzumaki village to gather information. It was evident that B was a member of the Aburum clan, known for their ability to communicate and control insects. After 10 minutes, the bugs returned to B, and he obtained all the necessary information from them. Captain White Fang Following my investigation, it appears that the Yuzumaki clan has repelled, or more accurately, annihilated the alliance army of the three major villages. Furthermore, it seems that a single person, named Kagetsuchi, who is the uncle of the current patriarch of the Yuzumaki family, accomplished this feat, reported B. That's impossible. How could a single person possibly annihilate the entire army of the three major villages? Questioned one of the Anbu members. According to our intel, there were around 4,500 people in the army, added another Anbu member. This is the information my insects have gathered, whether you choose to believe it or not, replied B, standing by his report. Is there anything else to report? Inquired White Fang. Also, it appears that all members of the Yuzumaki family are overjoyed with their victory. Their patriarch has ordered a celebration tonight, added B. Captain White Fang, it appears that we have been spotted. A team of ninjas from the Yuzumaki family is heading in our direction, reported the sensory Anbu ninja. Alright, let's move in their direction. Remember, we are here as support, and we should keep our mission confidential from the village, instructed White Fang. He then led the team towards the approaching Yuzumaki ninja team. The rest of the Anbu members followed closely behind him. The two teams finally met, and the leader of the Yuzumaki ninja wasted no time in asking, Who are you, and what is your purpose for entering the Yuzumaki country? White Fang stepped forward and removed his mask. 
He introduced himself, saying, My name is Haddock Sakumo, and I am here to support the Uzumaki village on behalf of the Kanoha village. The leading jonin of the Uzumaki village responded with disdain, Support. Support what? The dead bodies of our Uzumaki family or the sealing techniques of our Uzumaki family. His contemptuous expression never wavered. I assure you, we have no other motives but to support the Uzumaki village, said Sakumo, even though it wasn't entirely true. Admitting their true intentions could cause a permanent rift between Kanoha and Yuzumaki. The Jonin leader simply huffed and remained silent towards Sakumo's explanation. He then turned to one of his ninjas and instructed, go and inform the patriarch of this. The ninja promptly left to relay the message to their leader. The Yuzumaki Kagasuchi arrived with Mitsuo, the elders, and the elite Jonins after a brief wait. Kagasuchi took the lead and addressed the head Jonin, saying, Please brief me on everything you know about the Kanoha ninjas. Of course, Master Kagasuchi, replied the Jonin, bowing before addressing him further. The Kanoha ninjas arrived in the Uzumaki country half an hour ago, and stopped in front of our village, after traveling for 20 minutes. They seemed confused, and one of their ninjas sent bugs to scout our village. When we confronted them and asked about their purpose, they claimed to be here to support us. However, I sensed through my Kagura hard eye ability, that they were lying. Upon hearing the Jonin leader's words, Sakumo felt embarrassed. He remembered that only those from the Yuzumaki family could awaken the Kagura hard eye ability, but he did not expect that this particular Jonin had awakened the ability, and had been keeping a close eye on their every move. The Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi looked at Sakumo and spoke, If my assumption is correct, your main objective must be to collect all the sealing techniques of our Yuzumaki family, and save any survivors, if possible. Sakumo replied, We would have saved any survivors we found. Kagatsuchi asked, What if they were captured by the enemy? Would you still save them or let them die? Without any hesitation, Sakumo replied, We would absolutely try our best to save any members of the Yuzumaki family. Kagasuchi posed another question, what if you cannot save them but have a chance to kill them? What will you do? The deputy captain replied, why would we kill them? We will do our utmost to save them. Sakumo gazed at the deputy captain with a stern expression. The deputy captain realized that if he had stayed silent, they might not have suspected anything, but now that he had spoken, Kagasuchi would know that he was lying. Kagasuchi chuckled at them and said, I feel sorry for you, having such unreliable teammates. Kagatsuchi turned to the first elder and said, Bring me all the ninjas you have captured. Upon receiving orders from Kagatsuchi, the first elder, accompanied by some elite jonins, proceeded to retrieve the prisoners. After a wait of 15 minutes, the first elder returned with approximately 30 prisoners who had been captured. Let's select one ninja from each village who has witnessed the entirety of the battle, suggested Kagatsuchi. Following Kagatsuchi's instructions, the first elder proceeded to carefully select one ninja from each of the major villages who had witnessed the entire battle. After a thorough evaluation, he presented the weakest among them to Kagatsuchi. In a cold and unflinching tone, Kagatsuchi ordered, execute the remaining prisoners. Sakumo had initially believed that none of the Kanoha ninja would be targeted for execution. However, upon witnessing one of their own being selected while the remaining seven were forced to kneel and face their impending demise, he could no longer remain silent. In a sudden outburst, he cried out, Stop. What are you doing? Kanoha and Yuzumaki village are allies, you can't just kill your own allies. With a firm and unyielding tone, Kagasuchi responded, You were the ones who broke the alliance first, so there's no point in pleading now. Sakumo was momentarily silenced by Kagatsuchi's words, but he could not stand by and watch his fellow villagers be executed before his eyes. Unless you put an end to this, we will have no choice but to take action, warned Sakumo, drawing his short sword from its scabbard on his back. Seeing their captain's resolve, every Anbu member present followed suit and unsheathed their weapons, ready to fight to protect their own. With an air of confidence and arrogance, Kagatsuchi retorted, do your job. Let's see who can stop us. Firewall suddenly, a massive firewall appeared and encircled Kagatsuchi and all the Anbu members, effectively trapping them within its confines. Upon seeing the imposing firewall, Sakumo realized that there was no way out unless they could defeat Kagatsuchi and break through the barrier. Unleash your full power and attack him with everything you have got. Our only chance of escaping this trap is by defeating him, declared Sakumo, urging his fellow Anbu members to give it their all in the battle ahead. With those words of encouragement, Sakumo transformed into a flash of white light, and appeared directly in front of Kagatsuchi. 
He launched a swift strike aimed at the man's throat, but it was swiftly deflected by Kagatsuchi, who seemed more than capable of defending himself. You're just a boy trying to compete in the art of swordsmanship, but you're too inexperienced for that, scoffed Kagatsuchi. As he spoke, a massive swarm of bugs began to surround him. However, as the swarm approached within a 50 centimeters radius of his body, the bugs were instantly incinerated. With a commanding voice, Sakumo called out, what a release. Water dragon bullet technique. And a colossal water dragon emerged, hurtling towards Kagatsuchi's location with fierce intensity. But Kagatsuchi was quick to respond, unleashing a massive fire dragon that was twice the size of the water dragon. The two dragons collided with a tremendous force, causing a massive explosion that sent shockwaves rippling through the surrounding area. As the two dragons collided, a massive cloud of steam enveloped the battlefield, causing the temperature to rise to unbearable levels, due to the intense heat emanating from Kagatsuchi's fire dragon. The Anbu members tried to dodge the steam as best as they could, but the heat was too much for them to handle. In the midst of the chaos, Sakumo saw an opening and launched another attack on Kagatsuchi. However, once again, his strike was easily deflected by Kagatsuchi. Realizing the futility of their efforts to defeat Kagatsuchi, the deputy captain attempted to escape using the earth release. Tunneling technique. He quickly dug a tunnel underground and began to make his escape. However, as soon as he entered the tunnel, a massive burst of fire erupted from it, incinerating the deputy captain, and dashing any hopes of escaping underground. The remaining Anbu members were left with no choice but to continue their attack on Kagatsuchi, hoping that they could find a way to defeat him before it was too late. Shall we end this? Kagatsuchi said calmly as his crutch transformed into a finely crafted katana with a purple handle, glinting menacingly in the light. After transforming his crutch into a katana, Kagatsuchi swiftly moved around the battlefield, cutting down each of the jonin with ease. Each time he struck, a massive burst of flames consumed the fallen ninja, leaving behind only ashes. Despite Sakumo's best efforts, he was unable to stop Kagatsuchi, and one by one, his team members fell to the ground, lifeless. The sense of despair within Sakumo grew stronger with each passing moment. Eventually, Kagatsuchi sheathed his katana, which reverted back into a normal-looking crutch, and the flames surrounding them vanished. All of Sakumo's teammates were dead, and he was left alone with Kagatsuchi. What are you waiting for? Didn't I tell you to execute all of them? Demanded Kagatsuchi, his gaze fixed on the elders. His words snapped the elders out of their stupor, and they swiftly carried out the executions of the captured ninjas. Kagatsuchi turned his attention to Sakumo, who was standing there silently, feeling a mix of anger and despair, after witnessing the death of his entire team. What was his name again? Kagatsuchi asked, gesturing towards Sakumo. His name is Haddock Sakumo, replied the Yuzumaki Jonin. Ah, Haddock Sakumo. Take this remaining ninja with you. He has witnessed my battle with the Ninja Alliance army firsthand, and you yourself have experienced it as well, Kagatsuchi said with a smile. Sakumo was filled with a sense of hopelessness, but he knew he had to bring the information about Kagatsuchi back to Kanoha and the Hokage. And tell Mito that I will come to meet her within one week, Kagatsuchi added. Sakumo looked to Kagatsuchi one last time, as if trying to imprint his image in his memory before turning and leaving with the surviving ninja. Uncle, do you think it would be wise to spare his life? He has great potential and could become a powerhouse at cage level in the future, Mitsuo asked his uncle. You make a valid point. He does have the potential to become a cage level powerhouse. However, after today, he will either die of humiliation or work hard to avenge his teammates. Furthermore, we must consider the security of our people. If he attacks anyone from the Yuzumaki country, you needn't worry. If he kills any of our people, I will kill thousands in Kanoha, Kagasuchi responded, looking at Mitsuo. You must be exhausted from the attack on our village and preparing for tonight's celebration. Why don't you rest now, and we can catch up at the celebration? Kagatsuchi suggested. Thank you, uncle. I will see you at the celebration. Please get some rest as well, Mitsuo replied before leaving with the elders. Kagasuchi also departed for his old courtyard. System claim rewards. Said. Kagatsuchi. Ding. Congratulations on obtaining Captain Yamamoto's 60% template, card Kagatsuchi chuckled to himself and said, well, this is a pleasant surprise. I was planning to go to Kanoha and teach them a lesson, but I never thought of doing it in a way that would strike fear into the hearts of the entire ninja world and the Yuzumaki family. With this card, I can change my plan. Ding. 
Congratulations on getting Fire Body Secret Technique. Fire Body Secret Technique. The body can turn into fire and can't be hurt by physical attacks, but it can be restrained by water. If a great technique is taught to the clan members, their strength will undergo a qualitative change. He immediately learned this secret technique, and decided to give it to Mitsuo during the celebration. Now, due to this secret technique, the Uzumaki country will become renowned for their new ability to control fire. As Kagetsuchi pondered to himself, he considered that the Uzumaki family would be well suited for the secret technique, due to their fiery tempers and red hair. Following this, he began meditating on Ryujin Jaka, understanding that everything depends on strength, and therefore, he must continue to increase his own. As the hours gradually ticked away, the much-anticipated time for celebration drew ever closer. Kagetsuchi, keenly aware of this, made sure to prepare himself accordingly by donning a simple yet elegant attire, consisting of a pristine white kimono and a complimentary blue heori draped over it. With his trusty crutch in hand, he went to the venue for celebration. A spacious area was chosen for the festivities, one that would provide ample room for every member of the family to partake in the celebration and enjoy themselves to the foes. Uncle, please come and take a seat over here, Mitsuo said, leading Kagetsuchi towards a stage that had been specially erected for the occasion. It was designed not only for the purpose of the celebration, but also to honor Kagetsuchi as the savior who had saved them from a tragic end. The stage had been strategically positioned so that everyone present could see their savior. Taking his seat in the center of the stage, Kagetsuchi spoke up, addressing the crowd. This is my family, and I will protect them for as long as I live. I won't say much else, so let's all enjoy today's celebration to the fullest, and make the most of this joyous occasion. Kagetsuchi's words were met with cheers and applause from the gathered crowd, and the celebration continued with renewed vigor and excitement. As the festivities were underway, Mitsuo approached Kagetsuchi, accompanied by a little girl. Uncle, Mitsuo began, this is my granddaughter, Kashina. Say hello to your grandpa, Kashina. Pointing towards Kagetsuchi, Kashina spoke up with a bright smile on her face. You're the grandpa I ran into this morning. With a smile, Kagetsuchi chuckled and asked the little girl, Haha, so did you send people some food? Yes, I did. Replied Kashina, before adding with a hint of annoyance, and I'm not a little girl anymore. I've grown up, she declared, her face puffed up in a cute display of indignation. Kagetsuchi laughed heartily, haha, ha, you can't even reach my height when I'm sitting down, and you say you've grown up. Mitsuo interjected, Kashina, don't be rude. Kagetsuchi is your grandpa and a hero to our family. You should respect him. Kagetsuchi waved his hand dismissively, it's alright Mitsuo, let her speak her mind. After all, she is my granddaughter, isn't she? He said with a warm smile. Kashina's expression softened as she looked up at Kagetsuchi, sorry grandpa, I didn't mean to be rude. I just wanted to show you how much I've grown. Kagetsuchi patted her head affectionately, it's alright my dear, I understand. Now, let's enjoy this celebration together, shall we? Mitsuo was overjoyed at the harmonious relationship between his granddaughter and his uncle Kagetsuchi. Seeing them together, one would never suspect that Kagetsuchi had single-handedly slaughtered an entire ninja army without batting an eyelid. As Kagetsuchi teased Kashina, Mitsuo watched the two with a content smile on his face. It was heartwarming to see his granddaughter and uncle bonding so well. Despite knowing that Kagetsuchi was a formidable warrior who had single-handedly defeated an entire ninja army, he seemed like any ordinary family member at the moment. After a while, Kagetsuchi reached into his pocket and pulled out a booklet. He handed it to Mitsuo and said, This is a secret technique that I have developed. Take a look at it and give it to our family members and those who are loyal to us. But make sure to cast a curse seal so that they can't spread this technique, nor can anyone extract it from their minds. As Mitsuo read through the booklet, he was shocked to find that the secret technique was similar to one used by the Hazuki clan, leaders of different clans in Kurigakur. He couldn't find the words to express his gratitude, and could only bow before Kagetsuchi and say, Thank you, uncle. In response, Kagetsuchi scolded Mitsuo lightly, saying, Don't always bow before me. You're the patriarch of the Uzumaki clan. And so the celebration continued, with the Uzumaki family coming together to enjoy the day and cherish their bond. After midnight, the festivities in Uzumaki village came to a close, and the revelers slowly made their way back to their homes. At the same time somewhere in Land of Fire. Rest here for two hours. After that, we'll continue our journey, instructed Haddock Sakumo.
Got it, replied Nakamura, before they both sat down on a nearby tree to rest. Master White Fang, Nakamura began, his voice heavy with emotion. I have grave news to deliver. One of my companions, who had just become a father, has fallen in battle. His joy and happiness at the birth of his child has now turned to despair and tragedy. I cannot bear the thought of facing his wife and telling her that her husband will never return home. The weight of this task is almost unbearable, and it makes my legs heavy with reluctance to continue our journey towards Kanoha. Sakumo gazed up at the sky, a pained expression on his face. The Hulkage believed in me and placed me in charge of this mission to protect everyone. But now, I am the only one left alive. I may not have known them all personally, but I was responsible for their safety, and yet, they still perished. It's a burden that I must carry for the rest of my life, he spoke with a heavy heart. After a moment of silence, Haddock Sakumo suddenly became alert and stood up, his gaze fixed on a single direction. Observing Sakumo's reaction, Nakamura quickly followed suit, rising to his feet and becoming equally vigilant. As they stood guard, Sakumo and Nakamura spotted a team of three Kurigakur ninja. The Kurigakur squad noticed them as well, and the two groups faced each other in tense silence. Sakumo broke the silence with a question. What are ninja from Kurigakur doing here in the fire country? He demanded to know. We are on a mission, replied the leader of the Kurigakur team, his voice cold and confident. Why don't we just kill them? There are only three people, whispered one of the Kurigakur ninja into the leader's ear. The leader of the Kurigakur team listened intently and then grinned wickedly, clearly amused by the suggestion. Sakumo, who was a quasi cage level ninja, heard the whisper from the Kurigakur ninja, and immediately drew his short sword. His instincts were honed, and he was prepared for whatever the enemy squad might throw at him. Head towards Kanoha. I will take care of them, instructed Sakumo to Nakamura. He knew he had to finish this battle before it caused any more damage, and he was determined to do it alone. Nakamura hesitated for a moment, but then, trusting his leader's abilities, he nodded and left to follow Sakumo's orders. Sakumo moved swiftly through the forest, his sword at the ready. The three ninjas from Kurigakur emerged from the shadows, their eyes glinting in the moonlight. The first ninja raised his hands and created a massive wall of earth, blocking Sakumo's path. Undeterred, Sakumo used wind style. Wind blade jutsu to slice through the earth wall and continue his charge. The second ninja leapt forward and launched water style. Water shark bullet jutsu, sending a fast moving stream of water shaped like a shark toward Sakumo. Sakumo quickly dodged to the side, narrowly avoiding the attack. As the water crashed into the trees behind him, several of them toppled over, crashing to the ground with a thunderous roar. Meanwhile, the third ninja used Earth style. Earth release. Earth flowed divide to split the ground beneath Sakumo's feet, causing him to stumble. Seizing the opportunity, the ninja charged forward, kunai in hand. But Sakumo quickly recovered and used his lightning-fast swordsmanship to parry the attack and strike the ninja down. The first ninja unleashed another jutsu, Earth style. Earth release. Earth flow divide, splitting the ground beneath Sakuma once again. But this time, Sakuma was prepared. He used Thunder style. Thunder blade jutsu to create a sword made of lightning, which he used to cut through the earth and land a blow on the second ninja, injuring him badly. As the third ninja circled around for another attack, Sakuma used wind style. Wind blade jutsu to slice through several nearby trees, causing them to fall and block the ninja's path. The ninja quickly darted around the fallen trees, but as he did, Sakumo charged forward and used his swordsmanship to strike a fatal blow. With two of the Kurigakur ninjas defeated, only one remained. But this ninja was a skilled water user, and he launched water style. What a release. Great shark missile jutsu, sending a massive powerful shark-shaped stream of water towards Sakumo. The force of the attack was too much, and Sakumo was knocked off his feet, landing hard on his left shoulder. Gritting his teeth against the pain, Sakumo slowly rose to his feet, his sword at the ready. The final ninja charged forward, kunai in hand, but Sakumo was ready. Using thunder style. Thunder blade jutsu, he created a sword made of lightning and clashed with the ninja in a fierce battle. But Sakumo's skill was too much for the ninja, and in the end, Sakumo emerged victorious. As the battle ended, the forest was in shambles. Trees had been cut down, the ground was torn apart, and the bodies of the defeated ninjas lay scattered around the clearing. Sakumo's left shoulder throbbed with pain, but he knew he had emerged victorious. With a weary sigh, he sheathed his sword and began the long journey back towards Kanoha. In the midst of a dense forest, Nakamura and the other ninja faced off in a battle that would determine the victor. 
Nakamura was armed with his formidable fire-style ninjutsu and his mastery of the three-body technique. Meanwhile, the other ninja wielded a sharp sword and sea-level water release. The battle started with the other ninja charging at Nakamura with his sword. However, Nakamura's substitution technique allowed him to dodge the attack and counter with his fire release. Flame Bullet Ninjutsu The other ninja managed to dodge the flames, but was caught off guard by Nakamura's fire release. Misblazed Ant's technique, which created a thick cloud of smoke, obscuring the other ninja's vision, and after that as Nakamura added a fire the whole smoke caught fire. Taking advantage of the unpreparedness of the other ninja, Nakamura closed in on the other ninja, and launched his fire release. Dragon Fire Technique He wasn't that proficient in it, due to which the blast of fire was so powerful that it caused a small explosion, and in the process, Nakamura lost his left hand. But it was enough to defeat the other ninja, who fainted from the impact of the blast. Despite his injuries, Nakamura emerged victorious. His three-body technique allowed him to evade the other ninja's attacks and land decisive blows. And his mastery of the fire-style ninjutsu proved too much for the other ninja to handle. However, the cost of victory was high, as Nakamura had lost his left hand in the process, and for a ninja his arm is very important. A few minutes later, Sukumo caught up and witnessed Nakamura's wretched state. Sukumo suggested, we should hurry towards Konoha to get you treated. Nakamura gave a nod and headed towards Konoha. As the first rays of sunlight illuminated the sky, Sukumo and Nakamura entered Konoha. We finally made it, Nakamura said before fainting. Sukumo caught him just in time and rushed him to the Konoha hospital for treatment. At the same time inside Hokage office Lord Hokage, Captain Sukumo has returned to Konoha, but he's not with his team. Instead, he's accompanied by another ninja named Nakamura, who was part of the team responsible for monitoring Yuzumaki country. Both of them have sustained injuries, reported the Anbu member as he knelt before the Hokage. Very well. Bring them to my office, instructed third Hokage Saratobi Hiruzen. After entering Konoha, Nakamura fainted and the captain took him to the Konoha hospital, reported the Anbu member. Thank you for informing me. You may leave now. I will go to the hospital myself to speak with Sukumo, said Saratobi Hiruzen, as he prepared to leave for the hospital. However, before he could leave, a man with one eye entered his office Shimura Danzo, the leader of Root. Hiruzen, I heard that Sukumo has returned, said Danzo. Yes, I'm on my way to the hospital to meet with him, replied Saratobi Hiruzen. I'll come with you, offered Danzo. Saratobi Hiruzen simply nodded in response, and quickly made his way to the Kanoha hospital, with Danzo following closely behind. Eventually, they arrived at the Kanoha hospital. Can you tell me where Sukumo is? Asked Saratobi Hiruzen of a nurse. Over there, the nurse pointed to one of the rooms. Saratobi with Danzo went inside the room and saw Sukumo being treated, after seeing Hokage enter Sukumo wanted to get up, but was stopped by Saratobi Hiruzen. What happened? Why are you alone, and where are your teammates? Danzo asked without showing any concern for Sukumo's injuries. Danzo, can't you see that he's injured? Saratobi chastised. HMPH, as a ninja, he's bound to get injured. So why sympathize with him? Danzo remarked callously. Saratobi glared at Danzo, appalled by his lack of empathy for a fellow shinobi. We are all human beings first, Danzo. As leaders, it is our responsibility to care for our subordinates and ensure their well-being, he retorted sternly. I agree with Lord Danzo. My injuries are not that serious, and I can speak, Sukumu said, acknowledging Danzo's earlier statement. Alright, if you're feeling up to it, please tell us what happened and where are the other Anbu members who were with you, Saratobi asked turning his attention back to Sukumo. As for your orders, I traveled to Uzumaki country with my team to retrieve all the sealing techniques, and bring any orphans back to Konoha. However, upon arriving, we discovered that the Uzumaki country had successfully defended against the alliance army of three major villages. We were then discovered by a Uzumaki ninja team, and I represented us as support sent by Konoha for Uzumaki country. However, due to their abilities with the Kagura hard eye, they saw through our ruse and learned our true intentions. I still maintained that we were there to support Yuzumaki, as accepting otherwise would not have benefited either of us. But then, I discovered that they had captured all the spies sent by the major villages to monitor Yuzumaki country, including eight spies sent by Kanoha. They were about to execute everyone, except for one person from each village, but I couldn't simply stand by and watch my fellow Kanoha villagers be killed. I tried to reason with them that such actions would make them enemies of Kanoha, but they refused to listen. 
So, we attempted to save them by force, but the man leading the Uzumaki forces was too powerful. He easily defeated my team, and I was unable to even scratch him, Sakumo recounted, his girl causing him to lower his head and avoid eye contact with the Hokage. As they processed Sakumo's words, both Saratobi and Danzo couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and fear towards the Uzumaki clan. They knew firsthand the strength of the major villages, and if they were to attack the Uzumaki village, it was almost certain that the Uzumaki clan would be wiped out. Yet, here they were, not only surviving, but also possessing a powerhouse who could effortlessly defeat a team of 20 skilled ninjas. Even Saratobi himself was unsure if he could come out unscathed in such a battle. Sakumo's voice betrayed his despair, and Saratobi could sense the guilt he was feeling for not being able to protect his team. It was clear that the man who defeated them was on a completely different level, and they needed to tread carefully around the Uzumaki clan. Taking a deep breath, Saratobi inquired, May I know the name of this man? Sakumo took a deep breath before answering, The man's name is Uzumaki Kagasuchi. After we arrived in Uzumaki country, we conducted an investigation into how the Uzumaki family managed to escape their demise. The results were shocking, as every member of the family spoke of how Uzumaki Kagetsuchi single-handedly defeated an army of 4500 ninja. At first, we found it hard to believe, but after witnessing the strength of Uzumaki Kagetsuchi myself, I now believe that he is capable of such a feat. And for the details of battle you have to wait for Nakamura to wake up. As Saratobi Hiruzen was about to speak further, a woman with red hair and a hexagonal mark between her eyebrows interrupted him. What name did you just say? She asked. Mido-sama, everyone present in the room bowed towards her. Even Sakumo, who was sitting down, quickly stood up and bowed. Mido asked, is he skilled in fire-style jutsu? Indeed, he can use fire-style jutsu effortlessly, as if he can control the flames, replied Sakumo with respect in his tone. Mido-sama, do you happen to know him? Inquired Saratobi Hirzen. Certainly, I know him. He is my uncle, after all. You may not be aware of his true name, but you must have heard of his other name, Fire God, Mido said. Yes the Fire God who destroyed Tetsuken clan which had one cage level powerhouse dot said Danzo. Everyone listened intently as Mido spoke, even though it was narrated in that way, if I were to compare their strength to a clan, it would be the combined strength of the Saratobi and Shimura clans, during the Warring States period. And now, your clan strength is far weaker compared to that period. So, do not undermine his feet. He attacked that clan alone, and even announced his motive beforehand to take revenge for his son's death. They even prepared for his attack and had their secret technique of controlling metals, yet they were still destroyed. This should give you an idea of how powerful he truly was. So tell me did he say anything for me asked Mido looking at Sakumo. He just said that he will come to Kanoha to meet you personally dot said Sakumo. And dot after nodding Mido left. Danzo and Hiruzen looked at each other after listening to the words of Yuzumaki Mido. Even though Mido didn't say anything targeting their clan but from her tone, it can be felt that how much she disdained the strength of Saratobi and Shimura clan. If someone else said what said then they might have retorted, but the person who spoke is a perfect Jinchuriki of Nine Tails, and wife of ninja god Senju Hashirama. After watching Mido leave after a long time Danzo spoke HMPH to when her clan is going to live anyway. Saratobi Hiruzen glared at Danzo. Seeing this Danzo immediately shut up. Saratobi Hiruzen then looked towards Sakumo and said, Sakumo rest well I know what you are feeling, but you have to be brave and work hard to take revenge for your comrades. After saying this Saratobi Hiruzen left and called Anbu and said, go call the head of intelligence department to meet me right now. Yes after saying this Anbu member left. Saratobi Hiruzen and Danzo went to the ward where Nakamura was being treated and waited outside till the head of intelligence department came. The head was from Yamanaka clan, Yamanaka Noki. Hokage Sama what are your orders said Yamanaka Noki. You see the person lying on the hospital bed extract his memories of past 5 days dot said Saratobi Hiruzen. Yes after saying that he went to Nakamura and started to read his memories off past 5 days. After watching his memory Yamanaka Noki was covered in cold sweat with a clear fear on his face. He was gasping for air. What did you see that made you so fearful? asked Danzo. After calming down Yamanakanoki spoke, I can't describe what I saw, I can only show you what I saw from his memories. And show as Danzo was saying he was interrupted by Saratobi Hiruzen, you don't have to show now, we will talk about it during the high level meeting. 
Saratobi hears and then turned towards the Anbu and spoke. Go call all the elite Jonins and patriarch of the families for an urgent meeting. Yes after saying that Anbu member left. After Anbu member left to inform everyone, Saratobi also went back to his office with Danso. As everyone got orders to assemble for a meeting every elite Jonin and patriarch of family, moved in direction of Hokich building for the meeting. Within two hours everyone was present in the meeting room in Hokich building. At this time Saratobi hears and also entered with Danzo, Kahari Yudatane, Hamura Mitakato and sat on the main seat. Many of you might have known that Yuzumaki family was attacked by three major villages, but due to lack of manpower, we were unable to send troops to help Yuzumaki family. But the latest news is that Yuzumaki family have survived. And not only that, but there is a very powerful person present in Yuzumaki family. So today's meeting is to discuss our further approach. Said Saratobi Hiruzen. Hokage Sama, who is that person, asked Ichiha Satsuna, current patriarch of Ichiha family. His name is Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, uncle of Mido Sama, and he is also known as Fire God. Said Saratobi Hiruzen. After listening to this name everyone was confused because no one have heard of this name. But some old ninja and family patriarch knew about the name Fire Ga, and shared the reason why Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi was named this after listening to the explanation of old ninjas everyone calmed down. Seeing everyone count down, said Captain Yamanakanoki please show us what you saw in the memory of Nakamura. Yamanakanoki nodded and used his jutsu on everyone, and showed the memories of the first scene, was how Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi alone destroyed the whole army of 4500 ninjas from three major villages. Second was the scene when everyone from the team of Sakuma was killed without any effort by Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. Everyone present in the room can feel how powerful Kagetsuchi really is, and the destruction of army of three major villages for him seemed easy. How can such an old man be this powerful? said a boy with white hair. He is none other than Jiraiya. Can you do this sensei? asked Jiraiya. Saratobi hears and face twitched after listening to Jiraiya. He can't say that it's impossible for him to achieve this feat in any way. You mustn't have called us only for this right Hokage Sama asked Nara Shinichi. Yes we also learned that he is coming to Kanoha within few days maybe, so we have to be prepared you know we didn't support Yuzumaki village as an ally, so he might resent towards Kanoha. So from today Kanoha will be on high alert. said. Saratobi hears in a serious tone. If he really attack a Jonin wanted to show his concern after seeing the power of Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. Don't worry Mido-sama will make a move the things escalated to that point. Saratobi hears and said. After hearing this everyone present in the meeting room felt relieved. If Mido-sama makes a move then we will be saved. said one Jonin. Yeah, with Mido-sama present here no one can do anything in Kanoha. said another Jonin. Okay if nothing else today's meeting is over. said Saratobi Hiruzen. After listening to Saratobi Hiruzen's words everyone left, but no one saw Saratobi Hiruzen's fist was clenched under the table. After everyone left only Saratobi Hiruzen, Danzo, Kahari Yudatin, Hamura Mitakato were left in the meeting room. Hiruzen you saw that right no one believes in you but believes in her. That family will become a hindrance if not removed. said Danzo. Now is not the time. said Saratobi Hiruzen. Ninja world is getting restless, and war may break out in few years time, so people die in war. Continued Saratobi Hiruzen. After listening to the words of Saratobi Hiruzen everyone present in meeting room smiled. Yes that will be the time when every unstable factor can be removed. Said Kahari Yudatin. Okay leave today meeting shall come at end here. Said Saratobi Hiruzen. At the same time in Kamagakur. Breakage office. Bang. The sound of a table breaking filled the room. Damn it. How can someone that powerful still be alive in Yuzumaki country? What the hell is Anbu doing? Can't they even find out that such a strong individual is still alive within the Yuzumaki family? Reikich exclaimed. I can't let this go. Send a message to Inoki and 3rd Mizukich that we will attack Yuzumaki country again. But this time, we will all join in and take down that bastard ourselves. We will avenge the deaths of our village's ninjas, Reikich said in an enraged tone. Even for him, losing so many skilled ninjas at once caused him to become furious. Observing all of this, Mabuki let out a sigh. Master Reikich, you can't be impulsive on this matter. After hearing the description of the ninja who survived, we know that even after defeating an entire army of 4,500 ninjas, he didn't look tired at all. This clearly shows that he still had plenty of energy to spare, Mabuki cautioned. So, what? I'm just supposed to sit and watch? Asked Reikich. Yes. 
In the end, the surviving ninja told us that Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi said to Sakumo that he will visit Konoha himself. So let's observe Konoha's reaction to this matter and proceed accordingly. As far as I know, even Konoha wants to get rid of the Yuzumaki family, said Mabuki. Hmm, you're correct. But still, tell everyone to be prepared for battle, said Reikich. Just like Reikich, Inoki and 3rd Mizukich were also frustrated upon hearing the news of the deaths of so many ninjas from their village. But they were helpless and could only wait for the reactions of 3rd Reikich and Konoha after Kagetsuchi's visit. Thus, the entire ninja world remained silent for a day and a night. As the first rays of sunlight shone upon the gate of Yuzumaki village, Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi stood outside with Mitsuo and the elders. Uncle, why don't you take these elite jonins with you? They may prove to be helpful, suggested Mitsuo. I appreciate your concern, Mitsuo, but I don't require assistance. I will be visiting Konoha alone, added Kagetsuchi. Mitsuo let out a sigh after hearing Kagetsuchi's words. His uncle was right. These ninjas would only hold him back. No need to worry, I will return to the Yuzumaki family by tomorrow, reassured Kagetsuchi. After that, he left using Shunpo, moving at an incredible speed towards Konoha. After traveling for hours, crossing forests, rivers, and mountains, Kagetsuchi stumbled upon a caravan being attacked by a group of ruthless bandits. The caravan comprised of merchants and traders who were on their way to Konoha to sell their goods in the market. The bandits had already looted the caravan, leaving the travelers stranded and wounded. Without a single flicker of hesitation, Kagasuchi made a swift motion with his hand, causing each and every bandit to be engulfed in flames, their screams filling the air. The merchants and traders, who had been held hostage by the ruthless bandits, were relieved and thankful for Kagasuchi's intervention. However, Kagasuchi humbly refused to accept any monetary reward or compensation, citing that it was his responsibility as a ninja to safeguard the lives of those who were unable to defend themselves. After ensuring the safety of the caravan, Kagetsuchi continued on his journey towards Konoha. As he walked, he couldn't help but think about the grateful faces of the travelers he had helped. After traveling for hours, Kagetsuchi finally arrived at the gates of Konoha. As Kagetsuchi approached the gate of Konoha village, he noticed two guards from the Ichiha family standing watch. They eyed the old man with a crutch in his hand cautiously. As the old man approached the gate of Konoha village, one of the guards, Ichiha Taiko, squinted his eyes and whispered to his fellow guard, Hey, don't you think I've seen this old man somewhere before? Ichiha Faiko smacked the back of Ichiha Taiko's head and reprimanded him, Don't be an idiot, we were given a portrait of an old man to be on the lookout for, and were instructed to report any sightings to the higher-ups. Indeed, you are correct, Ichiha Taiko suddenly realized, feeling embarrassed. I completely forgot about it, he admitted. Please wait here. I will inform the higher-ups about this, Ichiha Faiko said before quickly running off to carry out the task. Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi observed the other ninja leaving without interjecting or responding. In a quivering tone, Ichiha Taiko requested, Please halt. You must, at the very least, state your name before proceeding. I am Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, replied Kagetsuchi, without even glancing at the Ichiha ninja. As he moved forward, his Kagura hard eye allowed him to sense individuals with significant chakra and vitality. He suddenly sensed a huge amount of chakra in Konoha, only Yuzumaki Mido possessed such amount of chakra. Upon receiving news of Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi's arrival, Saratobi Hiruzen hastily proceeded to meet with him. Saratobi Hiruzen greeted Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi with a warm welcome as he gazed upon him. Welcome to Konoha village, he said. Is that so? However, I sense that Konoha is preparing for combat upon receiving news of my arrival, remarked Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi with a compassed expression. Saratobi Hiruzen was taken aback and felt embarrassed upon hearing Kagetsuchi's words, but he managed to maintain a neutral expression. Saratobi Hiruzen extended an invitation to Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi to accompany him to his office for a conversation. Would you be so kind as to join me for a discussion in my office? He asked politely, hoping to alleviate any tensions or misunderstandings that might have arisen. There is no need for that, as I came here primarily to meet my niece. Once that is done, we can discuss official matters. Furthermore, I believe that the most powerful individual in Konoha should be my niece, Yuzumaki Mido, Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi stated. Upon hearing Kagetsuchi's statement, Saratobi Hiruzen's expression grew tense, but he persisted. I urge you to still accompany me to my office. I have already sent a ninja to inform Mido-sama, he replied, this time emitting his powerful cage-level chakra as a show of his authority. 
I did not ask for your invitation, Kagetsuchi retorted as he unleashed his full riatsu, causing a pressure that not only affected Saratobi Hiruzen, but also every ninja in the vicinity. Stand aside, Kagetsuchi commanded with authority. Without even realizing it, Saratobi Hiruzen stepped aside from Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi's path, allowing him to move forward in the direction of Mido. At the gate of the Senju family's compound, there stood a stunning blonde-haired girl whom Kagetsuchi had finally reached. Tsunade inquired, are you Grandma Mido's uncle? Toward Tsunade, Kagetsuchi nodded. Tsunade's tone carried a hint of displeasure as she spoke, please come along with me. They began making their way to the largest house within the Senju family's compound. Do you have an opinion about me? Inquired Kagetsuchi. Tsunade's response was delivered with an air of annoyance, as she retorted, HMPH. Upon arriving inside the room, they were greeted by the sight of Yuzumaki Mido, a woman with a red hexagonal marking between her eyebrows. With a bow, Mido greeted Kagetsuchi and said, Welcome uncle. Seated at the main seat in the room, Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi spoke up and said, I don't believe there is any need for you to do this, as you have already renounced any allegiance to the Yuzumaki family. Am I correct? Several elders from the Senju clan were also present in the room, and while they may have wanted to refute Kagetsuchi's comment about their current patriarch, Mido intervened and prevented them from doing so. I apologize, uncle, but surely you must understand that as the Jinchuriki of Kanoha village, I cannot simply depart from the village at will, explained Mido. Mido, there's no need for explanations. I understand that you are prioritizing your village over your family, and that you do not wish to drag Kanoha into the vortex of war. You have made your choice, said Kagetsuchi, his voice echoing throughout the Senju family compound. Saratobi Hiruzen, who had just entered the room with several important figures from Kanoha, overheard Kagetsuchi's words. As the eldest and most authoritative member of the Yuzumaki family, I hereby declare that you, Yuzumaki Mido, will be expelled from our family, effective immediately, Kagetsuchi proclaimed. Yuzumaki Mido tightly clenched her fist, but she didn't utter a single word, accepting her punishment in silence. How could you do this to Grandma? I won't let this go unpunished, I'll fight you. Senju Tsunade exclaimed, preparing to attack. However, just as she was about to move, a golden chain wrapped around her, effectively sealing her chakra and preventing her from moving. Without a word, Mido made a move. I apologize uncle. She's just a child. Please forgive her for her rudeness, said Mido in a conciliatory tone. Just as Mido finished speaking, Saratobi Hiruzen and Danzo, along with several others, entered the room. By the way, I wanted to ask you, are these the only members of the Senju family present here, or are there others stationed elsewhere? Inquired Yuzumaki Kagasuchi. No, these are the only people who remain in the Senju family, replied Mido. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if my memory serves me correctly, an elder from the Senju clan wanted to get rid of me because I cut off his son's hand. He sent a team of elite ninjas after me, and I killed them all. But their numbers were far greater than the people present here in the Senju clan. This is laughable, remarked Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi continued, furthermore, how could you allow clans like Saratobi and Shimera to ride on your coattails and become your leaders? In the Warring States period, they were like dogs that we trained to fight for us. Upon hearing Kagetsuchi's words, the expressions on everyone's faces changed. However, Mido was not shocked by the remarks, as she knew that during the Warring States period, large clans like theirs only trained low-level clans and used them as mere cannon fodder during battles. Danzo's face contorted with rage, and he gave Kagetsuchi a menacing stare, as if he was ready to pounce on him. Kagetsuchi noticed the anger on Danzo's face and vanished into thin air, only to reappear directly in front of Danzo, causing the room to shake with the force of his sudden movement. Kagetsuchi then grabbed Danzo by the neck, lifting him off the ground with ease. Kagetsuchi's expression turned dark as he spoke, How dare you look at me like that? A weakling like you must value your hand very much for using ninjutsu, as a punishment for your impudence I will take your hand. After saying that Kagetsuchi held the right hand of Danzo and burned his right hand, Danzo let out a miserable cry that echoed throughout the Senju family compound. Kagetsuchi appeared back in the main seat in the room. Everyone in the room remained still and silent, their minds processing the events that just unfolded. Saratobi Hiruzen was particularly taken aback, his thoughts racing as he observed the lightning-fast movements of Kagetsuchi. The concept of space ninjutsu flashed through his mind, but he had no way to confirm it. 
The atmosphere in the room was tense, with an eerie silence that lingered as everyone tried to make sense of what had just occurred. After regaining his composure, Saratobi hears an approach Danzo and inquired, How are you feeling? Through gritted teeth, Danzo replied, I'm fine. Saratobi hears and directed his attention towards Kagetsuchi, and asked if your current course of action would lead to the rupture of the alliance between their two ninja villages. Kagetsuchi retorted, the alliance between our villages was broken the moment Kanoha abandoned my Uzumaki village. Don't act as if you care about breaking the alliance now. Furthermore, I am not here to receive compensation from you, but to take back the gift given to Kanoha as a sign of alliance by the Uzumaki family. Kahara Yudatane inquired, what specifically are you referring to? Sensing barrier dots at Kagetsuchi. Everyone present was taken aback upon hearing this revelation. However, if the barrier surrounding Kanoha was truly removed, it would make it easier for other ninja villages to infiltrate Kanoha, which was not in the best interest of the village. Although Kanoha could create a new barrier, the quality may not match the current one, and the process of creating a new barrier was time-consuming, and could take up to two to three months to complete. Mido finally spoke up, Uncle, I apologize, but I cannot allow you to proceed with this. Kagasuchi responded, I didn't ask for your permission. This is my sole purpose for being here. Mido replied with determination, even if I have to use force, I will not let you pass. She readied herself for any action that might be necessary. With Mido's words echoing in his mind, Kagetsuchi discreetly instructed the system to activate Yamamoto's 60% template card. As he spoke, an immense rush of Riyatsu coursed through his being, and he sensed that he could unleash Ryujin Jaka's Shikai with ease. In a mere fraction of a second, the events transpired, leaving everyone oblivious to Kagetsuchi's actions and their outcome. The mystery of what had occurred with Kagetsuchi lingered, shrouded in secrecy. As Kagetsuchi rose from his seat, he cast a calm gaze over the assembled crowd. With the subtle release of his immense Riyatsu, the atmosphere in the room changed in an instant. Unlike anything Sir Toby Hirzen had felt before, the pressure was overpowering, leaving even the cage-level individuals in attendance struggling to maintain their composure. Weaker civilian Jonans buckled under the weight of the force, and were forced to kneel. The oppressive power emanating from Kagetsuchi's body enveloped the entire room, rendering all present immobile. Even Saratobi Hirzen, a seasoned veteran of such displays, felt as though an immense weight was bearing down on his shoulders, halting his movements. The atmosphere was thick with tension as the force continued to emanate from Kagetsuchi, leaving everyone present struggling to keep their wits about them. As Kagetsuchi's overwhelming Riyatsu filled the room, Mido too unleashed her vast chakra, in an attempt to counteract the pressure. However, to her surprise, her efforts were in vain. It was then that she realized that the pressure wasn't physical, it was attacking their very souls. Despite her immense power, Mido was unable to offset the force of Kagetsuchi's assault on their souls. It was a realization that sent a shiver down her spine, as she had never experienced anything like this before. The pressure weighed heavily on her soul, leaving her feeling powerless and vulnerable. As the pressure continued to bear down on the souls of those present, Mido realized that this was a level of power beyond anything she had ever encountered. It was a humbling experience, and one that left her with a newfound respect for Kagetsuchi's abilities. It's quite regretful. Kagetsuchi expressed his deep regret, conveying his remorse in a solemn tone. He then reached for his crutch using his left hand. As he picked it up, a sudden burst of flame seemed to engulf the crutch, transforming it into Ryujin Jaka with a purple handle. Kagetsuchi firmly gripped the handle of the sword, unsheathed the blade, and plunged it into the ground. Next, he lifted both his hands, causing his white shirt to flutter away, and removed his black kozode, revealing his scarred bare upper body, that bore testimony to his many battles. The intense heat emanating from the fiery aura surrounding him was palpable to all who were present. Kagetsuchi then casually wielded Ryujin Jaka with his right hand, unleashing a massive wave of flames that surged towards everyone in the vicinity. As Saratobi hears and witnessed the colossal wave of fire, he was filled with a sense of dread, acutely aware that if it were to make contact with his body, he would perish in an instant. Without a moment's hesitation, he swiftly formed a hand seal, creating a shadow clone of himself, which immediately sprang into action. The Shadow Clone deftly began executing a complex ceiling, quickly followed by unleashing a powerful A-rank water ninjutsu, to counter the raging inferno. What a release. Exploding water colliding wave, and his real body behind the Shadow Clone, also made seals to create Earth release. 
Earth Style while several other skilled ninja, well versed in the art of water ninjutsu, promptly sprang into action. Each of them utilized their unique water-based techniques, which collectively resulted in a brief but crucial interruption in the progression of the searing flames. This timely intervention created a crucial window of opportunity for all those present to swiftly make their escape from the fiery inferno. Mido issued a command, her voice ringing out with a sense of urgency. Minki, I need you to take charge and evacuate all of them from this location. Ensure the safety of the civilians by escorting them to a secure location. I have already given orders to evacuate the civilians the moment he infiltrated Kanoha, stated Saratobi Hirazan in a firm and resolute tone, emphasizing the urgency of the situation. Excellent. All of you need to leave this area immediately. It is not safe for you to engage in the upcoming battle, commanded Mido, her tone forceful and unwavering. Without hesitation, she swiftly transformed into the Four Tails form of the Nine Tails, ready to confront Kagetsuchi head-on. With lightning speed, Mido lunged forward, launching a powerful punch towards her opponent. Kagetsuchi, equally swift, utilized his Akatsu technique to meet Mido's attack head-on. The force of the impact was tremendous, and though Kagetsuchi remained steadfast, Mido's right hand was almost completely twisted, and she was hurled several hundred meters away, leaving a trail of destruction in her wake, and carving out a massive gully in the ground. Even as Saratobi departed with the others, his attention remained fixated on the fierce clash between Kagetsuchi and Mido, and he continued to observe the battle with rapt attention. The onlookers were struck with a sense of sheer horror, as they bore witness to the incredible display of brute strength that Kagetsuchi demonstrated by landing a devastating punch on Mido, overpowering her with apparent ease. Until that moment, many had been under the impression that Kagetsuchi relied solely on his formidable ninjutsu and kinjutsu skills, and had never fathomed the notion that the elderly man could possess the physical strength necessary to engage with a tailed beast, and the nine tails no less. Mido rose from the wreckage, her previously injured hand rapidly regenerating before the eyes of the stunned onlookers. In what seemed like a matter of mere moments, her hand had fully healed, leaving no trace of the injury behind. With her body still transformed into the powerful four-tailed form, Mido opened her jaws wide and began to concentrate her chakra, drawing in a tailed beast bomb and swallowing it whole. As she did so, an enormous red beam of energy began to form within her maw, crackling with power and primed for launch. Kagetsuchi, aware of the impending attack, drew his sword and swung it in a mighty arc, generating a massive black shockwave that surged forth towards the incoming beam of light. The two titanic forces met in a blinding flash of energy, unleashing a massive explosion that rent the earth asunder, leaving behind a massive crater that spanned well over a hundred meters in diameter. Both of them are monsters, remarked Kahari Yudatin, her voice heavy with awe and trepidation. Agreed, concurred the head of the Hayuga clan, whose face bore a similar expression of disbelief and apprehension. Indeed, the collective sentiment of the onlookers was unanimous, the sheer magnitude of destruction wrought by the initial clashes between Kagetsuchi and Mido, was nothing short of awe-inspiring. As they beheld the incredible spectacle unfolding before them, they could not help but wonder what the full extent of the devastation would be, once the two titans fully unleashed their power upon one another. Kagetsuchi stood facing Mido, his senses on high alert. Suddenly, he detected a shift in the ground and instinctively used Shunpo to disappear from his location. In the blink of an eye, the spot where he had been standing was engulfed in a mass of writhing, red hands belonging to the Nine Tails. Undeterred, Kagetsuchi reappeared in a flash, this time dangerously close to Mido. Pointing a finger at her, he unleashed Hado No. 44 Pale Multi-Lightning Spell. As the spell took effect, bolts of lightning rained down upon Mido's four tails form, eliciting a deafening roar from the nine tails. Despite the overwhelming power of Kagetsuchi's attack, however, Mido remained steadfast and resolute, bracing herself against the onslaught of lightning, with all the fury and ferocity of a cornered beast. It was clear to all present that this battle between two monsters was far from over, and that the true test of strength was yet to come. Kagetsuchi intently observed as Mido endured the relentless onslaught of thunder, which resulted in a massive explosion of dust that enveloped and obscured everything in sight. Yet, amidst the chaos, a deafening roar reverberated throughout the entire village of Kanoha. In a dramatic display of strength, Mido emerged from the billowing cloud of dust, but with a notable difference six tails now extended from her body, and her entire form was enshrouded in an otherworldly white bone armor. A ferocious thunderous roar erupted from the mouth of the nine-tailed fox as it began to gather massive amounts of chakra. 
the chakra soon coalesced into multiple tail beast bombs, each one more volatile and destructive than the last. As the bombs completed their formation, they began to move with alarming speed in the direction of Kagetsuchi, leaving nothing but destruction in their wake. The Kudo Number 81 Splitting void with unwavering determination, Kagetsuchi invoked a powerful Bakudo, channeling his spiritual energy to create a formidable transparent barrier before him. The nine-tailed fox unleashed a barrage of multiple tail beast bombs upon the wall, causing a series of thunderous explosions to reverberate throughout the area. However, despite the sheer force of the blasts, Kagetsuchi remained steadfast and unscathed behind his impenetrable defense. By the gods, what kind of impenetrable defense is this? Not even the might of a tail beast bomb can leave a scratch on it, exclaimed the head of the Nara clan in awe. Indeed, I have never beheld anything quite like it in all my years, replied the head of the Akamachi clan in equal amazement. All those present were astounded by Kagetsuchi's unparalleled power and unwavering defense. However, only Saratobi Hiruzen, the third Hokage of Kanoha, fully grasped the implications of this display of strength. If Mido had knowledge of his future plans, he couldn't even begin to imagine the extent of devastation that could be wrought. The mere thought of it sent a chill down his spine, leaving him with a deep sense of foreboding. In the wake of the bombardment, the transparent barrier dissipated, leaving Kagetsuchi exposed and vulnerable to attack. In that moment, Mido surged forward and delivered a powerful punch aimed squarely at his midsection. However, with a swift and graceful movement, Kagetsuchi employed the Shunpo technique to vanish from sight, reappearing a moment later above the head of the nine-tailed fox. Summoning all his strength, Kagetsuchi unleashed a devastating blow, striking the creature's skull with incredible force. The impact was so intense that it left a massive crater in its wake, shattering the white bone armor that covered the nine tails head. Your efforts are futile, Mido. You are no match for me, Kagetsuchi declared confidently, his voice echoing through the clearing. I refuse to give up, Mido replied firmly, her voice ringing out with determination. With that declaration, she began to undergo a dramatic transformation, her body convulsing as she underwent a rapid metamorphosis. Within moments, she had grown two additional tails, bringing the total to eight. And as her transformation continued, her white bone armor began to spread and envelop her entire body, forming an almost impenetrable exoskeleton. Without warning, a multitude of chakra hands appeared from all directions, converging upon Kagetsuchi with lightning speed. However, the Kagetsuchi was more than ready for the assault, expertly slicing through the hands with his Ryujin Jaka. As the severed appendages fell to the ground, they erupted into flames, their incineration adding to the already intense heat of the battle. The two combatants continued their fierce clash, each one unleashing their most powerful physical attacks with devastating effect. Every blow landed with bone-jarring force, leaving destruction and devastation in their wake. With each passing moment, Mido displayed her incredible prowess and skill, slowly but surely taking Kagetsuchi out of the village of Kanoha. As the battle raged on, the once thriving village was reduced to a desolate wasteland of rubble and ruin. The sound of shattering stone and splintering wood echoed throughout the area, a grim testament to the incredible power of the two combatants. Despite the devastation, however, Mido remained resolute, her focus unbroken as she relentlessly pursued her opponent, determined to emerge victorious at any cost. As the long and grueling battle wore on, both Kagetsuchi and Mido found themselves standing face to face, each one struggling to gain the upper hand. Mido knew that she couldn't sustain her transformation into the nine-tailed fox for much longer, as the strain on her body was becoming increasingly unbearable. She knew that she needed to end this fight quickly if she hoped to emerge victorious. However, as she looked across at her uncle, she couldn't help but feel a sense of disbelief and shock. Despite the intensity of the battle and the toll it had taken on her own body, Kagetsuchi seemed completely unfazed, not even showing the slightest hint of fatigue. Mido was amazed at how someone as old as her uncle could possess such incredible stamina and endurance. While Kagetsuchi himself was not yet exhausted, he knew that time was running out. The effects of the Yamamoto Genusite template card, which had boosted his power to previously unimaginable levels, were beginning to wear off. With the clock ticking down, Kagetsuchi made the decision to go all out, unleashing his full power in a final, desperate bid for victory. Let us bring an end to this battle, Mido. Henceforth, I shall fight with all my might, so do not let your guard down. Kagetsuchi's voice was firm and resolute as he tightened his grip on his Ryujin Jaka, and he said, reduce all creation to ash, as Kagetsuchi's words fell, 
causing a massive surge of flames to engulf him, and the intensity of the heat radiating from the flames was palpable even from Kanoha village. Danzo was astonished by the sheer magnitude of the temperature, his expression betraying his disbelief. I can feel the heat from here. What must be the temperature like where they are fighting? Hamur Mitakato chimed in, affirming Danzo's assessment. This level of heat is sufficient to incinerate regular civilians and even genin level shinobi. Everyone, make sure to protect yourselves by covering your body with chakra. If you still feel any discomfort, evacuate immediately, advised Saratobi Hiruzen, taking charge of the situation. He then instructed his subordinates, go and check if the heat is causing any damage to the shelters. The group followed Hiruzen's orders and quickly dispersed to take action. The heat was overwhelming, causing a sense of unease and panic to set in among the ninjas. Those who were unable to withstand the heat had already started to evacuate, seeking refuge in cooler locations. Meanwhile, Kagetsuchi had unleashed the full power of his Ryujin Jaka, and the intensity of the flames had only increased, making it even more challenging for Mido to keep up with the pace of the battle. It was clear that Kagetsuchi had surpassed his limits and was fighting with everything he had. Fortress Blaze a massive towering wall of searing flames, encircled Mido's nine-tailed form, creating a colossal, fiery sphere that entrapped her within it. Roar a thunderous roar echoed across the surroundings as the outer bone and chakra body of the nine-tailed form were relentlessly burned and restored, causing immense agony to Mido. Despite being imprisoned in the sphere of flame for a minute, she was finally able to break free, but her nine-tailed form appeared visibly distressed and miserable. After experiencing the pain and healing from her injuries, Mido noticed that her size had decreased compared to before. She knew that she couldn't defeat Kagetsuchi in her current state, so she made the decision to transform into her Nine Tails form. However, in this form, she struggled to control the Nine Tails and remained sane at the same time, which is why she usually avoided using it. In this form, the Nine Tails appear to be the same, except without any hair or skin, only muscles and bones, with the Nine Tails swinging behind her. Mido launched herself at Kagetsuchi once again, her razor-sharp claws glinting in the dim light of the battlefield. But Kagetsuchi was ready for her, deftly parrying her blows with his expert swordsmanship. The two combatants traded blows, each trying to gain the upper hand, but it seemed that Kagetsuchi was always one step ahead. Suddenly, Kagetsuchi unleashed his next move, Torch, and a massive inferno engulfed the nine-tailed fox. Mido let out a deafening roar as the flames consumed her, causing her immense pain and agony. But even in the face of this pain, Mido continued to lash out at Kagetsuchi, determined to defeat him at all costs. Despite her efforts, Mido was unable to inflict damage on Kagetsuchi with her relentless onslaught. As time passed, the flames showed no signs of extinguishing. Inside the sealed space within Mido, Kurama felt the heat and pain of the inferno as it ravaged his soul. He knew that if the fire continued, he and Mido would perish together. Desperate to save Mido, Kurama made a decision. He called out to her, his voice echoing within her mind. Mido, if this continues, we will both be burned, he said, his voice filled with urgency. Mido was surprised to hear Kurama's voice, but she was too consumed by her anger to care. Why do you care? She shouted back, her voice cracking with pain. You will be resurrected anyway after some time. So you should be happy. But Kurama knew that there was more at stake than just his own resurrection. Mido had been his companion for so long, and he couldn't bear the thought of losing her. I don't want to die yet so you release my seal, and I will lend you my strength. He replied with a rough voice. Mido stood there in shock, her eyes wide with surprise, as she listened to the words of the nine-tailed fox. Even though he had spoken in a commanding tone, she could sense the deep care and concern that lay behind his words. For a moment, Mido was silent, contemplating what the nine-tailed fox had said. Slowly, Mido nodded her head, acknowledging the truth of Kurama's words. She knew that if they continued to fight in this way, they would both perish and she didn't want that to happen. Without hesitation, she released the seal that had kept the nine-tailed fox locked inside her for so many years. As she did so, a surge of powerful chakra began to flow through her body, causing her to glow with an otherworldly light. Slowly, Mido began to transform once again, but this time, it was different. Instead of the usual crimson aura that surrounded her, she was now enveloped in a shimmering golden chakra that pulsed with incredible power. As the red flames covering her whole body spread from her body, everything around her was consumed in a blaze of fire. But Mido stood unharmed in the center of the inferno, using the outer layer of chakra to disperse the flames to the ground beneath her feet. 
Kagasuchi watched all this. This is the first time in real life he saw the transformation of someone into Nine Tails mode. This is unexpected, he muttered to himself, raising an eyebrow in surprise. She can use the Nine Tails mode. Mito's eyes blazed with determination as she unleashed a barrage of five powerful tail beast bombs, hurling them toward Kagatsuchi with all her might. The air around them crackled with energy as the bombs streaked through the air, leaving a trail of fiery destruction in their wake. But Kagatsuchi was ready for her attack this time. With incredible speed and precision, he slashed his sword five times, each strike connecting with a tail beast bomb, and cleaving it in half. The explosions were enormous, sending shockwaves rippling through the earth, and shaking the very foundations of Kanoha. In the heart of the village, Saratobi Hirazan and the other elite Jonin had gathered, watching the battle from a distance. They could feel the tremors of the explosions even from where they stood, and they knew that this was a fight unlike any they had ever witnessed before. As the smoke cleared and the dust settled, Mido and Kagatsuchi stood facing each other once again, their eyes locked in a fierce battle of wills. Neither was willing to give an inch, and Mido knew the fate of Kano had depends on the result of this battle. Kahara Yudatane's eyes widened in amazement as she watched the battle unfolding before her. She turned to Saratobi Hirazan, her voice tinged with awe. Hirazan, have you ever seen Mido Sama in this form before? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. This question was in the mind of everyone present here. Hirazan shook his head, his eyes fixed on Mido and Kagatsuchi's struggle playing out before them. No, he replied. I have never seen anything like this in my entire life. And even in all my years of studying under the teacher, I have never come across any mention of such a form. The Kudo number 62. Hundred steps fence Kagatsuchi formed a luminous, blue-white rod of energy in his palm, and hurled it towards Mido. Upon impact, the rod split into a multitude of smaller rods, descending upon Mido like a shower and trapping her against the earth, rendering her unable to move. Due to the confined space, evading the attack proved to be a daunting task. Undeterred, Mido summoned nine adamantine chains infused with chakra from her body, using them to shatter the light rods and liberate herself. With newfound freedom, she quickly transformed into Kurama form, manifesting a colossal, translucent body of nine tails that enclosed her entirely. As soon as the nine tails took shape, its majestic form radiated an aura of immense power, causing the very air to tremble. With a fierce determination, it channeled an enormous amount of chakra into the creation of a tail beast bomb, whose size dwarfed all previous iterations, and whose explosive potential was unmatched. The bomb glowed with an ominous intensity, crackling with raw energy as it hurtled towards Kagatsuchi at a breakneck speed, leaving behind a trail of destruction in its wake. With a terse command of enough playing, go to sleep, Kagatsuchi's body pulsed with an overwhelming surge of pressure, signaling the seriousness of his intent. In a swift motion, he unleashed a devastating technique known as Flames of Hell, following Kagatsuchi's fierce attack. Five towering pillars of flame erupted from the ground, completely encircling Mido in her formidable Kurama form. The intense heat generated by the flames was almost unbearable, causing the surrounding area to glow with an orange or hue. As the tail beast bomb hurtled towards its target with breakneck speed, it was suddenly engulfed by the inferno of fire, disappearing within the scorching blaze of the towering pillars. Mido was in a dire situation, as she tried to move from her spot. However, the heat emanating from the pillars of flame was overwhelming, causing her to feel unbearable. The fire's intensity was consuming her chakra at an alarming rate, leaving her with limited options. In a last-ditch effort, she mustered her strength and channeled her power to unleash the multiple tail beast bomb once again. The powerful attack was aimed at the fiery columns, but to her dismay, as the bomb drew closer, the pillars vanished into thin air. It was as if the flames had disintegrated them into nothingness, leaving Mido in utter disbelief. Determined not to give up, Mido summoned her adamantine chains, which were covered with all nine tails of the nine tails. She controlled the tails with great precision, and attacked the fire pillars with all her might, hoping to defeat them. However, her efforts proved to be ineffective against the intense flames. The adamantine chains could not penetrate the pillars, leaving Mido feeling helpless and uncertain about what to do next. Mido was struggling to withstand the heat and flames, while Kagatsuchi stood seemingly unfazed amidst the inferno. The scene appeared almost surreal, as though it was all an illusion. However, it was far from that. The reality was that Kagatsuchi was indeed standing amidst the flames, but they posed no threat to him. After all, he possessed Ryujin Jaka, a powerful weapon that made the fire seem like nothing more than a mere nuisance. 
As Kagetsuchi clutched his formidable Ryujin Jaka with a steady hand, he disappeared from his previous spot in a split second. Then, he materialized behind the nine-tailed beast with the grace that belied his immense power. The suddenness of his movement was almost startling, but his calm demeanor remained unchanged. The first killing stroke the nine-tailed beast's translucent golden chakra body was sliced in two by Kagetsuchi's powerful Ryujin Jaka. A deafening roar reverberated throughout the area as the beast's body was split apart. The once radiant and imposing figure of the nine-tailed beast was now reduced to a fading shimmer of golden light that slowly dissipated into the air. As the nine tails vanished, Mido emerged from within its form and plummeted to the ground, feeling humiliated by her defeat. The impact of her fall was jarring, and she struggled to regain her composure. Her breaths came in ragged gasps as she tried to process what had just happened. Despite the overwhelming sense of defeat, she refused to give up. With a wave of his hand, Kagasuchi dispelled the fiery pillars that had surrounded both himself and Mido. The flames dissipated into thin air, leaving behind a trail of smoke and ash. Upon seeing the sudden disappearance of the flames, Mido attempted to rise to her feet. However, she found herself unable to do so and slumped back to the ground, feeling defeated and hopeless. Why did you dispel the fire? She muttered, her voice barely above a whisper. Just let me die, she added, her words heavy with despair. The defeat she felt was overwhelming, and she could not fathom the idea of continuing the battle any longer. You are someone who can abandon your own family, but I am not like you, Kagasuchi spoke as he approached Mido, standing directly in front of her. I cannot bring myself to kill my own niece with my own hands, he continued, his voice firm and resolute. All I wanted was to punish you and the village of Kanoha for their betrayal, nothing more, he added, his gaze steady and unwavering. Despite the animosity between them, Kagasuchi's words conveyed a sense of compassion and understanding that Mido had not expected. She remained silent, unsure of how to respond to his unexpected show of mercy. Kagetsuchi sheathed his Ryujin Jaka, and as he did, the sword transformed into a simple-looking crutch. He then adjusted his clothing, donning a black kozo that covered his upper body, and a white heori that billowed in the wind as it reappeared over his shoulder. The transformation of his weapon, coupled with his change in appearance, created an atmosphere of calm and tranquility. Mido was utterly shocked by what she had just witnessed. Kagetsuchi appeared completely unscathed, as if he had not been in a fierce battle moments ago. His clothing was immaculate, without a single tear or blemish, and there was no sign of injury or fatigue on his face. Mido couldn't help but feel a sense of disbelief and amazement at his resilience. She had been fighting tooth and nail to survive, but here was Kagetsuchi, seemingly unharmed. It was a testament to his strength and power, and Mido couldn't help but feel a sense of both admiration and fear towards him. Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi spoke in a firm and unwavering tone, If my intention was to kill you, I would have done so without hesitation. I could have easily cut both you and the nine tails in half. His words were laced with a sense of finality that left Mido feeling unnerved. Kagetsuchi then approached her and gently touched her forehead with the tip of his crutch. He closed his eyes, and a sudden surge of energy emanated from the crutch, enveloping Mido in a bright light. The energy dissipated as quickly as it had appeared, leaving Mido feeling disoriented and confused. She could not comprehend what had just happened, and the sense of unease within her only continued to grow. Mido's confusion and unease were evident in her voice as she asked Kagetsuchi, what did you just do? Her gaze was fixed on him, searching for any hint of an answer in his expression. She couldn't shake the feeling that something had changed, that some part of her had been altered in some way that she couldn't quite grasp. Kagetsuchi's response was direct and to the point. I have placed a seal on your soul. You will never be able to share any knowledge of sealing techniques with others, nor will you be able to use these techniques for others. If you attempt to do so, your soul will be consumed by flames. His words hung heavy in the air, leaving Mido feeling a sense of shock and despair. The art of sealing was one of her greatest reliance that even if she lost and Kagetsuchi removes the barrier from the village she can restore it with due time, but now it's impossible. Mido's head drooped in defeat as she whispered softly, is it not possible to forgive Kanoha and let bygones be bygones? Her heart was heavy with sorrow, and she struggled to accept the weight of Kagetsuchi's actions. The thought of being unable to use the sealing techniques that had defined her for so long was almost too much to bear. But even more than that, the idea that she could never share her knowledge with anyone else, felt like a crushing blow. It was as if her entire identity had been taken away from her in a single moment. Kagetsuchi's response was firm and unyielding. 
The Yuzumaki clan will never forgive Kanoha, he said with conviction. You should be grateful that I spared them for the sake of our past alliance. Only their infrastructure was destroyed, and even that can be repaired with the financial resources of the fire country. His words were harsh, but there was no denying the truth in them. The pain and betrayal of the past ran deep, and it was not something that could be easily forgotten or forgiven. Mito let out a heavy sigh, accepting the reality that her uncle's feelings towards Kanoha and towards her, were unlikely to change. Despite her efforts to make amends, she knew that the wounds of the past were too deep for a simple apology to heal. Still, she took comfort in knowing that she had done everything she could to try and bridge the divide between the Yuzumaki clan and their former allies. Kagasuchi explained to Mido that her unique Higura hard eye mutation, combined with the power of the Nine Tails, made it impossible for her not to sense the intense hostility directed towards her and the Senju clan. He warned her about the dangerous nature of those who can hide their true emotions, like the Hokage and Danzo, and express concern for her well-being. As a member of the Yuzumaki clan, Kagasuchi urged Mido not to give up on her life, and not to tarnish the Yuzumaki bloodline. He noticed that she had a desire to die, which troubled him deeply. Mido has since recovered and is now standing upright. Upon hearing Kagatsuchi's words, she bowed her head. Despite Hiruzen's ability to conceal his hostility, Mido could sense it, especially after experiencing the animosity from Taburama's students. If not for the Nine Tails contaminating her Kagura hard eye, she may not have detected Hiruzen's malice. However, having the Nine Tails within her for many years caused her Kagura hard eye to mutate, allowing her to perceive the ill will emanating from Hiruzen. Mido acknowledged Kagatsuchi's statement with a nod. Mido's voice was tinged with a hint of sadness as she continued, It is disheartening to see such animosity towards the Senju clan, especially after all we have done for the village. Hashirama founded the village, and Taburama was instrumental in creating its infrastructure and administration. Yet, we are treated with suspicion and disdain. She paused for a moment before adding, However, as much as it pains me to do so, I understand the importance of stability within the village. Any disruption could cause chaos and potentially harm innocent lives. Thus, I choose to bear this burden in silence, and continue to work towards a better future for all. Mido's words were filled with a sense of duty and sacrifice, as she put the needs of the village above her own personal grievances. It was a testament to her strength and character, and it was clear that her devotion to Kanoha ran deep. Mido's thoughts were interrupted as Kagatsuchi shook his head, clearly disagreeing with her stance. I understand your concerns, but I cannot help but see this as cowardice on your part. Avoiding confrontation will only allow the hostility towards the Senju clan to continue unchecked, he stated firmly. As he looked at Mido, Kagatsuchi's expression softened. As your uncle, I wish you nothing but happiness, but as the head of the Yuzumaki family, I must also consider the interests of our people. Therefore, I must inform you that, from this point on, you are not permitted to enter Yuzumaki country, he said with a tinge of regret. Mido's heart sank at the news. She had always felt a deep connection to her ancestral homeland, and the thought of being forbidden from returning was difficult to bear. However, she knew that Kagasuchi's decision was not made lightly, and that it was meant to protect both her and their people. I understand, uncle. I will abide by your decision, Mido said, trying to mask the pain in her voice. She knew that her path was now forever altered, and she could only hope that someday the rift between their families would be healed. Mido didn't say further just bowed towards him. With a nod towards Mido, Kagasuchi turned and swiftly departed the area, utilizing his shunpo to move with incredible speed. Within mere seconds, he materialized in front of Saratobi Hirzen and other high-ranking officials in Kanoha. The sudden appearance of Kagatsuchi left everyone present stunned, and they immediately prepared themselves for any potential battle that might ensue. All eyes were fixed on the elderly man standing before them, and a hush fell over the group, as they took in the awe-inspiring display of power he had exhibited only moments before. The towering pillars of fire that had erupted into the sky, were a testament to his immense strength, and the heat emanating from the inferno was nearly unbearable, even from the distance they stood. The sheer force of his energy was palpable, and they knew that he was not to be trifled with. As they watched him with wary eyes, the tension in the air was almost tangible. They were unsure of what his intentions were, but they knew that they could not let their guard down. The presence of such a powerful and mysterious figure was enough to put anyone on edge. Sir Toby Hirzen, ever mindful of his position as Hokage, managed to keep his composure despite the sudden appearance of the enigmatic Kagatsuchi. 
With a measured tone, he spoke up and asked, May I inquire as to the whereabouts of Mido Sama? Although his mind was racing with questions and suspicions, he knew that it was important to remain calm and collected in the face of such a powerful figure. As the leader of Kanoha, he could ill afford to show any signs of weakness or panic. The other high-ranking officials present also maintained a stoic facade, though they too were curious about the intentions of this mysterious visitor. All eyes were fixed on Kagetsuchi, waiting for his response. Rest assured, Yumito Sama is perfectly safe, reassured Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, his calm voice carrying across the group. Upon hearing this, Saratobi hears and breathed a sigh of relief, feeling the tension in his body release. That's wonderful news, he replied with a hint of gratitude in his voice. Tamura Mitakato and Kahari Yudatine echoed his sentiment, expressing their relief that Mito Sama had come through unscathed. As they spoke, the atmosphere in the group began to relax, the weight of their fears lifting as they realized that their beloved leader was out of harm's way. Kagasuchi's voice dripped with disgust and anger, causing everyone present to tense up. How dare you even think that I would believe your lies? He spat, his eyes blazing with fury. As he spoke, Tsunade, Jiraiya, and Orochimaru arrived on the scene, their eyes widening in surprise at the sight of Kagetsuchi's power. Tsunade was especially taken aback by Kagetsuchi's abilities. Though she was known for her recklessness, she was not foolish enough to believe that she could deceive such a powerful figure. Looking around at the faces of those present, she could see the panic and fear etched on their features. The only one who seemed calm in the face of Kagasuchi's rage was Saratobi Hiruzen, his expression as inscrutable as ever. Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi spoke with a commanding tone, his words brooking no argument. I am not here to waste time. Bring me the sealed book of Kanoha, and if any of you dares to claim that it was destroyed during our battle, I will not hesitate to destroy this village completely. His eyes blazed with a fierce intensity, and everyone present could feel the weight of his power bearing down upon them. None dared to speak out of turn, and a heavy silence settled over the group as they considered their next move. Saratobi Hiruzen simply nodded and gestured to the Anbu beside him. The Anbu nodded in response and handed over a scroll to Kagetsuchi, saying, This scroll contains all the ninjutsu that were stored in the sealed book. Kagetsuchi took the scroll from the Anbu and scanned it briefly, his eyes flicking over the contents with practiced ease. After a moment, he rolled it up and handed it back to the Anbu. Good, he said simply. I will take my leave now. With an unexpected and sudden motion, he came to an abrupt stop, pivoted on his heels, and turned his gaze towards Saratobi Hiruzen and the others. His countenance was grave and serious as he intoned, take heed of my words. Despite the fact that I have cast Mido out from the Uzumaki clan and barter from our village, if any harm should come to her as a result of your actions, I will ensure that the entire village of Kanoha is buried along with her. The fervent and intense surge of Riyatsu exploded from his being, enveloping everyone in a fiery inferno that singed their senses. And just like that, Kagasuchi vanished into thin air, leaving behind a stunned and speechless crowd. As soon as Mido arrived, she overheard Kagasuchi's words and a surge of warmth swept over her heart. Memories of her childhood flooded her mind, where she spent countless hours playing with Kagasuchi who always teased and made her laugh. She was lost in thought, her mind wandering back to those carefree days when her heart was filled with pure joy. And then, suddenly, a long-forgotten smile lit up her face, the kind that was genuine and heartfelt. The people around her noticed the transformation and were moved by the radiance of her smile. It was as though they could feel the joy emanating from her soul. After a moment of contemplation, Mido regained her composure and directed her gaze towards Saratobi Hiruzen. Before we proceed any further, there are two things I need to inform you about, began Yuzumaki Mido, addressing Saratobi Hiruzen. Firstly, my uncle placed a seal on me which limits my ability to use sealing techniques on others. I can only use them on myself, specifically to control the power of the Nine Tails within me. Secondly, due to this seal, I am unable to assist you with repairing the barrier that my uncle broke. Saratobi Hiruzen was taken aback by this revelation and turned to Mido, asking incredulously, Even you, Mido-sama, are unable to break this seal. Mido responded patiently, If the seal was placed on my body through a sealing technique, I might have been able to try and remove it. However, my uncle placed the seal on my soul, and I am unable to even consider removing it. I can simply feel the presence of the seal within my soul, and nothing more. Upon hearing Mido's explanation, Saratobi hears and lapsed into deep thought. 
He realized that Mido was not lying, for as a cage-level powerhouse himself, he understood that the power employed by Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi was intricately tied to the soul, even though he could not discern the specifics. After hearing Tomito's words Saratobi hears and can just nod helplessly. Mido adopted a warning tone as she continued, and there is one more thing I need to say. Until now, I have chosen to overlook the hostility that you and your companions have directed towards me and my Senju family. However, from this day onwards, I caution you to be aware that if even a single member of the Senju family is harmed, and I detect even a hint of your involvement, I will make sure that your entire family is buried alongside them. As Mido's words fell, despite being injured by Kagetsuchi, her aura of dominance was overwhelming. Upon hearing Mido's words, a chill ran down the spines of everyone present, particularly the Kanoha F4. Mido addressed Saratobi Hiruzen directly. I am aware that you might be wondering how I could detect hostility from you, given that you were trained to conceal your intentions, and your clan possesses the method to counter the Kagura hard eye abilities of the Yuzumaki clan. Hiruzen quickly responded, Mido-sama, I would never think to doubt your abilities, and my clan doesn't have such a thing. Mido shook her head and turned to face Hiruzen, your father, Saratobi Sasuke, had a best friend from the Yuzumaki family, who possessed the rare Kagura hard eye. This Yuzumaki taught your father how to conceal his emotions flawlessly, and in order to keep the method a secret, your father killed his friend. However, your father was unaware that the Yuzumaki's summoning beast had the unique ability to communicate with its summoner from a great distance. As a result, news of the Yuzumaki's death reached the clan, ultimately leading to your father's own demise. Mido's voice was calm and measured as she recounted the tale, her gaze fixed on Hiruzen. The weight of her words hung heavily in the air, and the Kanoha elders shifted uncomfortably, their faces tense with unease. It was clear that Mido's knowledge of their clan's past was far-reaching, and her power was not to be underestimated. Hirzen, in particular, felt a chill run down his spine at the mention of his father's actions and their repercussions. He knew he had made a grave mistake underestimating Mido and her clan. Mido turned her attention to Tsunade and issued her command. Go and gather all the members of the Senju family, and instruct them to construct a temporary dwelling for us to live in. Her tone was firm, yet there was a hint of kindness in her voice. Tsunade nodded, a sense of relief washing over her. It was clear that Mido's actions were driven by a sense of duty towards her clan, but she was also compassionate towards those who were loyal to her family. Tsunade was about to speak, but Mido raised her hand, cutting her off. I understand you must have many questions, but let's save them for another time. Right now, I'm exhausted, she said. Tsunade showed her wisdom by refraining from asking any further questions, and gently guided Mido away from the place. Danzo approached Saratobi, clutching his right shoulder with his left hand, and spoke with a grave tone, Hiruzen, this situation is not good. If Mido truly possesses this level of protection for her clan, then it's highly likely that another person with the power of our sensei, may emerge from the Senju family. Saratobi Hiruzen replied, what do you suggest then? I cannot fight her, and I am not even confident in my ability to defeat her even without the Nine Tails. She could crush me in an instant if she were to use its power. And I implore you to cease your targeting of the Senju family from this moment forward, or else Mido-sama may take action that we will all come to regret," Hiruzen continued firmly, his voice carrying a note of warning. Kagasuchi darted through the terrain with remarkable speed, his feet barely touching the ground, as he relied on his mastery of Shunpo to propel himself forward. Despite the distance between him and his destination, the Uzumaki country, he managed to cover the vast expanse of land in a mere few hours, leaving a trail of wind in his wake. As he approached the gates of the village, he could feel the effects of Captain Yamamoto's template card wearing off. His progress had returned to its natural rate of 30.3%, and the one strong connection he had with his Anpikudo, Ryujin Jaka, was now severed. He shook his head as he realized that his powers were waning, and this feeling was definitely not pleasant. His arrival did not go unnoticed, as the guards stationed at the gate quickly took notice of the Kagetsuchi's presence. Without hesitation, they rushed towards him and greeted him with congratulations on his triumphant return. Kagetsuchi acknowledged the guards with a curt nod and uttered in a firm voice, kindly conveyed to Mitsuo that I wish not to be disturbed, until I have had the chance to settle in and meet with him at my own leisure. He knew all too well that Mitsuo would be eager to see him and discuss the details of his visit to Kanoha. However, Kagetsuchi was in no mood to entertain any visitors, not when he could sense the weakness in his powers. 
After delivering his message to the guards, Kagetsuchi swiftly made his way towards his residence, relying on his mastery of Shunpo to traverse the distance in a matter of seconds. As he entered his house, he made a beeline for the nearest chair and slumped into it, feeling the exhaustion from his journey weighing heavily on his body. Although the effects of Captain Yamamoto's template card had worn off, Kagetsuchi could still feel the lingering power of a 60% increase coursing through his body. He knew that if he could digest and internalize that power, it would propel his progress much further than his current rate of 30.3%. Thus, he delved deep into his meditation, focusing all his attention on the connection with Ryujin Jaka, and attempting to recapture the feeling of power he had experienced before. He allowed his mind to become fully immersed in the process, shutting out all external distractions, and devoting all his energies to the task at hand. As he continued to meditate, he could feel the Riyatsu within him pulsing and surging, gradually growing in intensity. He knew that this was a sign that his efforts were paying off, and that he was making progress towards regaining his strength. With renewed determination, he continued to meditate, his mind focused on nothing but the flow of his Riyatsu and the power of his Antakudo. News of Kagasuchi's return quickly spread throughout the Uzumaki clan, and it wasn't long before Uzumaki Mitsuo, the clan head, received word of his uncle's arrival. Mitsuo was pleased to hear of his uncle's success, but he couldn't shake off the sense of unease that had settled in the pit of his stomach. He knew all too well the dangers that lurked in the world of the ninja, and the fact that Kagetsuchi had just returned from the strongest village in the entire ninja world, made him anxious. When he heard that Kagetsuchi had instructed his guards not to disturb him, Mitsuo immediately became concerned. Is he alright? Is he injured in any way? He asked the guards. Despite his confidence in his uncle's strength, he couldn't help but worry about his safety. The guards assured him that Kagetsuchi was not injured, but had simply requested to be left alone. Mitsuo nodded in relief, but he knew that he couldn't take any chances. He immediately ordered the best ninja teams to be called in, instructing them to keep a close watch on his uncle's house, and to ensure that no one disturbed him, until he was ready to meet with them. As the guards hurried off to carry out Mitsuo's orders, he couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude towards his uncle. With that thought in mind, Mitsuo settled back into his work, confident that his uncle would emerge from his seclusion stronger than ever before. As the news of the destruction of Kanoha spread across the ninja world, it caused a stir among the other major villages, many were shocked by what had transpired in Kanoha. The Mizukage of the village hidden in the mist, immediately dispatched a team of skilled shinobi to gather information about the situation in Kanoha. The Kazukiage of the village hidden in the sand, sent a message of condolence to the Hokage, and pledged his support in any way possible. The Tsuchikage of the village hidden in the rock was also deeply troubled by the news, but he decided to take a more cautious approach. He ordered his ninjas to be on high alert, and to gather intelligence about the other villages, in case they were planning to take advantage of the situation in Kanoha. The third Reikage stood up with a gleam of excitement in his eyes and declared, with the sensory barrier of Kanoha broken and the village in ruins, now is the time for us to strike and seize the opportunity to attack. Mabuki let out a deep sigh as she observed the eagerness on the face of the third Reikage. She then spoke up, I understand your enthusiasm, but have you considered how formidable Mido truly is? It's not that she's weak, but Kagetsuchi is exceptionally powerful. Let me ask you this. Based on the power displayed by Mido, how confident are you in defeating her? Upon hearing Mabuki's words, the Reikage let out a sigh and slumped back into his chair, admitting, our chances of victory are less than 20%. Mabuki stated, the likelihood of you being killed before killing Mido is even higher, and even if you manage to defeat her, there's still Saratobi Hiruzen to consider. Thus, attacking Kanoha would be an act of foolishness. The Reikage's expression tightened with reluctance, as he knew he couldn't endanger his villagers in a pointless battle. Similar discussions were happening in the other villages as well. Although Kanoha's destruction had weakened its security, the other major villages knew that attacking Kanoha would be a costly mistake. The balance of power in the ninja world was delicate, and any major conflict could lead to catastrophic consequences. It has been exactly 48 hours since Kagetsuchi retreated into seclusion, and the news of his destructive rampage throughout Kanoha has quickly spread like wildfire among the ninja war participants. In light of the catastrophic event, members of the Uzumaki clan have reacted with a mix of emotions, ranging from outrage and horror to relief and celebration. Upon hearing the news, the majority of the Uzumaki clan were overjoyed and cheered, pleased with Kagetsuchi's decisive action in dealing with the traitorous Kanoha. 
However, one member of the clan, Mitsuo, couldn't help but feel a tinge of sadness upon learning that his elder sister Mido had been expelled from the Uzumaki clan. Despite his sadness, he understood that it was a necessary measure to quell any doubts or dissent among the members of the Uzumaki clan regarding Mido's betrayal. Kagasuchi's eyes fluttered open inside his residence at that moment. He spoke system show me my status bar. Ding. Generating panel name. Uzumaki Kagasuchi template. Yamamoto G-E-N-R-Y-U-S-A-I 38.4% Strength Cage level Invincible Props Ryujin Jaka ability Fire control upon witnessing the steady advancement of the Yamamoto Genusite template, Kagasuchi himself remained unsurprised, as he had anticipated its progression beforehand. Without delay, the first action he took after witnessing the template's progress was to indulge in a refreshing bath. Having laid waste to the Kanoha village, he had been deprived of the opportunity to luxuriate in a comfortable bath, thus making it an even more appealing prospect now. The diligent ninja who had been entrusted with the task of guarding the perimeter of Kagetsuchi's hideout, remained exceedingly vigilant, sparing no effort to ensure that nobody would disrupt Kagetsuchi's solitude. However, his concentration was suddenly interrupted by a voice that boomed from within the inner sanctum. Go and summon Mitsuo, I want to meet him. The guard was initially taken aback by the unexpected request, but his surprise soon gave way to delight when he realized that it was none other than Kagasuchi himself who had spoken to him. The guard wasted no time in assenting to the command, replying with great urgency, certainly, I shall inform the clan head of your request without delay. With that, he sprang into action, sprinting towards the imposing Yuzumaki cage building where the clan elders and the clan head were likely to be in attendance. Half an hour later, Mitsu arrived at Kagasuchi's house, but he wasn't alone Kashina followed him like a loyal companion. Kagasuchi had already taken a refreshing bath and was seated in his peaceful courtyard with his eyes closed. Uncle, I brought you some food. You must be hungry, said Mitsu, presenting the delicious meal he had brought. Kashina eagerly held up a small box and chimed in, Grandpa, I also brought you some food. Kagasuchi beamed at the sight of his grandchild and said, really? Then let me have what you brought first. Overjoyed, Kashina looked at Mitsu with a victorious expression, as if to say, See, Grandpa ate my food first. Witnessing Kashina's expression, Mitsuo and Kagetsuchi chuckled heartily. After the meal, the three of them sat down together, enjoying each other's company. It was at this point that Kashina spoke up, saying, Grandpa, I also want to become as powerful as you. Having heard of Kagetsuchi's legendary feats, Kashina too desired to attain such incredible power. Is that so? Well then, I will personally train you. But be warned, I am a very strict teacher. Can you handle my training? Kagetsuchi questioned her. Yes, Grandpa, I can definitely handle it, replied Yuzumaki Kashina with determination, her fists clenched in excitement. Mitsuo was shocked by this development. He had never imagined that Kagetsuchi would accept Kashina as his disciple. Nevertheless, he was thrilled that his beloved granddaughter would be trained by his uncle. He knew that if Kagetsuchi took her under his wing, she would undoubtedly become a formidable person in the future. Alright, now go get some rest. Your training will commence tomorrow. I have a few important matters to discuss with Mitsuo, said Kagetsuchi, dismissing Kashina for the night. After Kashina had left the house, Kagetsuchi turned to Mitsuo and asked, So, tell me, what is the current state of the ninja world? Mitsuo replied, after the destruction of Kanoha, various major villages sent ninja teams to confirm the news. However, none of them dared to attack Kanoha as they feared the strength of Mido. Hmm, that was to be expected, nodded Kagasuchi. From today onwards, start producing explosive tags in large quantities, and sell them to small villages, especially those with grand ambitions like a Megakur, Kagasuchi ordered. Mitsuo was taken aback by Kagasuchi's command. He knew that major villages controlled most of the resources, and if small ambitious villages like a Megakur had access to powerful weapons like explosive tags, the ninja world would immediately become more chaotic, especially in the fire country. As you wish, uncle. I will start working on this matter immediately, Mitsuo replied. Kagetsuchi then added, this is just to make the ninja world more chaotic. However, the main mission that I have for you and all the elders of the Uzumaki clan, is to create nine powerful sealing tools, capable of sealing the tailed beasts for an extended period of time. Mitsuo was shocked by this revelation. Uncle, are you planning to capture all the tailed beasts? He asked incredulously. 
Kagetsuchi replied with a determined expression, yes. After all, the Uzumaki clan's sealing techniques are the best. Therefore, it is only fitting that the tailed beasts should be sealed within members of the Uzumaki clan. It is also your task to select eight individuals who are capable of having a tailed beast sealed within them. But, uncle, if we were to capture all the tailed beasts, we would inevitably make enemies of the entire ninja world, Mitsuo said, his tone laced with concern and uncertainty. He knew that the tailed beasts were incredibly powerful and sought after by many, but the idea of capturing them all and incurring the wrath of so many others was daunting. In the face of strength, everything else becomes useless, Kagetsuchi mused, his voice heavy with contemplation. He turned his attention to Mitsuo and posed a question, Tell me, why is it that no one dared to challenge Hashirama or show any signs of aggression until he passed away? After a moment of contemplation, Mitsuo spoke up, his voice filled with admiration. It was truly awe-inspiring to witness Hashirama's incredible strength, and the way he effortlessly played with the tailed beasts, as if they were mere toys. It's no wonder that no one dared to make enemies with him, and that his mere presence was enough to deter any ninja village from attacking Kanoha, or even each other. The legendary prowess of Hashirama, coupled with his mastery over the powerful tailed beasts, made him a force to be reckoned with, and his reputation as the strongest shinobi of his time was well deserved. Correct. Exclaimed Kagasichi. Now, tell me, is it impossible for me to achieve it? No uncle. Absolutely not. I never doubted your strength, replied Mitsu. Kagetsuchi nodded, satisfied. As you know, we have a lot of work to do, he said. Firstly, we must select direct lineage members of the Yuzumaki family, and teach them the secret art that I gave you. This art is powerful and must be kept within the family. Secondly, we must create nine new sealing tools to capture all the tailed beasts, that will ensure the strength, safety and security of our clan. Mitsuo listened intently, knowing the importance of this task. And the time limit? He asked. Six years, replied Kagasuchi firmly. It may seem like a long time, but the success of our clan depends on it. Failure is not an option. I understand, uncle, said Mitsuo, determination in his voice. I will do everything in my power to meet these goals and exceed your expectations. You can count on me. Kagasuchi smiled, his faith in Mitsuo unwavering. I have no doubt that you will, Mitsuo, he said. Mitsuo bowed his head in acknowledgement of his uncle's praise. It is an honor to serve the Yuzumaki family, uncle, he said, his voice brimming with sincerity. Mitsuo departed from Kagetsuchi's residence, and Kagetsuchi himself remained still, deep in meditation on his Ryujin Jaka. Four hours later, he was alerted by a notification. Ding. Congratulations on increasing the template by 0.01% arching his eyebrows, Kagasuchi inquired of the system, wasn't my template supposed to increase by 0.1% every time I meditated? Ding. You had previously trained and lived for a hundred years, but after obtaining the template card and integrating the power of Yamamoto Genusai, it is no longer possible to increase your template at the same rate. Upon hearing the system's explanation, Kagatsuchi simply nodded. The following morning, Kashina appeared at the entrance of Kagatsuchi's humble abode, her steps resonating with determination as she made her way towards the training grounds. Standing before the wise old master, her voice echoed with a sense of purpose as she spoke, Grandpa, I have arrived, and I am fully prepared to begin my training under your tutelage. Draped in a classic Japanese training costume, the seriousness on her face added to her already adorable demeanor. Starting today, I will personally train you, declared Kagasuchi. But first, go and run 10 laps around my house. Kashina, being a sensible young girl, did not complain and began running dutifully as instructed. Upon completing the 10 laps, she stood before Kagetsuchi, panting heavily but determined to begin her training. Kagetsuchi then tossed a sword in front of her, and instructed her to perform the basic sword techniques he was about to demonstrate. With precise movements, Kagetsuchi demonstrated the proper form, which Kashina followed diligently. Whenever she made a mistake, Kagetsuchi would gently correct her and guide her towards the correct technique. As the hours ticked by, the sun gradually rose higher in the sky, and before long, it was noon. Kashina, drenched in sweat and slightly out of breath, stood before Kagetsuchi. Noticing her fatigue, Kagetsuchi spoke up. Go and refresh yourself, then we'll have lunch. It's already prepared. Kashina immediately made her way to the bath, and after half an hour, the two sat down for a meal. Following their lunch, Kagetsuchi instructed Kashina to rest, recognizing how hard she had worked. 
As a member of the Uzumaki clan, her body was capable of recovering quickly, and she slept soundly until evening. When she awoke, Kagetsuchi began teaching her Jujutsu, but this was no ordinary training. Utilizing chakra as a foundation, Kagetsuchi taught her the white heads technique, as it was impossible to learn the Riatsu method in the ninja world, as advised by the system. As night descended, Kagetsuchi instructed Kashina to refine her chakra before retiring for the evening. He then made his way to his own house, settling in to meditate on his Ryujin Jaka. Teaching Kashina during the day and meditating at night became a routine for Kagetsuchi. Four ninjas were swiftly jumping from tree to tree, traveling at a very fast speed towards the direction of the Yuzumaki country. Sakumo Senpai, do you think it would be a good idea for us to go to the Yuzumaki country? Asked Jiraiya. If the fire god decides to strike us down, the ninja world would lose a handsome and powerful toad immortal like myself. Jiraiya continued to strike some peculiar poses as he spoke. Orochimaru looked at Jiraiya as if he didn't know who he was, while Tsunade approached Jiraiya and punched him in the face, sending him flying and causing him to crash to the ground. All three of them continued moving without waiting for Jiraiya, but he soon caught up and joined them within a few minutes. Just as he was about to speak, Tsunade cut him off and said, Bastard, if you say something like that again, I'll send you to meet my grandfather. Jiraiya, with a look of fear on his face, stopped speaking, and the journey continued in silence. After some time, all four of them reached the vicinity of the Yuzumaki country, and eventually arrived at the gate. As soon as they arrived, they were surrounded by the ninja of the Yuzumaki country. The Yuzumaki country ninja asked in a cold tone, Ninja from the Kanoha village, what are you doing here? Upon seeing the cold attitude of the Yuzumaki country ninja, Jiraiya spoke up. It's already been six years since that incident happened. Even we in Kanoha suffered. Can't we forget our hatred? Stop talking nonsense and state your purpose, said the leader. Sakumo sighed after hearing the words of the Yuzumaki Jonin, but he stated his purpose of coming there and said, We came here to meet the Yuzumaki cage on behalf of the Kanoha village. Captain, we must not allow them to enter the Yuzumaki village, said one of the present ninja. No, we can't do this. Neither the fire country nor the Kanoha village have blocked people from the Yuzumaki village to do business in their territory or banned people from entering their territory. So, morally and politically, we can't stop them, said the leader. Then, the leader turned towards the envoy from Kanoha and said, We will inform the clan head of your rival. When he wants to meet you, you will be informed. Till then, you can stay in any hotel or inn. As Sakumo and the rest of the group nodded in agreement to the leader's words, they were granted permission to enter the Yuzumaki village. As they stepped into the village, they were met with a sight that amazed them the Yuzumaki village had grown even more prosperous than before, and some would argue that it was on par with, if not better than, Kanoha. It was no secret that the village had become the largest supplier of explosive tags, giving them the ability to control the price of these valuable commodities at their own discretion. The group couldn't help but marvel at the Yuzumaki village's growth and success. The leader of the ninja who had been at the gate of Yuzumaki village, knocked on the door to Yuzumaki Fusao's office. Fusao, who was the new cage and clan head of the Yuzumaki village and family, was sitting and working inside. Fusao looked at the leader and spoke Mitsuda what brings you here. Clan head, the envoys from Kanoha village have come to meet you. I have sent them to live in a hotel for now. replied Mitsuda. Okay, inform the elders about it, and also bring all of them to the meeting room. Additionally, please bring all the envoys from Kanoha village there, said Fuso. After one hour, everyone assembled in the meeting room of the Yuzumaki village. Fuso was sitting in the center, and the elders were sitting in a U-shape around Fuso. Sakumo, Arachimaru, Jiraiya, and Tsunade were sitting opposite Fuso. The elders were different from before, every elder was around 40 years old. After Mitsuo retired from the position of clan head and made his son Fuso the new clan head, the elders also retired, and new elders were appointed. So, what is your purpose for coming to the Yuzumaki village? Asked Fuso. We came here to formally invite the Yuzumaki village to participate in the Chunin exam held in Kanoha village, said Sakumo, while handing over the scroll to Fuso. This is an official letter from the Hokage-sama. Impossible. Do you think of us as fools? Why would we send our children to your village just to let them die? Said one of the elders. Clan head, I also disagree. We shouldn't trust Kanoha village, another elder voiced his dissatisfaction. We will answer you after discussing it thoroughly. You may rest in the hotel, said Fuso. No need, father. 
We will go to Kinoha. At this time a beautiful girl with red hair entered the meeting hall. She is none other than Kashina. Don't be impulsive, Kashina. After discussing, we will reach a decision. Going to Kanoha is not that safe, said Fuso in a soft tone to his daughter. I know what you are thinking, father, but this is what grandpa told me. He said if Kanoha really dared to do anything, then this time it will not be as simple as destroying the infrastructure of Kanoha, she said with momentum in her words. When everyone from Yuzumaki family heard Kashina speaking grandpa, they understood it was Kagasuchi. As Kashina only calls Kagasuchi grandpa, and she teases Mitsuo by calling him small grandpa. Fuso then looked towards Sakumo and the rest of the group, his gaze determined, and spoke with conviction, Okay, we shall indeed participate in the upcoming Chunin exam. However, before we proceed, we must finalize our selection of candidates. I kindly request all of you to be patient as we work towards this crucial decision. Sakumo, acknowledging the importance of the matter, responded, Yes, we understand the need to finalize the candidates promptly. I urge you to accomplish this task by tomorrow, as we are scheduled to depart for Kanoha. The Chunin exam is a mere four days away, leaving us no choice but to depart tomorrow. Assuring his team, Fuso stated confidently, do not worry. By tomorrow, we will diligently select all the candidates and be fully prepared to depart at a moment's notice. Fuso then shifted his focus towards Mitsuda and directed him, Mitsuda, I entrust you with the responsibility of showcasing the wonders of the Yuzumaki village to our esteemed guests. Mitsuda, assuming his role with enthusiasm, replied, yes, please follow me. Sakumo nodded in approval, acknowledging Mitsuda's offer, and added, please lead the way. With their objectives set, Sakumo, accompanied by Jiraiya, Arachimaru, and Tsunade, gracefully exited the meeting room, their minds filled with anticipation and determination. Shortly after their departure, Mitsuda redirected his attention towards Sakumo and the others, his voice firm yet respectful, as he made his request, I kindly request that you remove the ninja forehead protectors, my honored guests. Jiraiya, perplexed by the request, interjected, but why? The forehead protectors proudly symbolize our identity as esteemed members of the prestigious Kanoha village. We wear them with pride and honor. Mitsuda, his gaze unwavering, explained his reasoning, I understand the significance your village places on the forehead protectors. However, the very reason I request their removal is because they identify you as members of the Kanoha village. I must be honest with you, the people of the Yuzumaki village hold no respect for your village. Instead, they feel a sense of disgust. If you wish to freely explore the Yuzumaki village without encountering disdain on the faces of its inhabitants, I advise you to remove your forehead protectors. They still hate us this much," said Jiraiya. Misuda spoke up, his voice tinged with bitterness. The attacks from other major villages were not a surprise to us. We knew that they feared our sealing ability and our enemies, especially because we are allies with Kanoha village. If we had chosen to sell the sealing techniques and send ninja to their village to become Jinchuriki, they wouldn't view us as enemies. But the cruel irony is that Kanoha village, whom we believe to be our ally, betrayed us. It hurt the most. What do you think? We could have achieved this level of prosperity before, it's not that we couldn't have. However, because we treated Kanoha as our ally, we refrained from selling many explosive tags to other villages, and fulfilled our obligations as allies. Yet, Kanoha abandoned us without a second thought. If it hadn't been for Elder Kagetsuchi, we would have perished. So, this deep-rooted hatred cannot be resolved so easily, he explained, his voice filled with a mix of frustration and sorrow. After Mitsuda's passionate words, a heavy silence fell over the group. Sakumo spoke up, his voice filled with understanding. We comprehend your point, and I must admit that I cannot change the past. However, we are sorry, we cannot remove our ninja forehead protectors. They are an integral part of our identity. Instead of evading the hate, it's better for us to confront it, he stated, offering a sincere smile. As you wish, Mitsuda replied. With that, he took them all on a tour of the village, showing them its various aspects. As Mitsuda had predicted, upon seeing the Kanoha forehead protectors worn by their visitors, the locals couldn't hide their disdain. Nevertheless, they maintained a basic level of decorum. At that moment, Mitsuo found himself engrossed in fishing by the peaceful seashore. Suddenly, his tranquil state was interrupted by a familiar voice calling out, Small Grandpa, there you are. I've been searching for you everywhere. Mitsuo's face twitched, a mixture of annoyance and affection. He couldn't help but respond, Kashina, my dear, how many times must I kindly ask you not to refer to me as Small Grandpa? 
Alas, my words seem to fall on deaf ears. And I've told you many times that since you're weaker than grandpa, you're small grandpa, retorted Kashina, hanging around Mitsuo's neck with a playful smile. So, what is it that brings you here, my dear small granddaughter? Mitsuo asked warmly, a smile gracing his face. Kashina responded with excitement, oh, you won't believe it. The ninja team from Konoha arrived today, extending an invitation to our Yuzumaki village to participate in the Chunin exam. And guess what? Grandpa has graciously agreed to let the younger generation take part in it. He specifically asked me to deliver the news that you will be the leading representative from our Yuzumaki village. Mitsuo's smile widened as he replied, Well, if uncle has given his approval, then there's no problem at all. In fact, he even granted me permission to meet my elder sister by sending me to Kanoha. I couldn't be happier. Okay, let's go and meet uncle, said Mitsuo. Do you want to come with me to meet your beloved grandpa? Asked Mitsuo, extending an invitation to Kashina. Her face brightened up as she replied, Yes, I am also excited to see grandpa. He called me earlier. With enthusiasm, Mitsuo and Kashina set off towards Kagatsuchi's house. Meanwhile, Kagatsuchi remained seated on a chair, deep in meditation, focusing his thoughts on Ryujin Jaka. Ding. Congratulations on increasing the template by 0.01%. Gradually, Kagatsuchi opened his eyes and addressed the system with a calm tone, System, show me my character panel. Ding. Generating panel name. Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi template. Yamamoto Genryusai. 60.3% Strength Super Cage Level Invincible Props Ryujin Jaka Ability Fire Control Kagatsuchi nodded in satisfaction, pleased with his current progress. Suddenly, a voice resonated from outside, announcing the arrival of a familiar person. Grandpa, I have arrived. It was Kashina, who couldn't contain her excitement and proclaimed her presence even before stepping foot inside Kagatsuchi's residence. Kagasuchi's face lit up with joy upon seeing Kashina enter his house. Playfully, he flicked her forehead and spoke affectionately, You are not a child anymore, but you still behave like one. Pouting, Kashina responded, That's only when I'm around you, and I will forever be your little child, won't I? Yes, you will always be a child to me, Kagasuchi affirmed, a warm smile adorning his face as he gently patted Kashina's head. At that moment, Mitsu arrived, joining the gathering. With a touch of concern, he addressed Kagatsuchi, Uncle, you have spoiled her too much. She doesn't even listen to anyone except you. I don't know what will happen in the future and who will marry her, such a girl with a fiery temper. At that precise moment, Fuzo gracefully stepped into Kagatsuchi's house and respectfully bowed towards him, addressing him as great uncle. Kagatsuchi acknowledged Fuzo's gesture with a nod and inquired, Have you allowed them to explore the vast Yuzumaki village? Fuso replied affirmatively, saying, yes, despite enduring a fair amount of disdain, they persisted and ventured throughout every corner of the Yuzumaki village. It's understandable, as they must have been assigned a mission to monitor all the developments in the Yuzumaki village. For a ninja, their mission takes precedence, even if they have to endure abuse along the way, said Kagasuchi. He continued, what about the other candidates who are accompanying Kashina to Konoha village? There are two individuals, a boy named Yuzumaki Hiroshi and a girl named Yuzumaki Sakura. Both of them have also been trained as future Jinchuriki. They excel in sealing techniques and fire-based secret techniques, replied Fuso. Kagatsuchi, after a contemplative pause, nodded approvingly and further inquired about their prowess. Tell me, Fuso, how do they fare in terms of strength? With undeniable prowess, they each emerged victorious in one-on-one -on -one combat against an elite Chunin merely two months ago. Moreover, if they were to unite their formidable abilities, they possess the capability to vanquish Shivan a highly skilled special Jonin, Fuso confidently replied. Excellent Kagatsuchi expressed, a glint of pride evident in his eyes. His words resonated with optimism, it appears that the upcoming generation shows tremendous promise. Mitsuo and Fuso smiled upon hearing Kagatsuchi's words. Kagatsuchi then turned his gaze towards Kashina and spoke, now, I give you a crucial task. Conquer both Hiroshi and Sakura individually in intense one-on-one -on -one battles, and subsequently, challenge and triumph over them when they combine their forces. Given your formidable Jonin level prowess, this endeavor should present no challenge for you. I will definitely complete this task, Kashina replied firmly. Mitsuo and Fuso, recognizing the strategic intent behind Kagatsuchi's directive, nodded in unison. 
They comprehended that Kagetsuchi aimed to amplify Kashina's reputation, ensuring her indisputable position as the future clan head, while simultaneously cultivating unwavering loyalty among their ranks. Then, Kagetsuchi called for Kashina and gently placed his hand on her forehead. As soon as his hand made contact with Kashina's forehead, an immense surge of fiery Ryutsu emanated from him, causing almost everyone in the Uzumaki village to sense it. Even Sakumo and his team, who were currently gathered in a room conversing, could feel the overwhelming spiritual pressure. Arachimaru remarked, there's no need to confirm if that old monster is still alive. This level of pressure can only come from him. All the individuals in the room nodded sullenly, their eyes filled with a mixture of awe and apprehension. When they were dispatched to the Yuzumaki country, they were given three primary missions. The first was to extend invitations to the people of Yuzumaki country for the upcoming Chunin exams. The second objective was to meticulously document the progress and advancements in the Yuzumaki country. Lastly, and most importantly, they were tasked with verifying whether Kagetsuchi was still alive. Within Kagetsuchi's house, he withdrew his hand from Kushina's forehead and spoke, I have imbued my power within you. Whenever you face danger, this mark will automatically activate to protect you. In that moment, a small crimson vortex materialized on Kushina's forehead, serving as a visible symbol of the seal. After talking for a few more minutes Kashina left Kagetsuchi's house, and went to complete the task given by Kagetsuchi to defeat Yuzumaki Harashi and Yuzumaki Sakura. After Kashina left Mitsuo and Fuzo stayed to talk about future of Yuzumaki village. So, what is the current situation of Ninja World? Asked Kagetsuchi. After we started selling explosive tags the number of wars between small countries have increased some even perished in those war, and now it seems the rain village have accumulated enough power, as they are constantly conflicting with Kanoha, as if deliberately trying to find fault and start a war. Said Fuso. And I believe that the main reason why Kanoha is conducting exam is to show their formidable power to the whole ninja world. Added Mitsuo. Kagetsuchi nodded after hearing the words of Mitsuo and Fuso, you are right about this, and I believe that after the Chunin exam, it is more likely that second ninja world war will officially begin. Then Kagetsuchi continued, so start preparing from now although I will make move to capture all the tiled beasts, but you have to show me the power accumulated by the Yuzumaki village. I don't want to see such a scene again where the whole Yuzumaki family is supported by only one person. Yes uncle we will not disappoint you, we will show the results of our cultivation and accumulation of the resources. You just have to order and we are willing fight wherever you point us. Said Yuzumaki Mitsuo. Yes grand uncle we will prove to you that even without your help at least we can make any major village suffer heavy losses. Said Fuso. Come I like both of yours enthusiasm and confidence. Okay you may leave now as you have to prepare for tomorrow, as tomorrow Kashina with the Mitsuo will be departing for Konoha. Said Kagetsuchi. Both Mitsuo and Fuzo nodded and left house. On the same day in the evening the news of Kashina defeating two rising genius of Yuzumaki family, spread like a wildfire in this battle however Kashina never used the secret technique of fire, she simply defeated both Hiroshi and Sakura, and Kashina won just by using her proficiency in white hits. Paddock Sakumo and his team also learn of feat when they heard that defeated Teninja who at the very least have a strength of elite Chunin, and they are sure that Kashina is definitely have strength of elite Jonin. Next morning, Sakumo and his team assembled at the gate of the Yuzumaki village, waiting for the Yuzumaki village team to arrive. Finally, after a half hour wait, the team from the Yuzumaki village arrived, led by Mitsuo. Following them were participating ninjas Kashina, Sakura, Hiroshi, and the elders of the Yuzumaki village. Sakumo asked, shall we begin our journey? Wait a minute, my father is coming with my grandfather, said Kashina. Sakumo simply nodded, and at that moment, Kagetsuchi arrived with Fuso. Kagetsuchi stood there quietly, not releasing his Riatsu, yet everyone could feel the pressure in his presence. He stepped forward and handed a sword to Kashina, saying, this sword was my companion for a long time during my youth. Today, I am giving it to you. I hope you will cherish it properly. Kashina accepted the sword from Kagetsuchi and replied, Don't worry, Grandpa. I will honor this sword, and with me, it will become famous. I promise you that. Kagetsuchi nodded and then looked at Sakura and Hiroshi. Now go and let the whole ninja world know how powerful the younger generation of the Yuzumaki village is, he said. And you don't have to fear anything. Do what you want. As long as you don't cross the line, I will be your biggest supporter. No one in the entire ninja world would dare to touch you.
If they do, there will be only one outcome, and that is death, Kagetsuchi said in a commanding tone. Hearing Kagetsuchi's words, Sakura and Hiroshi were filled with enthusiasm. After this, Mitsuo led the participants, along with Sakumo and his team, and they set off for Konoha. They encountered no problems on the way and moved without any hindrance. The main reason for their smooth journey was Arachimaru, who always took the lead and swiftly dealt with any fools who tried to hinder their path, such as bandits. Finally, after traveling for a day, they arrived at Kanoha village. Sakumo said, follow me. I will take you to meet the Hokage. Mitsuo nodded and followed Sakumo to the Hokage building, and then to the Hokage's office. Sakumo knocked on the door, and a mature voice from inside said, come in. Sakumo entered with everyone, and inside the Hokage's office, Hiruzen sat in the middle, surrounded by key figures of Kanoha. Hiruzen looked at the people from the Uzumaki village and smiled, saying, I am very grateful that you accepted our invitation and came to participate in the Chunin exams. In the corner, Danzo huffed. It seems you have a problem with our arrival, Mitsuo said, releasing his cage level chakra. As in Uzumaki, his chakra was even more potent, causing cracks in the furniture present in the Hokage's office. Danzo was the individual who felt the most intense pressure from Mitsuo. I deeply apologize for the rude behavior displayed by our side. Rest assured, such misconduct will not occur again, here is an expressed, attempting to appease Mitsuo. Mitsuo eased the pressure and nodded in Hiruzen's direction before stating, It is imperative that you maintain strict control over your subordinates, or else I wouldn't mind taking further action, such as removing his other hand, which my uncle left behind. Upon hearing Mitsuo's words, Danzo's face contorted in anger as he clenched his fist tightly. Unfazed by Danzo's enraged expression, Mitsuo continued, Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Yuzumaki Mitsuo, the former clan head of the Yuzumaki clan. I have arrived as the Jonin leader from the Yuzumaki village. The words of Mitsuo left everyone present in the Hokage office astounded. They had not anticipated that the former clan head of the Yuzumaki clan would personally visit Kanoha. Mitsuo then directed his attention towards Kashina and stated, She is Yuzumaki Kashina my beloved granddaughter, and also the apprentice of the fire god. And these two Sakura and Hiroshi will be participating in the Chunin exam. The people in the Hokage office hadn't even recovered from the news that the former clan head of the Yuzumaki clan had arrived personally. Mitsuo dropped another bombshell by revealing that Kashina was the apprentice of the fire god. They remembered the magnitude of destruction caused by Kagetsuchi, and they made the decision to announce to their respective clans to avoid any conflicts with this girl. Hiruzen also intended to make the ninja community aware, and cautioned them not to offend Kashina. Kashina, Sakura, and Hiroshi respectfully greeted the others present in the office. Please proceed to the Senju clan as Mido-sama is waiting for your arrival, said Hiruzen. Upon hearing these words, Mitsuo also grew eager to reunite with his elder sister, whom he hadn't seen in a long time. At that moment, a ninja from the Senju clan stepped forward and said, Please come with me. I will guide you to the Senju family compound where Mido-sama is eagerly awaiting your arrival. After nodding in acknowledgement to the Senju ninja, Mitsuo and his team from the Yuzumaki family followed the ninja and left the Hokage's office. After Mitsuo departed, Sakumo reported on what he had witnessed in the Yuzumaki village. He confirmed that Kagetsuchi was still alive, and by observing him, it could be concluded that his strength had not diminished at all. On the contrary, it seemed to have further increased. The person most filled with regret was Danzo. He had hoped that Kagetsuchi might have passed away from old age, allowing him to seek revenge on the Yuzumaki village. Mido sat quietly on the tatami seat, awaiting the arrival of the team from the Yuzumaki village. As soon as the team entered the Senju clan compound, she was able to sense the familiar chakra of her brother among them, and a smile appeared on her face. Finally, Mitsuo and the others arrived inside the room where Mido was waiting. Mido waved her hand, and the ninja from Senju clan left the room. With an emotional voice, Mitsuo said, It has been a long time, sister. After a few minutes of silence, Mido finally broke the silence and asked, How is uncle doing right now? Mitsuo replied, He is doing fine. Then he pointed towards Kashina and said, Do you remember her? Mido pondered for a moment and then said, Is she Kashina? She has really grown up. The last time I saw her, she was just two years old. Come, give me a hug. Mido embraced Kashina. At that moment, Tsunade also arrived and witnessed Mido hugging Kashina. Seeing Tsunade, Mido released Kashina and asked everyone to take a seat. 
Then she turned towards Tsunade and inquired, What did Monkey ask of all of you? Tsunade replied, He simply inquired about the situation in the Yuzumaki village, and whether Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi is still alive. He also asked about the strength of the participants in this Shunin exam. Mido nodded after listening to Tsunade's words. Then she turned towards Sakura and Hiroshi and remarked, Both of them seem promising. At the very least, they have the potential to become elite Jonin. They all began to converse casually, and after a few minutes, noticing that Kashina was becoming bored, Mido asked Tsunade to take her on a tour of the village, accompanied by Hiroshi and Sakura. However, Hiroshi didn't want to feel out of place in a group of girls, so he decided to explore the village on his own. Nodding in agreement, Tsunade took Kashina, along with Sakura, around the village. They strolled leisurely, enjoying the sights, engaging in shopping, and treating themselves to various delectable delicacies. Eventually, as they continued their exploration, Tsunade's eyes caught sight of a casino. Excitedly, she halted and exclaimed, Come with me. I'll show you my gambling skills as the granddaughter of the gambling god. Wearing a self-assured smile, she firmly grasped Kashina's and Sakura's hand, and guided both of them inside the casino. But sister Tsunade, isn't gambling considered inappropriate for a ninja? Asked Kashina. Tsunade simply scoffed at this and replied, These rules were established by some old-fashioned ninjas. We are young and should be bold enough. Come, I'll show you my gambling skills. With that, Tsunade initiated the gambling session, involving Kashina and Sakura. An hour later, outside the casino, Tsunade was shouting, You're all cheaters. You're playing unfairly. Observing this, Kashina's face twitched as she tried to calm Tsunade down. After soothing Tsunade, she sat there with a saddened expression. At that moment, Kashina playfully remarked, You truly are the granddaughter of the gambling god. You showcased your skills without even winning a single bet. Even an amateur like me won three times. Kashina covered her mouth with her hands to suppress her laughter, while Sakura also stifled her amusement. Hearing Kashina's words, Tsunade became even more despondent. At that moment, a voice emerged from behind them, asking, What are you both doing here? It was none other than Jiraiya. Kashina responded, We came here with sister Tsunade. She lost all her bets and became sad. It's normal. Everyone in the fire country knows that Tsunade always loses her bets. That's why people have given her the nickname Fat Sheep remarked Jiraiya. Kashina wanted to inform him that Tsunade was right behind her, but before she could speak, Jiraiya continued, She's just a woman with big breasts and no brains. That's why she doesn't win. If it were me, I would have become a gambling god by now. But I'm not interested in all this. I'm only interested in gathering materials for my work. Jiraiya kept talking, unaware that Tsunade was sitting right there, with Kashina and Sakura in front of her, shielding her from his view. In that moment, both Kashina and Sakura felt a surge of murderous intent emanating from behind them. They quickly moved away. As soon as they did, Jiraiya saw Tsunade clenching her fist, her anger evident on her face. The words died in Jiraiya's mouth as he started sweating profusely. He stammered, Ah, Tsunade, you're here. What I just said was just a joke. Don't take it seriously. He began to back away from his original position. Tsunade stood up and with a thunderous shout that echoed throughout Kanoha, she exclaimed, You bastard. She threw a powerful punch at Jiraiya, sending him flying three houses away. Both Kashina and Sakura briefly mourned for Jiraiya's fate. After that incident, Tsunade, Kashina, and Sakura returned to the Senju compound. At the gate of the Senju clan, Hiroshi was standing, engaged in a conversation with Senju Nawaki. They had coincidentally met when Hiroshi was wandering around the village. Curiously, they followed Tsunade and the others on their way back to Mido's room. Finally reaching the room, Mido and Mitsuo were engrossed in their discussion. As everyone returned, Mido and Mitsuo nodded in acknowledgement. However, when they caught a whiff of alcohol emanating from Tsunade, Kashina, and Sakura, they frowned. Mido asked, what were you all doing, and where were you three? Upon hearing Mido's question, Tsunade, Kashina, and Sakura lowered their heads. At that moment, Kashina shifted the blame onto Tsunade and said, It was Sister Tsunade who dragged us to the casino against our will. We never wanted to go. Mido gazed at Tsunade with a sense of helplessness and slight exasperation. When will you ever quit your incessant gambling habit? It seems you haven't even once entertained the thought of giving it up. And yet, you persist in clinging to it, she remarked, her tone tinged with a mixture of concern and frustration. In response, Tsunade playfully stuck out her tongue, a mischievous twinkle in her eyes. 
Observing Tsunade's carefree antics, Mido sighed softly and shook her head in a gesture of mild resignation. You all must be tired go and have rest. She suggested, her voice carrying a touch of motherly concern. Okay, dear Grandma Mido and small Grandpa Kashina chimed in, her voice filled with a mix of affection and playful teasing, as she swiftly darted away, her footsteps echoing through the corridors. You. Wait. You promised you wouldn't call me that. Mitsuo called out, his gaze fixed on the receding figure of Kashina. Kashina swiftly pivoted on her heels, shooting a mischievous glance at Mitsuo, before playfully sticking out her tongue in his direction. With an impish grin adorning her face, she sprinted away with increased speed, her laughter trailing behind her. Mido burst into laughter, her amusement resonating through the room. Ha ha ha, small grandpa. She exclaimed, unable to contain her mirth. Mitsuo, wearing a warm smile, gently shook his head in response. Why does she call you small grandpa? Mido inquired curiously. Mitsuo's smile widened, and he replied with a hint of fondness in his voice. Well, you see, she calls our uncle grandpa, and since I'm younger and physically less imposing than him, she affectionately bestowed upon me the nickname of small grandpa. His words were accompanied by a helpless smile, reflecting the playful dynamics of their familial bond. The days passed like this, and finally, the day of the Chunin exam arrived. Today, with the opening speech of the Hokage, the first round of the Chunin exam will be held. Kashina, along with others, reached the Chunin exam venue where the Hokage was going to give his speech. There were quite a lot of people, mostly students from the Ninja Academy, as well as participants from other villages, who were going to take part in the Chunin exam. After half an hour, the Hokage, along with advisors and other clan heads, arrived at the venue. Once the Hokage and others settled in their seats, a Jonin went to the podium and started speaking, Good morning, everyone. I thank you all for joining us in this Shunin exam event, and a special thanks to all the ninjas from other villages for attending this event. As we all know, there are many who have participated in this Shunin exam, and to announce the rules of this exam, I would like to invite our beloved Hokage-sama, who is also the strongest Hokage present to date, and has mastered all five chakra nature ninjutsu. He is known by the world as the professor. The students of the ninja academy had looks of respect and reverence on their faces. Hiruzen also smiled after hearing the words of the jonin, and just as he was about to stand up, he suddenly heard something. Kashina tried to stifle her laughter, but it escaped in muffled bursts that caught the attention of those around her. When Kashina saw others looking at her, she stopped suppressing her laughter and burst out laughing, saying, Hahaha. Ha. At that moment, a young boy with yellow hair who was standing beside Jureya, and also had a smile and look of respect towards the Hokage after listening to the words of the jonin, frowned and asked, Miss, I don't think there was anything funny. If you are laughing at a joke, then please share it with all of us, so that we can laugh too. Laughing at a time like this is disrespectful and hurts the sentiments of others. Isn't this funny? He is being crowned as the strongest Hokage just because he has mastered all five chakra natures. But this was also accomplished by both the first Hokage and the second Hokage. They even mastered unique ninjutsu of their own. The first Hokage had the wood release, and the second Hokage had the flying thunder god technique. Additionally, almost more than half of the ninjutsu in the seal book of Kanoha was created by the second and first Hokage, said Kashina. Although this statement was made by Kashina, it was a sentiment shared by everyone present who had experienced the year of Hashirama and Taburama, especially the elders and clan heads of the large clans. Hearing Kashina's words, Minato also became speechless. He didn't know how to counter her remarks. At that moment, Jureyu patted his shoulder, calming him down. Hiruzen then approached the podium and spoke, what Kashina said is absolutely true. As the student of the second Hokage, Taburama, and having been taught by the first Hokage, Hashirama, I am well aware of their strength. There is no doubt that they are more powerful than me, my mentor teachers, are much more powerful than I am. Although it seemed as if Hiruzen felt nothing, deep inside his heart, he had already cursed Kashina numerous times. His plan was simple. By presenting himself as the strongest Hokage and gradually overshadowing the reputation of the previous Hokage, he could establish himself as the most powerful Hokage in the eyes of the current generation. Even though the older generation knew the truth, they would not openly oppose him as the Hokage. With the approaching war, it was evident that the older generation would inevitably participate, and somehow, he would ensure their disappearance, securing his position as the strongest Hokage. However, due to Kashina's intervention, he was forced to publicly admit that he was weaker than the first Hokage, thereby ruining his plan. 
Now, let's discuss the rules of the Chunin exam. The first round will be a written exam, which you have already completed. The rules for the second round will be announced, said the hookage with a smile. Finally after talking about the will of fire Hirazin also left the podium, and after that the Jonin ninja, announced the end of today's opening ceremony, and told them that the first round will be held in the afternoon, and left in the direction where Hirazin and others left. At this time there were only Jenins left who came to participate in this Shunin exam. One of girl came near Kashina and spoke, you really are brave and don't fear speaking against Hokage standing in Kanoha. After hearing the words of the girl everyone perked their ears and listened even Minato was listening to it. Why should I fear him? Rather he would always protect me because if something happened to me then he knows that my grandpa will bury the whole Kanoha. Said Kashina in a disdainful tone. The girl covered her mouth suppressing her smile and said with a smile, who is your grandpa? His name is Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi also known by the world as Fire God, and in Yukonoha, he is known as the Hell Demon. Said Kashina with pride. After hearing Kashina's words, everyone present was horrified, as they knew very well how powerful that guy really was. Subconsciously, they moved away from Kashina, not wanting to interact or offend her in any way. Upon witnessing the behavior of everyone present, Kashina was in surprise. Almost everyone outside the Yuzumaki country fears her grandpa, and according to her, this clearly shows how powerful he really is, as people only fear the strong. Kashina didn't bother with anyone and turned around, leaving the venue. She headed towards the location where the first round of the Chunin exam is scheduled to be held. Sakura and Hiroshi followed behind her. The students began to gather at the exam venue for the first round of the Chunin exam, and Kashina was among them. At that moment, Jiraiya, who was in charge of the first round of the Chunin examination, arrived. The first round was a written exam, and the questions were easy for Kashina, Sakura, and Hiroshi. They completed the exam within 20 minutes, despite having an hour to finish, and left after submitting their papers. Finally, the results of the first round were announced and posted on the walls. Namika's Minato ranked first, while Yuzumaki Kashina came in second, Sakura and Hiroshi third and fourth respectively. Kashina glanced at Minato with appreciation, although she didn't expect anyone to rank above her. However, it wasn't too surprising, and she became slightly frustrated. Just then, she heard the sound of quarreling and turned around to see a group of people who were dissatisfied with the rule, that if anyone from their team failed, the entire team would be disqualified. The dissatisfaction escalated into a quarrel. As the argument unfolded, a potent and intimidating murderous aura locked onto everyone present. Those who had been quarreling suddenly found themselves drenched in cold sweat, overcome by fear. Anyone who has been deemed disqualified should leave the venue immediately, or else I won't hesitate to eliminate you all, and rid the world of trash, Rachimaru declared, his murderous aura still palpable and affecting everyone present. Upon hearing Rachimaru's words, those who had been disqualified hastily left the exam venue, as if a venomous snake was chasing them, ready to devour them whole. As everyone departed, Arachimaru scanned the remaining audience and noticed Minato, who had been affected by his murderous aura, but still retained the ability to move. Continuing his gaze, he then saw Kashina, who appeared entirely unfazed, standing with ease. It dawned on him that she was a disciple of Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, and even he himself felt pressure in the presence of that man. For Kashina, who had trained under Kagetsuchi, Arachimaru's murderous aura would be like a gentle breeze. After the disqualified ninjas had left the venue, Arachimaru dissipated his murderous aura and announced, the second round of the Chunin exam will take place in the death forest. Follow me. With those words, Arachimaru swiftly departed at high speed, and the genin participants followed in his direction. Arachimaru's pace was so rapid that they struggled to keep up with him. However, Kashina remained close behind Arachimaru, maintaining a tight pursuit. Just a few meters behind her was Minato, and beside him were Sakura and Hiroshi, trying their best to keep up. Finally, they arrived at the Forest of Death, but upon reaching their destination, they noticed a group of Chunin ninjas from Kanoha already waiting there. As all the contestants gathered, the Chunin ninjas began distributing scrolls to each participant. Some scrolls had heaven written on them, while others had earth written on them. Confusion filled the air, prompting Arachimaru to address the perplexed contestants, and explain the rules of the exam. To pass the second round, Arachimaru declared, you must possess both an earth and a heaven scroll. Within the next two days, make your way to the central building within the death forest, while holding both scrolls. Those who accomplish this will qualify, while the others will be disqualified. 
Upon hearing Orochimaru's words, an uproar ensued among the contestants. Only 20 teams had qualified for the second round, and with the conclusion of this stage, only 10 teams would remain in the competition. As Orochimaru announced the rules, a Chunin ninja stepped forward and handed Kashina a scroll with heaven written on it. While giving her the scroll, the Chunin ninja smiled and asked, Are you truly the granddaughter and disciple of the fire god? Kashina and her team members frowned upon hearing the question. Kashina sensed the hostility lurking behind the smile, but she decided to play along and responded, Yes, I am. Upon hearing Kashina's affirmation, the Chunin ninja's face twisted into a ferocious expression. In a sudden burst of aggression, he drew out his kunai and launched an attack. However, due to his nervousness, he only managed to sever Kashina's arm, without inflicting a fatal injury. With a thud, Kashina's left hand fell to the ground. First of all, no one expected that anyone would dare to attack Kashina, as they had received orders from the Hokage not to offend anyone from the Uzumaki clan because they couldn't afford it. When they saw someone attacking Kashina, their minds went blank, and they were left speechless. A look of fear started appearing on everyone's faces from Konoha. One of the Chunin ninja spoke, Have you gone mad? Do you not know her identity? Another Chunin said, Are you trying to kill us all? Do you not know the consequences of your actions? Orochimaru also lost his calm, his hands were shaking. Six years ago, he had witnessed the amount of destruction caused by Kagetsuchi, and at that time, he showed mercy and spared everyone. But this time, consumed by rage, he couldn't help but shiver at the thought of what might happen. Finally, the Chunin in question spoke, I don't care. Whatever you say, I don't care. I only know that my elder brother and father died at the hands of that bastard hell demon. For him, it was just a wave of his hand, but for me, I lost everything in that wave of his hand. My father and my elder brother died in the fire that he casually generated. I know that I can't take revenge on him, but at least by killing his granddaughter, I can inflict the same pain that I felt after losing my father and brother. Saying this, the Chunin wanted to attack Kashina again in an attempt to kill her completely. But before he could attack, Kashina appeared in front of him and grabbed him with her right hand. Her left hand, which had fallen to the ground, burst into flames and regenerated on her left arm, good as new. Witnessing this, the Chunin's face filled with horror and despair, as even his previous attack proved ineffective against Kashina. I sympathize with what happened to your father and brother, but if you try to kill me, thinking I am weak and with the motive of causing pain to my grandfather, you are mistaken, Kashina said. As she finished speaking, her left hand transformed into fire and engulfed the Chunin ninja entirely, burning him to a charred state. His lifeless body fell to the ground. Everyone present was shocked after witnessing how Kashina's left arm regenerated unharmed. The participants of the exam were surprised by how effortlessly Kashina had killed the Chunin ninja, giving him no chance to resist. She defeated him as easily as a Jonin would kill a Jenin. Kashina picked up the Heaven Scroll and returned to her place, standing with her team. Observing all of this, Orochimaru breathed a sigh of relief. He also began to understand why the other teammates from the Yuzumaki village remained unfazed and wore calm expressions. Similar to the hydration technique of the Hazuki clan, Orochimaru muttered to himself, making the connection. After the brief incident concluded, the Chunin distributed all the scrolls to the respective teams. Once every team received their scrolls, Orochimaru announced the start of the competition. As soon as Orochimaru's words fell, each team began to move into the forest of death, prepared to fight for the scrolls and qualify for the second round. Meanwhile, inside the Hokage's office, Saratobi hears and received information about the events that took place in the Forest of Death. Nervously, he crushed the pipe he was smoking in his hand. However, upon learning that Kashina was unharmed, he finally felt relieved. Harrison glanced at the kneeling Anbu ninja and said, Bring me the details of that ninja immediately. Receiving the Hokage's orders, the Anbu ninja swiftly left and returned within a minute, providing the details of the mentioned ninja. As Harrison read the information, his anger instantly flared up, causing a surge of powerful chakra. He was so furious that he crushed the table in front of him, along with the paper containing the ninja's details. Danzo, you bastard. What the hell are you trying to do? He exclaimed in rage. Witnessing Harrison's intense anger and feeling the overwhelming pressure emanating from him, the kneeling Anbu ninja began sweating profusely and almost lost their balance, nearly falling to the ground. Hiruzen glanced at the trembling Anbu ninja, easing off his pressure, and then apologized for his sudden outburst. He compassed himself and said, Go and bring Danzo to me immediately. 
Pearson's anger stemmed from the information that the ninja in question had been brought to Konoha as an orphan 10 years ago, and subsequently taken in by Danzo's organization, The Roots. It was clear that Danzo was involved in this, as the ninja couldn't have lost his father and brothers claimed. Finally, Danzo entered the Hokage's office and noticed the state of the room. His eyes narrowed as he asked, Why did you call me, Hirazan? Is there something you need from me? Hirazan remained silent and simply threw the information about the ninja in Danzo's direction. He spoke sternly, You know very well why I called you, and I won't waste my words explaining it to you. I will tell you one thing, Hirazan continued in a cold tone, his aura pressing heavily towards Danzo. If anything were to happen to Kashina in any way, I will kill you first. And if, by any chance, Mido-sama becomes aware of today's incident, I will not defend you in any way. After hearing Hirazan's words and feeling the killing intent emanating towards him, Danzo knew that Hirazan was serious, and would definitely kill him if necessary. In front of Hirazan, Danzo could only submit. And from today onwards, no ninja from Root will leave the Root base. If I find anyone leaving, I won't hesitate to disband Root. Remember, I am not arresting your Root members just because I don't want Mido-sama to become suspicious of your involvement, said Hirazan. But, Hirazan, if my Root ninjas don't leave, many tasks will be halted, said Danzo, attempting to reason with Hirazan. Shut up. Don't forget, I am the Hokage, shouted Hirazan. Upon hearing Hirazan's words, Danzo clenched his fist in anger. However, he knew he couldn't do anything. He turned around and said, You will regret it, Hirazan, then slammed the door of the Hokage's office and left. At the same time, while Hirazan and Danzo were arguing, Mitsuo also learned about Kashina being attacked. He wanted to immediately go and question the Hokage about this, but Mido stopped him. She told him that even if they asked why Kashina was attacked, Hirazan would simply apologize and distance himself from the matter. She believed that Hirazan was not foolish enough to attack Kashina, so she trusted the explanation given by the Chunin ninja, and managed to calm Mitsuo down. Inside the forest of death, Kashina and her teammates moved swiftly, racing through the dense foliage. They were heading towards the direction where Kashina sensed the presence of a team carrying the Earth Scroll. Before entering the forest, she had memorized the chakra signatures of the team with the Earth Scroll. Unluckily, she hadn't come across any team with the Earth Scroll for the past hour, but now, finally, she had found the team and was running determinedly in their direction. Finally, with her team, Kashina encountered the other team carrying the Earth Scroll. It turned out to be a team from Konoha, and as soon as they saw Kashina, they were struck with fear, having witnessed her strength. Kashina calmly looked at the Kanoha ninjas and said, Give me the Earth Scroll, and I will let you all go unharmed. The team members looked at each other in confusion, but then their expressions hardened, and they said, If we admit defeat, how are we worthy to carry the will of fire? Hearing their words, Kashina shook her head and said, They are thoroughly brainwashed. No need to hold back, take the scroll as quickly as possible. I'm feeling hungry and want to eat food made by Grandma Mido. After receiving orders from Kashina, both Hiroshi and Sakura immediately attacked the Kanoha team. Their fists were covered in flames as they unleashed their attacks. Being just Genin, the opposing team couldn't evade Sakura and Hiroshi's onslaught. They fell to the ground, clutching their chests, suffering from burns. The remaining Genin, filled with fear, trembled and stood frozen. With a disdainful tone, Sakura said, weakling, and use fire pistol. A small fireball, resembling a bullet, passed through the shoulder of the remaining genin, causing them to scream in pain and collapse to the ground. Hiroshi seized the opportunity to take the scroll from the genin, but they refused to give it up, saying, Even if I die, I'm not going to give you the scroll. Hiroshi responded, Why bother? And forcefully held the genin's hand, burning it below the wrist. Overwhelmed by pain, the genin let go of the scroll. Hiroshi picked it up and appeared next to Kashina, declaring, Scroll obtained. Kashina nodded and left with Sakura and Hiroshi. Just as they departed, a team of monitoring ninjas arrived and witnessed the miserable state of the defeated team. How cruel, one of them remarked. The team captain intervened, saying, stop talking nonsense and help them up. Let's get them treated. The other team members nodded in agreement and left to arrange medical assistance for the defeated team. Just as Kashina and her teammates reached the building, with Minato and his team following closely behind, they entered the central building in the Forest of Death. Kashina and Minato handed over their respective scrolls. At that moment, the monitoring ninja team brought the seriously injured team inside the building. 
As soon as they entered, the injured Jenin caught the attention of everyone present, and the medical team rushed over to begin treating their injuries. To use such excessive force in the Chunin exams, they will need at least half a year of rest before they can resume their missions, one of the healers exclaimed. Upon hearing this, the Jenin team looked towards Kashina and her team with resentment. Observing their reaction, it became clear to everyone present what had transpired. After observing their reaction, the kind-hearted Minato couldn't help but ask, Why? Why did you feel the need to do this? You are clearly very powerful, and there was no necessity to go to such extreme lengths. First of all, I am not from your village, so you have no right to ask me this question. Secondly, as weaklings, they should have the consciousness of being weak. If any weakling starts challenging me, wouldn't I be wasting my time? They must have fear in their hearts for the strong, and fear never comes from gentleness. This is the first lesson taught by my grandfather, said Kashina, maintaining a stoic expression. No, you are absolutely wrong. Strength should never instill fear in the weak, but rather make them feel secure when they are around. Only through kindness can true peace be achieved, said Minato confidently. Your words may sound lofty and idealistic, but they are nothing more than mere dreams. The same words were once spoken by the first Hokage of your village, but his death proved that peace was only maintained through the fear of his strength. If he hadn't possessed that strength, he wouldn't have been able to achieve peace and establish Kanoha, retorted Kashina. Kashina continued, her voice filled with disdain, and you are not even as strong as him, so don't speak so highly. First, become strong, and then talk about peace. She then turned towards her teammates and said, let's go, before leaving the building to enjoy the delicious food prepared by her grandmother. Minato stood, looking at Kashina's back, and said, I will prove that only with kindness can peace be achieved. Kashina didn't respond in any way and left the building. Upon her return to the Senju clan compound, she was greeted by a worried Mitsuo. After seeing that Kashina was fine, he breathed a sigh of relief. That night, they celebrated the safety of Kashina and her qualification for the third round of the Chunin exam. Finally, after two days, the second round of the exam concluded, and a total of eight teams qualified. Ten teams could have qualified, but only eight were able to do so due to various reasons. Now, there were 24 Genin left who were eligible to fight in the upcoming battles. After the end of the second round of the exam, Hiruzen gave a speech on the will of fire. Listening to it, Kashina yawned, and no one was surprised by her behavior. Hiruzen then announced that there would be preliminaries before the third round of the Chunin exam, to eliminate half of the participants who passed the second round. Upon hearing this, many participants became dissatisfied, as they had fought various battles and endured for two whole days to qualify for the third round. However, their dissatisfaction was of no use, and the preliminaries continued to be held. The rules were simple. Every genin would fight one-on-one, -on -one, and whoever won would qualify for the third round. Hayuga Hiyashi vs Yuzumaki Kashina, Shikaku Nara vs Yuzumaki Sakura, Choza Akamichi vs Yuzumaki Hiroshi The matches were announced, and the first match was Kashina's. She stayed in the arena, and Hiyashi Hayuga also remained. The referee announced the start of the match. Hiyashi Hayuga ran towards Kashina and attacked her with his gentle fist. However, Kashina had trained in white hits, so she easily deflected Hiyashi's attacks. The Tajutsu fight between Kashina and Hiyashi continued, with Kashina mostly defending and Hiyashi relentlessly attacking. Then, Kashina began to counter-attack Hiyashi with her white hits, and Hiyashi struggled to defend himself. He was quickly overwhelmed by Kashina's strength, and she exclaimed, let you taste the power of fire. She snapped her fingers, and fire engulfed Hiyashi. Hiyashi quickly used the eight trigrams. Palm rotation, creating a chakra barrier to defend against Kashina's attack. However, as he completed his jutsu, he was panting slightly. Just then, he saw Kashina snapping her fingers again, and a massive amount of fire engulfed him. Hiyashi once again used the eight trigrams. Palm rotation to defend himself, but this time, he was completely exhausted and barely standing. As Kashina prepared to snap her fingers again, a voice was heard from the stance. Hiyashi gives up. However, Kashina didn't stop and snapped her fingers again, causing a huge fire to engulf Hiyashi. At this point, the referee knew that if he didn't intervene, Hiyashi would definitely die, so he immediately used water style and saved Hiyashi. Hiyashi's father approached and checked on his son. Seeing that Hiyashi was fine, he then looked at Kashina and said, I said Hiyashi gave up, so why did you attack him? Kashina replied, only when a contestant gives up can it be counted. 
She then looked at the referee and asked, Am I right, referee? Referee nodded in agreement. See, it was you who gave up, not your son. What if it was your conspiracy to let your son win when I am unprepared? Said Kashina. Everyone was speechless. Who in the world would dare to sneak attack her? After that, Kashina left the center of the arena and went to the stands where her teammates were. The referee then announced the next match. Nara Shikaku vs Yuzumaki Sakura. As soon as the referee set begin, Shikaku immediately used the shadow imitation technique and connected with Sakura's shadow. Sakura stood there as if she had given up, and the shadow connected with her own shadow, causing her to start moving. Sakura imitated Shikaku's moves as he made her take out a kunai. Just as she was about to pierce her own body, Sakura suddenly stopped, and no matter how hard Shikaku tried, he couldn't make Sakura move an inch. Suddenly, at that moment, a yellow chain appeared behind Sakura and pierced through Shikaku's shoulder. Shikaku's shadow imitation technique was lifted, and he was also upset. He said, you never took me seriously, did you? Sakura replied, isn't that obvious? And started leaving the arena. Shikaku accepted his defeat, resulting in Sakura's victory. The last match was Hirashi vs Shoza Akamichi, and this battle was also one-sided. Using his fire fist and tojutsu, Hiroshi easily defeated Choza. In this way, everyone from the Uzumaki village qualified without any hindrance. Finally, after the prelims, 12 ninjas qualified for the third and final round of the Chunin exam. At that time, Hiruzen came forward and announced, Congratulations to everyone who qualified for the third round. The third round will be held in one week in the presence of the daimyo of the fire country. Upon receiving this information, Kashina left with her team, as she didn't want to hear any nonsense from Saratobi Hirzen. After stepping outside, she noticed the Genin team whom they had defeated in the Forest of Death. These Genin had hostility in their eyes, and if they weren't weak, they might have already attacked. However, Kashina disregarded them and left without paying them any mind. After traveling a considerable distance from the Chunin Arena, Kashina stopped and looked at Sakura and Hiroshi. She said, I have a task for both of you. You saw those genin, right? Kill them. The hostility they showed is something I cannot tolerate, so go and eliminate them. But they are just weaklings. Killing them would be meaningless, Sakura replied. I understand, but my grandfather mentioned that there are forbidden techniques capable of giving even him a headache. These weaklings might seem insignificant, but what if they are using such forbidden techniques, and are willing to sacrifice themselves just to make us pay? He also admitted that despite his vast knowledge and experience, there might be forbidden techniques he doesn't know about. So, we must eliminate them. I don't want them alive, Kashina ordered sternly. Upon receiving orders from Kashina, Sakura and Hiroshi immediately set off to fulfill their task. The next day, after waking up, Minato went to the training ground as usual to train with Jiraiya. Upon reaching the training ground, he started doing warm-up exercises before Jiraiya's arrival. Since he was early, there were only a few people who came to train. After an hour, more people started arriving in large numbers, and just as Minato was about to change his training method, he overheard people talking. Did you see them? Said one person. Yeah, they were severely burned, said another. They were fine yesterday, and today they died inexplicably, added another person. Who told them to offend those red-haired guys? Remarked the first person. Minato, being a very smart person, immediately guessed who they might be talking about. Just as he was about to confirm his guess, Jiraiya approached him. Minato, it seems you've been training for quite some time, but you also need to understand that mornings are the best time for collecting materials, Jiraiya said with a lit smile. Minato's face twitched upon hearing Jiraiya's words, but then he remembered and said, are they talking about the same genin and members of the Uzumaki clan, whom the genin offended? Upon hearing Minato's words, the smile vanished from Jiraiya's face, and he sighed. Yes, what they're saying is correct. All three genin were killed last night, and they were burned. Yesterday, when they showed hostility towards members of the Uzumaki clan, I had a feeling something like this might happen. But obviously, Kanoha can't spare its manpower to protect three genin, and the next morning they were found dead in their house. It's almost confirmed that they were killed by members of the Uzumaki clan. Why? I don't understand why they would care about hostility from some insignificant genin, said Minato, clenching his fists. Jiraiya looked at the sky and replied, this shows leadership qualities in that girl. Remember, Minato, for a leader, it's important to prioritize the safety of their people. 
and even though their hostility was minor, imagine a scenario where they encounter civilians from Yuzashi Agakur and decide to vent their frustration on them. It's necessary to eliminate anyone who harbors hostility towards you or your village. So take this as a lesson, especially since you aspire to become a Hokage, right? Minato nodded in response to Jiraiya's words. Jiraiya then said, because of your question, my mood worsened. Come, let's go to the bathhouse to collect materials. Saying that, he dragged Minato along with him. No, I don't want to gather materials, sensei. Said Minato. In the morning, inside the Senju clan compound, Kashina was training in her courtyard when Mitsuo approached her and asked, Did you kill those genin? Kashina halted her training and looked at Mitsuo, replying, No, why would I do it when Sakura and Hiroshi are there? I ordered them to kill those genin. Hmm, you did a good job, remarked Mitsuo. Yeah, small grandpa, I know that much, responded Kashina. Tsunade, who was standing at the gate, had a complex expression. She knew Kashina and considered her like a little sister. Living with her, she didn't know how to respond to the news of Kashina killing a member of her own village. Sister Tsunade, it seems you're facing some kind of problem, observed Kashina, looking at Tsunade's face. You don't have to worry too much. We will leave the Kanoha village after one week. Upon hearing her words, Tsunade didn't say anything but left quietly. After Tsunade departed, Mitsuo said, Although no one would dare to attack you, there could be some more mad people like that Chunin. So be careful, okay? Yeah, I also know that much. I'm not that big of a fool, replied Kashina. After their conversation, Mitsuo left. Danzo also debated with Hiruzen about this matter, and urged immediate expulsion of the Yuzashi Agakur team from Kanoha. However, Hiruzen refused, stating that there was no proper evidence to justify their expulsion. If Danzo had evidence, he was instructed to present it, and Hiruzen himself would confront the Yuzashi Agakur team. Faced with no response, Danzo had to leave immediately. Three days before the Chunin exams. Inside the root base, Danzo was reviewing the intelligence sent by the root members, as he usually did. Suddenly, everything became quiet as if no one was present in the base. He became alert, ready for an attack. Despite his vigilance, he couldn't sense anything, and his heart was filled with panic. He wondered if Mito had attacked his root base after learning about Kashina's situation. Fearing the unknown, he said, whoever you are, come out. I know you're here. At that moment, the sound of footsteps could be heard from the front, and Danzo was prepared to attack if necessary. However, when he saw the person's face and felt the overwhelming pressure, his weapon fell to the ground. It's impossible. How could you be alive? I saw your dead body. You were killed by the first Hokage in the battle at the Valley of the End, exclaimed Danzo with horror on his face as he stepped back. The man paid no attention to Danzo's fear and proceeded to the main seat, sitting on it with arrogance. You ask me this when you have researched everything about the Ichiha with Taburama. You must also know how I survived, said the man with arrogance. So, you use Izanagi during your fight with the first Hokage, replied Danzo, regaining his composure. The man remained silent, not saying anything. Danzo took a deep breath and asked, What do you want from me, Ichiha Midar? Why have you returned to Kanoha? Do you plan to take the position of Hokage after the first Hokage's death? The seat of Hokage means nothing to me. If Hashirama were alive, I might have tried to fight him and claim the Hokage seat. But now that he is gone, no one is my opponent and I have bigger things to accomplish, declared Madar. Okay, I didn't come here to talk nonsense with you. I came here to give you a chance to take revenge on Kagatsuchi, who took your arm, said Madar Ichiha. I can understand that I have a motive for revenge, but I don't think you have any motive. So why target him? What would you gain from it? Asked Danzo. Although he didn't offend me in any way, he can become a nuisance to my future plans, so he must be killed before that, explained Madar. What is your plan? Inquired Danzo. As soon as Danzo's words fell, Madar appeared in front of him and lifted him by the neck, resembling a chicken. He spoke with intensity, I am suppressing my impulse to kill you, as you are an apprentice of that Taburama. So, don't test my patience. You don't have to know too much. Just follow what I say, or else you will be dead before you can even react. I understand, Danzo choked out, struggling to speak. His voice strained as he continued, and I will not repeat it further. Madara threw Danzo aside like a dead dog. Cough cough, Danzo coughed heavily. After calming down, he looked at Madara with fear. Madara was a cage-level powerhouse, and Danzo couldn't even resist him. So, what do I have to do? Asked Danzo. 
He loves his granddaughter very much, right? Lure her out, suggested Madar. But she is good at sensing, so it would be hard. I can't promise anything, replied Danzo. You don't have to worry. I will send you a man who can do it perfectly, assured Madar. As soon as Madar emerged from the root base, Black Setsu emerged from the ground and positioned itself next to him. With a curious tone, Black Zetsu inquired, Madara Sama, can we consider someone like Danzo to be trustworthy? Indeed, a person consumed by hatred is capable of any action, responded Madara Chaha. In a sense, I am suggesting the eradication of threats to Kanoha, and someone like Danzo, who is the most prominent hawk within the village, can only be utilized for such purposes. And following this incident, the news of Kashina's kidnapping should be disseminated throughout Kanoha to instigate conflict. This world has remained in peace for far too long, Madara continued. Yes, Madara Sama, responded Black Setsu. Let us go. It appears that the old woman has detected my chakra, said Madara. After uttering those words, Madara's body underwent a transformation, morphing into a phase form. Black Zetsu promptly affixed himself to this new vessel, and together they employed the Mayfly technique to vanish from the scene. Shortly after their departure, a substantial surge of chakra descended upon the very same location. Emerging into view was a woman in her thirties, adorned in crimson attire. It was none other than Mido. Despite her efforts, Mido scoured the area in search of any discernible traces, yet she failed to find anyone or anything. In that very moment, Hiruzen emerged from behind her, accompanied by Sukumo, and by their side stood Mitsuo. A few moments earlier, Mido had been engrossed in her daily chores when she suddenly sensed a familiar chakra it belonged to Ichihemidar. Startled, the item in her hand slipped from her grasp, and her heart raced with unease. Unable to control her own chakra, she emitted it in an uncontrollable burst. Wasting no time, she swiftly sprinted toward the direction where she felt Madara's chakra emanating from. Meanwhile, Hiruzen had been engaged in a discussion with Sakumo, when he also detected a surge of potent chakra coming from Mido. Sensing that she was headed towards the vicinity of the root space, he grew perplexed. Could it be related to Kashina? Nevertheless, without delay, he decided to follow Mido. In the midst of his journey, he encountered Mitsuo, prompting him to inquire, Do you have any idea why Mido-sama appears so restless? Mitsuo responded, no, she suddenly released her chakra and headed in this direction. I too, am eager to discover what has unsettled my sister so deeply. In the present moment, Hiruzen stepped forward and gazed at Mido, questioning, Mido-sama, what has transpired to leave you in such a state of restlessness? Mido glanced at everyone around her, observing the perplexed expressions on their faces. Letting out a sigh, she responded, while I was occupied with my tasks, I sensed it Shihemidara's chakra. However, as I arrived here, his chakra abruptly vanished. Hiruzen's face registered a mix of shock and fear as he exclaimed, What? How can that be? Are you certain, Mido-sama? Madara has been deceased for many years. Would you think I'd make such an error? Mido retorted, her face expressionless, asserting her certainty. Hiruzen, now compassed, responded, My apologies, Mido-sama, for my momentary lapse. I shall immediately raise Kanoha's alert level and initiate a search for Madara. Mido nodded in acknowledgement upon hearing Hirzen's words. Then, she added, let us ensure that the Ichiha clan remains unaware of this development. We must safeguard the village's peace. Hirzen nodded in agreement, absorbing Mido's concern. He departed alongside Sakumo, leaving Mido standing there, sighing. Don't worry, sister. Everything will be alright, Mitsuo reassured her, offering comfort. Following that, they both left and made their way to the Senju clan compound. Kanoha remained on high alert, with every individual in the village actively searching for any signs of a suspicious intruder. However, their efforts proved fruitless as days passed without any significant discoveries. On the eve of the Chunin exams, Kashina was strolling through the village when Hiroshi suddenly appeared before her. He swiftly conveyed, Mitsuo-sama is calling for us. Please follow me. Although Hiroshi's chakra emanated from him, Kashina sensed that he was being untruthful. Despite her suspicion, she reluctantly decided to follow him, deep into the forest. As they journeyed further, Hiroshi eventually halted and turned towards her. Kashina's expression shifted as a sense of unease washed over her. Her Kagura mind's eye, typically reliable in detecting her surroundings, failed to provide any insights. Perplexed, she confronted Hiroshi, demanding an explanation. However, to her astonishment, Hiroshi's demeanor transformed as he erupted into maniacal laughter. 
His body underwent a drastic change, revealing himself to be White Zetsu. With a twisted glee in his voice, he taunted, Look at how frightened she is. Haha. <laughs> in an instant, around 30 ninjas materialize, encircling Kashina. Four individuals swiftly coordinated to execute the Four Violet Flames formation, a technique known for its formidable trapping abilities. Kashina, undeterred by the odds stacked against her, brandished her sword and smirked. You may have prepared this formation, but you underestimate me if you think you can capture me. As Kashina unsheathed her sword, the leader reminded his comrades, remember, our orders are to capture her alive. If capturing her proves impossible, then eliminate her. Yes replied the remaining members of Root, launching their assault on Kashina. In response, Kashina swung her flaming sword, unleashing a fiery slash known as Fire Slash. The attack surged towards the Root members, prompting them to swiftly dodge. Seizing the opportunity, Kashina focused her attention on one of the Root members, and launched an attack. However, he skillfully parried her strike and swiftly retreated, acknowledging Kashina's formidable strength. Seizing the moment, Kashina swiftly shifted her attention to another root ninja, who sought to harm her. Meanwhile, a cunning first ninja seized the opening and lunged at Kashina, aiming to pierce her shoulder. But just as his blade neared her, a golden chain enveloped him, engulfed in flames that not only constricted his movements, but also inflicted burns upon his struggling form. And finally his charred body fell to the ground. As the root ninja engaged in close combat with Kashina, he contemplated retreating, preparing to exert force to push her back. However, his intentions were abruptly halted when he witnessed Kashina opening her mouth wide, unleashing a torrent of scorching flames that engulfed him, bringing about his demise. Observing how effortlessly Kashina killed their two comrades, the remaining root members managed to maintain their composure. The leader seized the opportunity, recognizing the favorable circumstances. This is our chance. Let's make the most of it, he commanded. Without delay, six root ninjas initiated their jutsu, water release. Water bowl, causing a copious amount of water to surge forth, rapidly filling the area. The environment became saturated, as if transformed into an expansive water-filled bowl. Taking advantage of the watery terrain, the leader issued a decisive order. Now that water surrounds her, she will be severely constrained. Attack her with all your might. The battle persisted, with Kashina finding herself encircled by water. Despite the challenging environment, her combat prowess remained unyielding. As half an hour elapsed, Kashina stood resolute, bearing a few cuts and panting slightly. On the other side, twenty exhausted ninjas from Roots also panted heavily, their bodies adorned with burn marks and lacerations, inflicted by Kashina's relentless onslaught. In the span of this intense exchange, Kashina had claimed the lives of eight additional root ninjas, bringing the total count of her fallen adversaries to ten. As the battle raged on, Kashina's exhaustion became increasingly apparent, causing her to question her waning stamina. Thoughts raced through her mind, why am I feeling this fatigue? It shouldn't be like this. I should have ample strength to endure, at least enough to fight for an hour. She gazed down at the cuts she had sustained, her eyes widening with realization. Poison, she muttered, a sense of alarm creeping into her voice. The gravity of the situation sank in as she comprehended that if left unchecked, the poison coursing through her veins would render her unable to continue fighting in approximately 15 minutes. It appears the poison is taking its toll, remarked the captain, observing Kashina's dwindling strength. He marveled at her tenacity, acknowledging that an ordinary ninja would have succumbed to such circumstances long ago. Determined to exploit this advantage, he commanded his comrades, press on with the attack. Do not grant her a moment of respite. The captain recognized the critical importance of capitalizing on Kashina's weakened state, urging his fellow root members to relentlessly assail her, denying her any opportunity to recover. As the battle persisted, Kashina found herself increasingly disadvantaged with the passage of time. The toll of the prolonged fight took its toll on her, causing her to struggle continuously. Despite her waning strength, however, Kashina's determination remained unyielding. Even in her weakened state, she managed to claim the lives of four more root ninjas, refusing to succumb to the overwhelming odds stacked against her. Her resilience shone through, even as the fight took its toll. Struggling to maintain her balance, especially on the water-soaked ground, Kashina panted heavily. Her vision blurred, and every movement became a challenge. Despite her weakened state, a fierce determination burned within her. Clenching her fists tightly, she let out a resolute shout, Even if I perish, I will make you bastards pay. 
Drawing upon every ounce of her remaining chakra, Kashino unleashed her trump card a devastating technique known as Fire Tornado. As she focused her energy, a colossal vortex of blazing flames erupted, expanding to engulf the entire Four Violet Flames formation. Witnessing this formidable display of power, some of the root members instinctively sought refuge within the water. However, to their dismay, the water's temperature rapidly escalated, boiling and scalding them. Realizing the impending danger, the captain hastily employed Earth's style. Met Wall, erecting a barrier of thick mud in an attempt to shield his comrades. But it proved futile, as the four violet flames formation acted as a relentless coffin, trapping and sealing the fate of the unfortunate root ninjas within its fiery grasp. As the remnants of the fire tornado dissipated, only three root ninjas managed to survive the devastating onslaught. However, their bodies were severely burned, bearing the scars of the intense flames. The aftermath of the attack left the entire area inside the Four Violet Flames formation, shrouded in an eerie fog, concealing the aftermath of the fierce battle. Coincidentally, during this time, Minato ventured into the forest for a hunting expedition, seeking to procure a beast for his dinner. However, his intentions were abruptly halted as his eyes caught sight of a colossal flame tornado, enveloped within a barrier of purple energy. Recognizing the magnitude of the battle before him, Minato knew he could not intervene directly. Acting swiftly, he employed a summoning technique, summoning a toad, and instructing it to convey the urgent message to Jiraiya. Minato stood silently, observing the unfolding situation while awaiting Jiraiya's arrival and guidance. As Kashina lay on the ground, utterly drained and her consciousness slipping into darkness, the captain of Root swiftly approached, aiming to capture her and expedite their departure from the area. However, as the captain moved closer, a peculiar occurrence took place. The swirling mark on Kashina's forehead, the symbol of her power, ignited with an intense light. Startled, the Root Ninja froze in his tracks, unable to move. In an instant, a colossal fire vortex consumed not only the captain, but also all others present within the Four Violet Flames formation. The raging flames surged skyward, forming a towering pillar of fire that obliterated the once enclosing barrier. In its wake, a protective wall of formidable flames shielded Kashina, providing her with an unyielding sanctuary. Simultaneously, as a blazing inferno engulfed Kashina, shielding her within its fiery embrace, an immense force descended upon the Uzumaki village. Who dares lay a hand on my beloved granddaughter? Bellowed Kagetsuchi, rudely awakened from his deep meditation and consumed by fury. Without hesitation, Kagetsuchi swiftly invoked his Ryujin Jaka, and sliced through the air, tearing open a rift in space. Seizing the opportunity, he promptly stepped into the rift, and as his form vanished within its confines, the tear itself dissipated into nothingness. Witnessing the aftermath, Yuzumaki Fuso arrived to find Kagetsuchi absent, leaving an empty space behind. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Fuso's tone turned serious as he contemplated the events that transpired. It appears that something has occurred involving Kashina and Kanoha, provoking the wrath of Grand Uncle, he remarked. Prepare our forces, for there is a possibility that Grand Uncle may require their aid. Despite his resolute demeanor, Fuso couldn't help but harbor deep concerns for the safety of his own daughter. Simultaneously, within the confines of Kanoha, Jiraiya was in the midst of receiving urgent news delivered by a toad, sent by Minato. However, before he could fully process the message, a thunderous explosion rocked the vicinity, accompanied by a colossal pillar of fire, descending precisely in the direction indicated by the toad. The commotion within Kanoha reached a fever pitch as everyone was jolted into action, racing towards the source of the explosion in the forest. Soon, a gathering of high-ranking Kanoha individuals assembled at the scene, including Mido and Mitsuo. As their eyes fell upon the radiant aura emanating from the fiery pillar, their expressions morphed into a mix of shock and concern. In unison, Mido and Mitsuo exclaimed, Uncle. Driven by their apprehension, they swiftly moved closer to the blazing inferno, with the rest following closely behind. However, as they neared the vicinity of the pillar, their hopes were met with a grim reality. Spikes of flames materialized, menacingly targeting each of them. It became clear that any attempt to draw near Kashina would result in certain death. In the face of this deadly barrier, Mido's voice trembled as she exclaimed, Kashina. What has happened? Abruptly, the skies above Kano had transformed, becoming shrouded in dark clouds that rumbled ominously, foretelling the arrival of an impending catastrophe. In that very moment, a rift in space tore open high above the city, revealing an elderly figure clutching a burning katana as he emerged. 
The sheer pressure emanating from this enigmatic old man rendered everyone in the vicinity immobile, their movements stilled by an overwhelming force. Kagasuchi, without exchanging a single word with anyone, promptly made his way towards Kashina, disregarding all else. Observing Kashina's condition, he appeared outwardly compassed, yet deep within, he had resolved to eliminate anyone responsible for subjecting his granddaughter to such distress. Removing the lingering flame pillar with a flick of his hand, Kagetsuchi immediately began employing healing Kido, skillfully mending Kashina's injuries. As his healing abilities took effect, the once pallid and poisoned Kashina gradually regained her natural rosy complexion, signaling her recovery. However, she remained unconscious, prompting Mitsuo to step forward, his voice filled with concern. Uncle, is Kashina going to be alright? He queried, seeking assurance amidst the turmoil. What were you doing? Sweating mosquitoes. You couldn't even protect her, despite my sending you to Kanoha. Kagasuchi's voice thundered with anger, his frustration palpable. Mitsuo, unable to meet Kagasuchi's wrathful gaze, bowed his head in shame, his eyes reflecting remorse. In that tense moment, Kagasuchi held something in the air, leaving everyone perplexed by its significance. It turned out to be the soul of a root ninja deliberately ensnared within the fiery pillar. Kagasuchi, utilizing his formidable Ryutsu, delved into the depths of the ninja's memories, uncovering the truth of what had transpired. Fixing his intense gaze upon Hiruzen, Kagasuchi demanded, Where is your friend, Danzo? Sensing the palpable anger emanating from Kagatsuchi, Hiruzen swiftly responded, his voice tinged with apprehension, I am unaware of his current whereabouts, but he ought to be within his root base. With skepticism clouding his judgment, Kagatsuchi swiftly seized Hiruzen, gripping him tightly, and delved into the depths of his soul. As Kagatsuchi sifted through Hiruzen's memories, he discovered the truth. There were no intentions to harm the Yuzumaki family within Hiruzen's heart. Accepting this revelation, Kagatsuchi released his hold on Hiruzen. Though Kagatsuchi's anger still smoldered within him, he was not one driven solely by a thirst for bloodshed. He recognized the consequences that would befall the innocent residents of Kanoha, if he were to unleash his wrath upon the entire village, for the actions of one man, Danzo. Kagatsuchi shifted his attention to Mitsuo, his voice stern and resolute. Kashina was besieged by 30 root ninjas, my dear nephew. She fought valiantly, eliminating 26 of them and leaving 4 severely injured before succumbing to unconsciousness. If you seek redemption, take it upon yourself to end Danzo's life before my return. In a trembling voice, Hiruzen interjected, Kanoha stands ready to assist in this endeavor. Without uttering a word in response to Hiruzen's offer, Kagatsuchi turned and swiftly departed in a single direction, employing Shunpo to traverse the distance with unparalleled speed. At that time, Waitsetsu was traveling at a very fast speed using his Mayfly technique. As soon as he felt the pressure of Kagatsuchi, he ran away. The reason Kagatsuchi didn't solve Danzo himself and left the place, was that he could feel his soul leaving Kanoha at a very fast speed as soon as he arrived. However, with Kagura's hard eye ability, he wasn't able to feel anything. After reading the memory of the Root Ninja, he immediately understood whose soul was traveling and left in the direction where he last felt Setsu's location. Finally, after traversing a distance of 8 miles, Kagatsuchi's heightened perception once again captured the elusive presence of White Setsu. Setsu, situated approximately 10 miles away, unknowingly drew closer to his pursuer, as Kagatsuchi swiftly closed the gap. Continuing their relentless pursuit, Kagatsuchi covered an additional 10 miles, relentlessly narrowing the distance between them. Gradually, the gap diminished until Kagatsuchi found himself within a mere 200 meters of Zetsu's concealed location. Simultaneously, Zetsu's intuition heightened, sensing the relentless approach of Kagatsuchi. The tension reached its climax as Kagatsuchi finally caught up to Zetsu, channeling an immense surge of power into a formidable punch that reverberated through the terrain, leaving behind a vast crater. The sheer force expelled Zetsu from the ground. Kagatsuchi apprehended Zetsu and wasted no time in delving into his memories. However, he was surprised to discover that Zetsu's memories did not contain any recollection of Madara his hideout. It appeared that every white Zetsu was assigned a specific area, and did not venture beyond its confines. Other Zetsu would come, gather intelligence, and then depart, leaving behind no trace of Madara or his whereabouts. Kagasuchi fell into deep thought, and then he realized that if all the white Zetsu were created from a single world tree, their souls should also be interconnected like a network. 
With this revelation in mind, Kagasuchi began working on his theory and searched for any connection between their souls. There truly is a connection, he exclaimed upon discovering the link. Eager to find the most powerful soul within this network, Kagasuchi stood quietly for half an hour. Then, he opened his eyes and confidently declared, found it, a triumphant aura surrounded him as he disappeared from his original spot, leaving White Setsu, once in his clutches, to plummet towards the ground. In a mesmerizing spectacle, Zetsu's form became engulfed in searing flames, relentlessly consuming his physical shell until naught but delicate ashes remained. Inside Kanoha. After being subjected to Kagetsuchi's reprimand and witnessing the distressing state of Kashina, Mitsuo's emotions flared, and without hesitation, he turned to Hiruzen, urgently questioning, where can I find Danzo? Hiruzen's countenance turned grave, reflecting the weight of the situation. With a summer tone, he replied, follow me. Without wasting a moment, he set forth towards the root base, beckoning Mitsuo to accompany him. Meanwhile, Mido, understanding the necessity of tending to Kashina's well-being despite her own anger, chose to remain by her side, ensuring her safety and comfort. Not long after, Tsunade arrived on the scene, her concern evident as she witnessed Kashina lying unconscious. Approaching Grandma Mido, Tsunade inquired with a touch of worry, what has happened to her? Please, enlighten me. Mido replied, your friends will everything to you. With those words, she departed, taking Kashina away from the scene. Tsunade's gaze shifted towards Jiraiya, who had been present before her arrival. Jiraiya proceeded to relay all the information he possessed. After attentively listening to Jiraiya's account, Tsunade's frustration surged, causing her to strike the ground forcefully. Damn that Danzo! She exclaimed, her voice filled with anger. Fueled by her determination, she swiftly followed the path Hiruzen had taken, heading towards the root base. As Mitsu arrived at the root base, he encountered the vigilant root ninjas who stood guard. Consumed by anger, Mitsuo had no intention of engaging in conversation. Without hesitation, six yellow chains emerged from his body, piercing through the bodies of the root ninjas with precision, leaving them no opportunity to resist. Once Mitsuo cleared his path, he proceeded to advance inside the base. To his surprise, as Mitsuo entered the root base, he found an absence of root ninjas along his way. Finally, upon reaching the center of the base, he discovered Danzo's presence, surrounded by a cohort of root ninjas, patiently awaiting his arrival. At that moment, Hiruzen arrived accompanied by the Anbu, led by Sukumo. As Danzo caught sight of Hiruzen, he breathed a sigh of relief. However, before he could utter a word, Hiruzen spoke sternly, Danzo, I warn you that if any harm befell the members of the Uzumaki clan, I would personally end your life. Did my warning hold no weight for you? Hiruzen, I assure you I have not acted recklessly. I have devised a plan, Danzo responded, attempting to defend himself. Have you completely lost your sanity? What plan do you speak of? Hiruzen's voice resonated with intensity, bordering on a roar. Do you not comprehend the formidable strength possessed by Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi? When he unleashed his power today, I could sense that he has grown even more formidable since our last encounter. Hiruzen, you underestimate the situation, Danzo countered. Madara Chuha, believe it or not, is still alive, and he has set his sights on Kagetsuchi. As someone as formidable as Madara is targeting him, Kagetsuchi's demise is inevitable. It presents us with an opportunity to eradicate the Yuzumaki clan once and for all. Is that so? A voice resonated through the air, its tone is chilling as ice, causing the surrounding temperature to noticeably rise. It was Mitsuo, now cloaked in flames, appearing as if he had transformed into the very embodiment of fire itself. Here is an urge, please remain calm. Danzo will face punishment in accordance with the Kanoha rules. Mitsuo's voice seethed with anger as he declared, there's no excuse for what he's done to my granddaughter. He must pay with his life. There's nothing that can save him now. With those words, Mitsuo swiftly launched an assault on Danzo. In a swift response, the loyal root ninjas sprang to Danzo's defense, shielding him from harm. Not so surprisingly, nine chains emerged from Mitsuo's body, striking at the root ninjas. His fists, engulfed in flames, unleashed a relentless onslaught against the other ninjas, as he continued his merciless rampage of destruction. The relentless assault from the ninjas persisted as they conjured the water release. Water formation wall. Vast quantities of water surged within the confines of the root base, while skilled water ninjutsu practitioners among the root ranks, swiftly executed the water release. Water Fang Bullet Technique Countless water bullets surged forward, aimed at Mitsuo. 
In a decisive move, Mitsuo countered with his fire style. Firewall. A towering wall of roaring flames materialized around him, instantly evaporating the incoming barrage of water bullets before they could even reach him. Nine golden chains came out from the firewall and pierced the root ninjas who were nearest to the firewall, killing them instantly without any resistance. The golden chains continued to move and captured three ninja and strangling them to the death. With the firewall dissipating, Danzo seized the moment and unleashed the wind release. Vacuum Serial Waves Sharp blades of wind slice through the air, threatening Mitsuo's elemental defenses. Recognizing the danger, Mitsuo swiftly evaded the attack, realizing that the razor-sharp wind blades could disrupt his elemental manipulation. Sensing the urgency, he promptly fled the scene, leaving behind the unfolding chaos. In retaliation, Mitsuo gathered his inner strength and unleashed the formidable fire style. Fire Dragon Technique the colossal dragon compassed of roaring flames surged towards Danzo, intent on obliterating him. Witnessing the impending danger, Danzo responded swiftly by employing the wind release. Vacuum Great Sphere The collision between the massive fire dragon and the swirling vacuum sphere caused the dragon's flames to diminish gradually, neutralizing the fiery threat. At that moment, five root ninjas launched a surprise attack on Mitsuo from behind. However, Mitsuo effortlessly defended against their assaults using his adamantine ceiling chains. He left them no opportunity to recover, swiftly killing them with lethal efficiency. Only a mere 10% of Danzo's subordinates remained alive following the devastating attack on Kashina and Mitsuo. Danzo, witnessing the dire outcome and seething with anger, realized that he couldn't overcome Mitsuo's power without the intervention of Hiruzen. Yet, observing Hiruzen's apparent lack of intention to intervene in the matter, Danzo's frustration grew. Just as Mitsuo prepared to continue his relentless assault on Danzo, Hiruzen positioned himself in front of Danzo and spoke firmly, I understand your anger and sadness, but I'm sorry, I have to intervene. You cannot kill Danzo. He will face punishment in accordance with the laws of our village, and it will be a public spectacle witnessed by all the Jonin ninjas. HMPH do you truly believe you can stop me? Even if both you and Danzo join forces against me, I can defeat you both, Mitsuo responded confidently. However, it was clear that such an outcome was impossible. Hiruzen, the master of all five natures of chakra, possessed immense strength, earning him the title of the professor of ninjutsu. Hiruzen calmly replied, I permitted you to release your anger upon the root ninjas, but I cannot allow you to execute a high-ranking member of Konoha in my presence. Danzo will face judgment before the entire population of Konoha, following a fair trial conducted by the village's Jonin. As Hiruzen's words resonated, he released his chakra, and by his side stood Sakumo, who also unleashed his cage-level chakra. Holding a blade enveloped in crackling thunder, Sakumo remained poised to strike at any given moment. Observing the formidable presence of Hiruzen and Sakumo, ready to unleash their might, Mitsuo managed to regain his composure and control his anger. Aware that his actions could endanger Kashina and considering the safety of others in Kanoha, he suppressed his rage. With an icy demeanor, Mitsuo departed from the root base, leaving behind an aura of cold detachment. After Mitsuo's departure, Hiruzen cast a piercing gaze towards Danzo, brimming with an intent to kill. In a low, ominous voice, he uttered, Pray that Madara succeeds in eliminating Kagasuchi. Otherwise, for the sake of Kanoha, I will have no choice but to sacrifice you. With these words hanging in the air, Hiruzen turned his attention to Sakumo, commanding him in a hushed tone, apprehend him and confine Danzo to the depths of the Kanoha prison. Having issued the order, Hiruzen departed, leaving Sakumo to carry out his instructions diligently. Under Sakumo's watchful eye, Danzo and all his loyal root members were captured and taken into custody. In the expanse between the borders of the Fire Country and the Earth Country an aged man hobbled along, relying on his crutch for support. Eventually, he reached a towering tree, a sight that held significant meaning. This old man was none other than Kagetsuchi, his weathered senses alerting him to the presence of a vast subterranean cavity beneath the tree's roots. Within that hidden space resided two distinct and formidable ores. Drawing upon the recollections of memories of white Setsus who had once roamed these lands, Kagetsuchi confirmed that he had stumbled upon the secretive sanctuary of none other than Ichihemadar. Kagasuchi created a fireball and hurled it towards the roots of the tree that covered the entrance. As the fireball made contact with the roots, they were reduced to ashes. Slowly and cautiously, Kagasuchi made his way into the underground shelter constructed by Chihemadar. 
Initially, a few white setsu obstructed Kagetsuchi's path, but they were effortlessly killed with a mere wave of his hand. After a few minutes, he found himself standing before a massive statue of the Ten Tails, known as the Demonic Statue of the Outer Path. Extending from the statue was a tube connected to a 60-year-old man, none other than the ghost of Ichiha. So, you are Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. Ichiha Madara spoke, directing his gaze towards Kagetsuchi, his Rinnegan eyes fully activated. You know, when I set out to find you, I was rather perplexed. I assumed you must have heard news of my battle with Mido, and thus, you would be aware of my strength. Yet, you had the audacity to lure me out by kidnapping my granddaughter. What gave you such confidence? Kagasuchi responded, his expression pensive. But now, seeing those eyes still in your possession, I understand where your confidence stems from, Kagasuchi added, his gaze focused and contemplative. Upon hearing Kagetsuchi's words, Madara's countenance changed, and he inquired sharply, How did you come to know that I have awakened Rinnegan? Kagetsuchi responded confidently, I know more than you can imagine. You don't need to know the specifics. It's fortunate that you found me, as otherwise, I would have had to track you down, which would have been a waste of my time. I was aware that you would become an obstacle to my next move, so I intended to eliminate you and ensure that my actions could proceed unhindered. You mean collecting the tailed beasts? Madara's tone carried an ominous undertone, relishing the idea of shocking Kagetsuchi with his revelation. However, to Madara's disappointment, Kagetsuchi's expression remained compassed and unaffected, his face reflecting a calm demeanor. Observing the disappointed expression on Madara's face, Kagetsuchi calmly replied, I am well aware that you have awakened the Rinnegan. Furthermore, I knew about your subordinates who possess the ability to blend seamlessly into their surroundings, rendering them undetectable. Therefore, it was within my prediction that you might have become privy to my plans through eavesdropping during meetings or through sources within the Yuzumaki clan. You know too much, Madara declared. Rising to his feet, he was joined by a white Zetsu who enveloped his entire body, allowing him to unleash his full power. In past, utilizing Zetsu's body and the black receivers he had implanted, Madara instilled a sense of intimidation in Danzo. As Madara clapped his hands, he invoked the power of the demonic statue chains. Numerous purple chains emerged from the outer path statue, intent on binding Kagetsuchi. However, before the chains could reach their target, golden chains surged forth from Kagetsuchi's own body, effectively countering the attack of the demonic statue chains. The assault from the Outer Path statue was rendered useless, as the Golden Chains repelled and nullified its effects. As his previous attack failed, Madara resorted to unleashing Fire Release. Great Fire Destruction. A colossal torrent of intense flames erupted from Madara's mouth, directed towards Kagetsuchi. In the face of the incoming inferno, Kagetsuchi displayed an air of disdain, uttering, playing with fire in front of me. With an effortless demeanor, Kagetsuchi remained stationary. When the blazing fire drew near, within a one-meter radius of Kagetsuchi, it simply dissipated, leaving him completely unscathed. The flames proved futile, having no impact on him whatsoever. In that moment, Kagetsuchi lifted his crutch, and with a sudden motion, a colossal blue fist clashed with the tip of his crutch. Kagetsuchi unleashed the power of Anippi, Omni Fire, obliterating the giant blue hand in its entirety. Despite Kagetsuchi's immobility, the surrounding grounds were utterly devastated, and even the underground shelter trembled under the force unleashed. As the flames subsided, a towering half-bodied Susanoo materialized, encompassing Madara within its formidable presence. The remnants of the fist, shattered by Kagetsuchi's crutch, could be seen within the protective cocoon of the Susanoo. Undeterred, Madara continued his assault, wielding the chakra-infused knife within his Susanoo's other hand. Just as the blade was poised to strike Kagetsuchi, Kagetsuchi vanished from the location, utilizing Shunpo to teleport. In an instant, Kagetsuchi reappeared directly in front of Madara Susanoo, clenching his fist and delivering a devastating blow known as IKKOTSU Single Bone. The impact of Kagetsuchi's punch obliterated the Susanoo, sending Madara hurtling through the air, due to the sheer force unleashed by Kagetsuchi's strike. By gaining his composure, Madara utilized the Diva Path ability, allowing him to levitate in midair. With swift precision, he closed the distance between himself and Kagetsuchi, unleashing the formidable technique known as Shinra Tensei. The sheer power of the attack was so overwhelming that even Kagetsuchi was forcefully dragged several meters along the ground, leaving behind parallel lines etched into the earth from where he had stood. 
In response to Madara's attack, Kagatsuchi raised his hand and unleashed the devastating technique, Heido no. 88 Hiryujakazoku Shinjin Raiho, Flying Dragon Striking Heaven Shaking Thunder Cannon. The colossal beam compassed of lightning and immense spiritual pressure surged forth, obliterating everything in its path. Witnessing the destructive force unleashed, Madara realized that this attack was not an injutsu infused with chakra that he could absorb using his Rinnegan. He swiftly made the decision to defend himself. Firstly, Madara enveloped himself in the protective armor of Susanu, shielding himself from the imminent onslaught. Additionally, he employed the wood style. Tree Realm descends, summoning a formidable forest-like structure to further fortify his defenses, and offer additional protection against Kagatsuchi's attack. A massive 20-meter-wide gully was formed in the wake of the devastating attack unleashed by the flying dragon striking heaven-shaking thunder cannon. The formidable power of the technique annihilated all wooden walls and trees obstructing its path. Even half of Susanu, the protective entity, was demolished, yet it managed to shield Madara within. I must concede that you possess considerable strength, and the unique power you wield is indeed formidable," Madara acknowledged. With those words, he swiftly performed a hand seal, summoning forth an enormous embodiment of Susanu. However, this time, it surpassed its previous form, manifesting as a complete body of full-bodied Susanu, his might reached an entirely new level, particularly when channeled through the Rinnegan's influence, the height has reached whooping 300 meters. Kagatsuchi wasted no time, he swiftly exposed his bare upper body, his Hayori hanging open, revealing his physique. His cane transformed into a katana with a purple handle. Uttering the words, reduce all creation to ash, a cascade of fire engulfed the entire vicinity. Simultaneously, he unleashed his powerful Ryutsu. The combined aura released by both Madara and Kagatsuchi reverberated across the ninja world, catching the attention of cage-level individuals. Sensing such immense power, Mitsuo, Mido, and Hiruzen promptly departed from Konoha at full speed. On the battlefield, Kagasuchi appeared minuscule compared to Madara's colossal Susanu. However, the intensity of the flames emanating from Kagasuchi's body reached remarkable heights, almost matching the towering Susanu. As Madara initiated the attack, swinging his Susanu katana towards Kagatsuchi, the latter defended himself skillfully with his own katana. Despite his smaller stature, Kagatsuchi's attacks displayed unyielding strength. In fact, he nearly severed the Susanu katana with his own blade. Seizing the opportunity, Kagatsuchi swiftly traversed the vast hand of the Susanu. Leaving behind a deep gash, he closed the distance to the face of the Susanu, where Madara resided. Utilizing Shunpo, Kagatsuchi materialized before Madara, positioning himself directly in front of his face. The hand of the Susanu, still bearing the deep cut and engulfed in flames, erupted with a resounding boom, causing a powerful explosion. Simultaneously, Kagatsuchi unleashed a slashing attack, aiming for Madara within the Susanu. However, a massive remaining portion of the Susanu's hand, though partially severed, intercepted the strike, successfully defending Madara Chiha. As the third hand of the Susanu lunged at Kagatsuchi, he swiftly evaded the attack with nimble movements. Sensing the imminent danger, Madara conjured a lightning arrow. Anyone who could glimpse beneath his clothing would notice the black marks on his chest, evidence of his utilization of sage mode, with the face of Hashirama prominently displayed. Without hesitation, Madara launched the lightning arrow towards Kagatsuchi, catching him off guard. The arrow's incredible speed and piercing force struck Kagatsuchi's shoulder, leaving a wound. Despite his advanced age, being a Yuzumaki and possessing strong Ryutsu, the lightning arrow was unable to pass through his body. Kagatsuchi promptly removed the arrow from his shoulder and discarded it, throwing it towards the ground. Drawing upon his Yuzumaki heritage, Kagatsuchi's regenerative abilities came into play. The wound on his shoulder began healing rapidly. Simultaneously, the damaged hands of the Susanu started repairing themselves, restoring their previous state. Madara was taken aback by the minimal damage inflicted on Kagatsuchi, considering the arrow's potency, which was capable of piercing through his formidable Susanu. Kagatsuchi had managed to withstand the attack with little harm, without resorting to flashy or intricate maneuvers. Kagatsuchi raised his hand and started chanting, Limit of the Thousand's Hands, Respectful Hands, Unable to Touch the Darkness. Shooting Hands Unable to Reflect the Blue Sky. The road that basks in light, the wind that ignited the embers, time that gathers when both are together, there is no need to be hesitant, obey my orders. Light bullets, eight bodies, nine items, book of heaven, disease treasure, 
great wheel, great fortress tower. Aim far away, scatter brightly and cleanly when fired. Hado no point nine one senju koten taiho, thousand hand ink and dent heaven culling seer. As Kagatsuchi recited his incantation, nine radiant red lights materialized around him. With the completion of his chanting, the crimson light surged forward, converging upon the Susanoo in a devastating impact. A resounding boom reverberated through the battlefield, accompanied by a shockwave that extended across a vast distance. After a few tense moments, the once mighty Susanoo became visible, now in a state of near total destruction, on the brink of collapse. Madara, shrouded by white Zetsu, emerged into view, bearing severe injuries. However, thanks to the regenerative properties bestowed by his Hashirama cells, his wounds swiftly began to heal at an accelerated pace. His first priority was to restore the face of the Susanoo, providing a shield of protection. Additionally, he focused his efforts on repairing the damaged Susanoo, which teetered on the edge of stability, barely able to maintain its standing posture. Witnessing Madara's condition, Kagetsuchi swiftly closed the distance between them, intent on pressing his advantage. However, as he neared Madara, the Ichiha unleashed the powerful Shinra Tensei, a forceful repulsion that sent Kagetsuchi flying backward. Having recuperated from his injuries and with the Susanoo restored, Madara launched another assault against Kagetsuchi. Undeterred, Kagetsuchi retaliated with equal ferocity. They, both considered the most formidable individuals in the world, ignited the battlefield, marking the beginning of an intense battle. It has been four hours since Kagetsuchi and Madara Chuha started fighting, and the terrain within a 10km radius has been drastically altered, almost flattened. However, despite the intensity of the battle, these two fighters show no signs of exhaustion and continue to fight. The first person to arrive at the scene was the third Tsuchikage, Anoki, followed by Mido accompanied by Hiruzen and Mitsu. The third Reikage and the third Mizukage, along with the third Kazukiage, also joined them. They exchanged glances with one another, and then turned their attention towards the battlefield, beholding the immense Susanoo and the powerful aura emanating from it. Anoki, feeling both fear and awe, spoke up, is that person Madara Ichiha, and the other one is Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. He directed his gaze towards Mido for confirmation. Mido nodded in response to Anoki's question. The third Kazakiage expressed his disbelief, but how is this possible? Madara died in the Battle of the Valley of the End. Hiruzen, aware that he couldn't conceal the truth from the cages, revealed, Madara's body disappeared one day while Taburama sensei was conducting research on it. Anoki, filled with anger and fear, retorted, and you didn't bother to inform us about such a significant development. Hushing the heated conversation, Mido interjected, enough. Kanoha is not obligated to inform you of every detail. Now, the point is that Madara has been revived and is fighting, uncle. Her commanding voice silenced everyone, reminding them of her authority. The third Mizukage spoke up, acknowledging the gravity of the situation, what can we do? We cannot interfere in a battle of this magnitude. Each random blow they exchange is equivalent to the forbidden techniques of our respective villages. Yes they are on a whole other level. Said third Kazukiage. In the ongoing battle between Madara and Kagetsuchi, the two combatants had been engaged in a fight for over an hour. However, this confrontation was different from their usual encounters, as they had finally found someone capable of matching their strength. Both warriors were enjoying the thrill of the fight. Enough with the enjoyment. It's time to get serious, declared Madar. With those words, the formidable Jido statue materialized beside him, and his Susanoo enveloped the statue. Despite the reduction in height to 100 meters, Madara's Susanoo became even more powerful than before. Majestic attire. Susanoo witnessing this transformation, Kagetsuchi responded, as you wish. With a swift motion, he unleashed a massive fire sphere that engulfed Madara's Susanoo, Torch. The temperature within the fiery sphere was scorching, causing the outer layers of Madara's Susanoo to constantly burn. Despite his efforts to repair it using his chakra, even Madara found the unbearable heat challenging. He attempted to utilize the chakra absorption ability of the Jido statue, but to no avail. Undeterred, Madara deployed the Jido statue to release a dragon-shaped construct made of chakra. The ethereal dragon collided with the fiery wall, creating a sizable hole that allowed Madara to escape its grasp. As Madara emerged from the scorching fire sphere, his eyes met Kagetsuchi, who stood before him, a fearsome sight with his Ryujin Jaka ablaze. With an unwavering resolve, Kagetsuchi propelled himself forward, his flaming sword slashing through the air in a devastating strike known as the first. Killing Stroke. 
His incredible speed allowed him to effortlessly penetrate the defenses of Susanoo, leaving behind a deep six-foot gash on the imposing form of the Jido statue. Initially taken aback by the unexpected turn of events, Kagasuchi swiftly grasped the reality of the situation. As the husk of the mighty ten tails, the Jido statue's resilient defense was an unsurprising testament to his power and endurance. But with a resounding boom, the entire Jido statue became engulfed in flames, forcing Madara to abandon his Susanoo or risk being consumed by Kagasuchi's fiery onslaught. In a thunderous blast, the Jido statue vanished, rendering it useless for the remainder of the battle. Witnessing the statue's disappearance, Madara's countenance contorted with anger. He was left with only a few remaining tactics, some of which were costly, and would have little effect on Kagetsuchi. Determined, he unleashed the power of Jibaku Tensei, causing multiple black spheres to form around him. These spheres were launched towards Kagetsuchi, drawing everything in their vicinity towards them. Amidst the mounting pressure, Kagetsuchi refused to be outdone. Utilizing Inetsu Jigoku, Flames of Hell, he swiftly vanished from the spot, employing Shunpo to avoid harm, as the technique posed a threat even to himself. The surroundings transformed into a veritable cage, with six towering pillars of fire trapping Madara inside. Kagasuchi remained vigilant, carefully monitoring every move made by Madara to prevent his escape. Initially, Madara relied on Susanoo for protection, but he knew it was a temporary solution. Understanding the futility of attempting to overpower Kagetsuchi, given his immense power and proficiency in countering fire-based attacks, as well as his exceptional speed and strength that could withstand direct blows from Susanoo, Madara realized he had to make a swift exit. With a series of hand seals, both he and his Susanoo synchronized their movements, tearing open the sky to reveal a colossal meteor hurtling towards them. HMPH, do you think you can defeat me with such a move? scoffed Kagetsuchi, his disdain evident towards the massive celestial projectile. A pallid expression appeared on Madara's face, accompanied by a wry smile. Obviously not. Suddenly, Kagetsuchi's expression changed, as he attempted to defend against the impending strike. However, he was struck by an unforeseen force and sent hurtling through the air. Kagetsuchi, who was sent flying after being struck by an unknown force, was once again struck, propelling him towards the meteor hurtling from the sky. Another impact ensued, causing Kagetsuchi to cough up blood. The force of his trajectory intensified, hurtling him even faster towards the meteor. With a resounding boom, he collided with it, creating a massive impact crater. Struggling to recover, Kagetsuchi slowly stood up on the lower side of the fallen meteor. Suddenly, he raised a hand crackling with spiritual pressure, clutching onto something as if gripping someone's fist. Similarly, with his other hand, he mimicked the gesture, as though grasping the fist of another. Limbo technique, I had forgotten about this, Kagasuchi muttered, his face marked with gloom. Summoning his power, he conjured two flame pillars that encircled the limbo clones of Madara, effectively entrapping them. With swift determination, Kagasuchi leaped towards the ground. As he neared the Earth's surface, a tremendous surge of Ryutsu erupted from his body. Clenching both fists tightly, he let out a powerful shout, Haya. Then, employing Shunpo, he vanished from sight, reappearing to strike the meteor with a forceful double-fisted blow. A moment of silence hung in the air before the entire meteor cracked and disintegrated into fine dust. Sakatsu, double bone, even after the destruction of the meteor, two fire pillars formed from Kagetsuchi's immense Ryutsu, remained suspended in midair. This showcased the extent of Kagetsuchi's formidable control over Ryutsu. Gradually, the Limbo clones of Madara began to fade away, indicating a time limit to their existence. With a gentle descent, Kagetsuchi touched down on the ground and lifted his right hand. His Ryujin Jaka, his weapon, came soaring into his grasp. It slowly transformed from a katana into a wooden crutch. Simultaneously, his upper body garments materialized, and his white Hayori draped over his shoulders. All the cage-level powerhouses stood in awe, their gazes fixed on the sky, unable to comprehend the magnitude of what they had just witnessed. The colossal meteorite alone had the potential to obliterate their entire village, and Madara had harnessed its destructive power solely as a means to secure his escape. The shock of this realization gripped them. However, their astonishment reached new heights as they beheld Kagetsuchi, who defied all odds and demolished the meteorite with his sheer strength. This indelible image would forever be etched in their memories. Witnessing Kagetsuchi soaring through the air, initially resembling a performance, the onlookers soon recognized the truth as they witnessed his injuries. 
it became evident that he had not been feigning, but had genuinely been struck by an unknown force. Kagetsuchi stood there in silence, deep in contemplation, analyzing his encounter with Madara. Despite his own formidable power, he knew that killing Madara was no easy task, considering the numerous ways in which Madara could ensure his survival. Nonetheless, it was evident that Madara would not impede Kagetsuchi's plans. Nevertheless, Kagetsuchi understood the importance of remaining prepared. Uncle, are you alright? Mitsuo approached Kagetsuchi and inquired with concern. And Kagetsuchi responded with a nod. Anoki stepped forward and asked Kagetsuchi, did Madara Chiha manage to escape? Yes, he is undoubtedly powerful, and individuals like him often possess numerous means of escape, Kagetsuchi replied, acknowledging Madara's strength. Anoki, understanding the implications, nodded in agreement. But why would he target you? It doesn't make sense, voiced the third Kazakiage, clearly perplexed. After hiding for so long, why would he emerge from the shadows to engage in combat with someone he has no animosity towards? It's utterly bewildering. In a forest, there cannot be two lions, for their interests would clash and collide. The same holds true for individuals like me and him, Kagetsuchi calmly stated, his voice filled with contemplation. However, instead of a mere forest, this entire ninja world serves as our stage. Our paths inevitably intersect, and our conflicting ambitions and powers bring us into confrontation. He paused for a moment, reflecting on the complex dynamics of play. Madar and I may not have a personal animosity, but our roles as formidable figures in this world of shinobi necessitate a clash. It is the nature of power and influence, where only one can truly reign supreme. That is why he made his move against me, for our destinies intertwine, whether we seek it or not. As Kagetsuchi glanced towards the third rakage from the corner of his eyes, he spoke in a measured tone, contain your fighting spirit. Even if I am not at my peak, it is more than sufficient for me to defeat you. With those words, he unleashed his overwhelming Ryutsu, filling the atmosphere and leaving everyone present breathless. The sheer intensity of Kagetsuchi's released Ryutsu sent ripples of awe and apprehension through the gathered individuals. And do not fret, perhaps you all will have the honor of facing me in battle soon, Kagetsuchi cryptically remarked. A sense of bewilderment swept through the crowd as they exchanged puzzled glances. Kagetsuchi showed no intention of elaborating further, leaving them to speculate on his enigmatic statement. However, Mitsuo, perceiving the underlying meaning, comprehended Kagetsuchi's veiled message. Let us depart. Kashina should have awakened by now, Kagetsuchi declared. With that, he utilized Shunpo, disappearing from the scene. Following closely behind were Mido, Mitsuo, and Hiruzen, leaving the perplexed onlookers to contemplate the implications of Kagetsuchi's words. Before their departure, Hiruzen took a moment to engage in a conversation with the other cage present. Recognizing the importance of fostering strong relationships and upholding peace, he emphasized the need for unity and cooperation among their respective villages. The cages departed after Kagetsuchi, along with others who joined them. After three hours of travel, the third Reikage finally arrived at Kamagakur. Upon entering his office, he immediately noticed his son engaged in an argument with Mabui. You're the Reikage's assistant, and you don't even know where my father Reikage went. What kind of Reikage assistant are you? exclaimed. Now a 16-year-old Jonin in Kamagakur, A's hot-bloodedness was evident from the outset. In the midst of A's speech, he suddenly received a powerful punch to his face, sending him crashing into the wall. You fool. Do you even realize who you're speaking to? You're addressing the Rakage's assistant, and as a Jonin, this is how you should speak. Remember, you are just a contender for the Rakage position, not the Rakage himself, scolded the third Rakage. He then calmly took his seat and settled down. Did anything happen while I was away? The Rakage inquired of Mabui. Nothing major, just a small commotion since you left without any Anbu ninja or other accompanying ninjas, but it should be resolved now, Mabu replied. Hm, the Rakage mumbled in response, his mind lost in deep contemplation. Meanwhile, I managed to free himself from the wall, and stood up with a flushed face. I apologize. I was simply anxious upon witnessing my father leaving the village without any protection, I said, his gaze directed at Mabu. It's okay, I understand, Mabu reassured. Father, what happened that you left in such a hurry without taking a single ninja with you? I questioned. However, the Rakich remained silent, lost in his deep thoughts, leaving both A and Mabui bewildered. Father! exclaimed loudly, attempting to snap the Rakich out of his daze. Huh? What is it? The Rakich finally responded. What were you thinking about? 
I've never seen you like this before, inquired, expressing his confusion. Yeah, I'm also puzzled, added Mabui from the side. The rakage rose from his seat and walked toward the window of his office. He turned to face them and said, Have you ever witnessed gods engaging in combat? What? What are you talking about? Are you alright? Should I fetch a medical ninja? I asked, utterly perplexed by his father's unusual behavior. Have you heard of it Shahamidar? The rakage asked, ignoring his son's surprise and posing another question. Yes, he's known as the most powerful ninja, second only to the ninja god Senju Hashirama, I replied, and Mabui nodded in agreement. He is still alive, and not only that, he fought against the fire god Yuzumaki Kagesuchi, revealed the third rakage. What? Ichihamidara is still alive. But? Ai's words trailed off, shocked by the revelation. Yes, we all believed he was dead, but he has somehow survived. Not only that, he has grown even stronger than before. Based on reports from the battle, it seems he has surpassed his previous power, explained the rakage, recounting the details of the battle, and mentioning the appearance of both Kagetsuchi and Madar. Wait a minute, rakage. The way you described those eyes don't you remember whose eyes they are? Interjected Mabui. I have been racking my brain trying to remember where I've seen those eyes, the rakage admitted, turning back and looking at Mabui. They're the eyes of the Sage of Six Paths. How could you forget? Mabui exclaimed, holding her head in disbelief. You're right. How could I forget? But how in the world does Madara possess those eyes? The rakage was horrified, considering the immense power associated with the Sage of Six Paths, not to mention his eyes. Now is not the time to dwell on Madara. We should focus on Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi and what he mentioned before leaving. The fact that he wants the cages to face him can only mean one thing he is planning to attack other ninja villages, Mabui pointed out. A solemn expression settled on the rakage's face. Order our ninjas to monitor the movements of Yuzumaki village, he commanded. Similar discussions unfolded in the other villages, except for Konoha. Somewhere in the ninja world, within an underground base, a massive Jito statue loomed in silence. In this empty expanse, a persistent cough echoed, drawing attention to the bottom of the statue where Madara sat. He coughed continuously, his body bearing the wounds inflicted upon him during the battle with Kagetsuchi. Despite protecting himself with the aid of Susanoo against Kagetsuchi's final attack, Madara had still suffered injuries, primarily due to the intense heat of the fire. What kind of fire attack was that? It felt like standing before the sun itself, Madara remarked, still recovering from the intense heat. Madara Sama, as per your instructions, I have summoned back all the white Zetsus. Black Zetsu emerged from the ground and stood before Madara. Excellent. Now, implant curse marks on some of the white Zetsus. If they encounter Kagetsuchi, let them retreat if possible. If retreat is not an option, instruct them to self-detonate, commanded Madara. Yes, Madara Sama, responded Black Zetsu obediently. Furthermore, tomorrow it will become evident to the entire world that I am alive. Ensure that another piece of news spreads, indicating that the Yuzumaki clan is preparing to capture all the tailed beasts, Ichiha Madara declared. Well I won't personally interfere, I won't make it any easier for them to collect those tailed beasts either. It shall be done, Madara Sama, Black Zetsu replied before disappearing into the ground, utilizing the Mayfly technique. Where am I? Where is this place? Kashina's eyes fluttered open, filled with confusion as she struggled to recall her surroundings. Tsunade's face lit up with relief as she saw Kashina awakening. She approached her swiftly, providing support as she helped her sit down. You're finally awake. You have no idea the commotion that ensued when you fainted from your injury. Huh? Injured me. Kashina's voice carried confusion as she struggled to piece together the events. Gradually, her memory started to return, and she recalled the moment she had been injured, summoning her last reserves of strength to face the masked ninjas. Did you save me, Sister Tsunade? Kashina asked, her tone tinged with uncertainty, seeking confirmation of the person who had come to her rescue. No, I wasn't the one who saved you. It was your great-grandfather, Tsunade explained, her mind filled with memories of Kagetsuchi's powerful presence when he arrived in Kanoha. Grandpa. Where is he? I don't see him, Kashina inquired anxiously, her gaze scanning the room in search of her beloved grandparents. He left Kanoha for some reason, Tsunade replied. Left Kanoha, but why? Kashina inquired, her voice filled with curiosity and concern. We don't know the exact reason. He simply ordered your grandfather to apprehend the culprit who attacked you and departed hastily, Tsunade explained, her expression reflecting her own puzzlement. Who is the culprit? 
Kashina asked, her tone now tinged with anger as she processed Sunaid's words. It was Danzo, the leader of Root, from our own village, Sunaid revealed, her voice carrying a mix of disappointment and frustration at the actions of their own village's elder. The same guy whose hands were cut off by my grandpa years ago. Kashina questioned, seeking confirmation that the culprit and the person from her grandfather's past were indeed one and the same. Sunaid nodded solemnly in response, affirming Kashina's assumption. How dare he? Doesn't he realize who my grandpa is? Kashina exclaimed, her disbelief and indignation evident in her voice. I've told you many times that a human doesn't need much in life, but hope. Hope that they can perform their tasks flawlessly. He had that hope, knowing that there might be a chance to seek revenge on me. That's why he attacked you and almost succeeded, said Kagatsuchi, who stood at the room's entrance. Behind him, Mido, Mitsuo, and Hiruzen followed closely. Upon seeing Kagatsuchi, Tsunade stepped aside to allow him to speak with Kashina. Grandpa. Kashina attempted to sit up straight, but her injuries hindered her movement. No need to force herself. Lie down, Kagatsuchi gently advised, allowing Kashina to rest. You disappointed me. Said Kagatsuchi with disappointment on his face. Sorry Grandpa. I have disappointed you. I should have emerged victorious in that battle, Kashina expressed remorsefully. I am disappointed in you, but not because of the battle. In the battle, you performed splendidly. However, you have disappointed me with your behavior within Kanoha. Why did you contradict a Hokage while standing in his village? Do you possess the strength to escape from or overpower everyone in Kanoha? No, you do not. Furthermore, you killed the Genin team of Kanoha. While I understand and may even agree with your reasons, the question remains. Do you possess the strength to fight against Kanoha? Again, the answer is no. So, what gave you the audacity to take such actions? It was my strength, Kagatsuchi reprimanded Kashina, his tone stern. Continuing his lecture, Kagatsuchi added, I have repeatedly emphasized to you and the Yuzumaki family, that you should not rely on my name and strength to achieve your own goals. Instead, build your own power and strength to accomplish them. I am merely your support. However, if there is ever any injustice, then I will intervene. After all, we are connected by blood. Sorry Grandpa. I will remember this and never repeat my mistakes, Kashina conveyed with a sincere expression on her face. Kagatsuchi nodded approvingly and responded, rest well. We will depart tomorrow morning. Leaving the room, Kagatsuchi's expression turned cold as he directed his gaze towards Hiruzen. His voice held a stern tone as he questioned, why is Danzo still alive? Hiruzen, drenched in cold sweat, responded, his actions were indeed heinous. As the Hokage, it is my duty to ensure he faces a trial before the village, and is punished accordingly. Is that so? Or were you hoping that I would perish while your comrade would be spared? Kagatsuchi retorted, his voice filled with a cold, accusatory tone. No, not at all. What I said was the genuine reason, Hiruzen replied, hastily wiping the sweat from his face. I have a purpose for keeping you alive. Otherwise, I would have eliminated you alongside him, Kagatsuchi declared with an icy tone, exerting pressure on Hiruzen. He continued, commanding, go and fetch Danzo here. I will bring Danzo here immediately, Hiruzen affirmed, and swiftly departed. Once Hiruzen left, he made his way to his office. To his surprise, both of his friends, Kaharu and Himera, were seated there alongside Sakumo. They had received news of Hiruzen's return, and Danzo was also present, urged by Kaharu and Himera to be present. Sakumo, on the other hand, had been hesitant to allow Danzo to leave prison. What happened, Hiruzen? Was there no clash between Kagatsuchi and Madara? How is it possible for him to return alive? Danzo bombarded Hiruzen with a flurry of questions as soon as he entered the office. Enough. At your level, you should be able to comprehend the magnitude of the battle, Hiruzen snapped back, his voice filled with anger. Hiruzen was right as a cage-level powerhouse he sensed two huge chakra pressures colliding, are you saying Kagatsuchi defeated Madara? Danzo asked, his expression filled with disbelief. Not only Madara lost, but he had to flee to save his own life, Hiruzen responded. After the anger subsided, Hiruzen's face returned to a state of calm. He continued, I warned you before, Danzo, but you didn't listen. Now you know what awaits you, so, don't worry, Hiruzen. Everything I did was for the sake of Kanoha, and I have no regrets. However, I have one last request for you. Rather than being punished according to village rules, I ask that you take me to Kagatsuchi, Danzo said, making his plea. Hiruzen was taken aback by Danzo's proposal, 
But since Kagetsuchi had instructed him to bring Danzo, he didn't hesitate. He agreed and, followed by Sakumo, Kaheru, and Himura, he led Danzo towards Kagetsuchi. Inside the Senju clan compound, Kagetsuchi was sitting on a chair with his eyes closed, holding his crutch with both hands. At that moment, Hiruzen arrived with Danzo and others, standing in front of Kagetsuchi. Kagetsuchi slowly opened his eyes and looked at Danzo. With a calm expression, he said, You know, I made a mistake. I should have killed you that day. My only reason for sparing you was your ambition for the Hokage position. You were willing to go to any lengths and eliminate any competitors from your own village, which would weaken Kanoha. However, after I cut off your hands, it became apparent that seeking revenge on the Yuzumaki clan and me became your top priority. Becoming Hokage became secondary, and even if you had achieved that title, you would have still sought to exact revenge on me or my family in some way. Danzo started walking in Kagetsuchi's direction and spoke, you are right. The day you cut off my hands and compared our small families to mere dogs in comparison to your large family, I felt incredibly humiliated. You big clans are born with good bloodlines, and at least a few of you have the capability to become as strong as cage level shinobi. You are rich with numerous ninjutsu creations, thanks to your talents. And what are we? We, the small clans, work tirelessly day and night. One day, you big clans will toss ninjutsu at us as if throwing bones to your dogs. That's the kind of humiliation my father and even my grandfather experience because of this disparity. That's why I hate big clans and will do anything to completely eradicate them. First, it was the turn of your Yuzumaki family, then it would have been the Senju clan, and finally, it would have been the Ichiha family. But all of this didn't happen solely because of you. The way you humiliated me made me understand how my father must have felt during those days. Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, I have only one regret. That day when my root ninjas ambushed your granddaughter, I should have been there. At least then, I could have killed her with my own hands, said Danzo with a smirk. Hearing this, Kagetsuchi stood up, and his Ryutsu reached its peak. Danzo, who was standing straight, bent in half, and Kagetsuchi's face turned completely cold, void of any expression. Haha, <laughs> Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, no matter how powerful you may be, you can't escape this. Come, let's die together. Hahaha. <laughs> With madness on his face, Danzo laughed loudly and tore his upper body clothes, revealing the reverse four symbol ceiling. Hirzen, my friend, this is the last thing I'll do for Kanoha, said Danzo, prepared to die alongside Kagetsuchi. The Kudo number 73, to Zancho. Kagetsuchi raised his finger towards Danzo, and a point of light formed, creating an inverted pyramid around Danzo as its center, trapping him inside. However, all the black blood coming out of Danzo's body, remained trapped within the pyramid, rendering Danzo's movements completely useless. Your courage is commendable, but you don't have the strength to back it up. What you said is correct, but it's a reflection of human nature. I will let you die in peace, but first, let me ask you. What was your clan's attitude towards the civilians? Did your clan treat them as friends or merely tools for your use, as you mentioned earlier, or did you treat them as dogs? If you treated them the way you were treated, then you have no right to question me or any other big family. You know, when I was young, I never treated anyone from smaller families like dogs. Instead, I treated them as subordinates and showed them care to demonstrate modesty towards my subordinates. I even stopped my father and elders from mistreating them. Later, my father sent me to observe how ninjas from smaller families behave towards civilians. I witnessed those ninjas treating them like maggots, committing various atrocities against the weak civilians. From that point on, all small families became like dogs to me, and I kept them on a leash to prevent them from harming civilians. I did my best to avoid killing any civilians. So, people like you have no right to pass judgment. I am well aware of how your Shimura clan operated," said Kagetsuchi. Finally, a huge black sphere formed inside the inverted prison, but it was unable to break free from its confines. After a few minutes, the effect of Danzo's move dissipated, and his lifeless body fell to the ground. Hiruzen approached and stood in front of Danzo's body, wearing a sorrowful expression and tears in his eyes. Despite the unfavorable actions Danzo had taken against the village, he had also paved a clear path for Hiruzen, and ensured the stability of his hookage position. In a true sense, Danzo was his best friend. Danzo's other friends also shed tears at his passing, as they had spent a considerable amount of time with him, and had undertaken numerous missions together. Kagetsuchi left them to mourn and retire to rest, having spent the entire day traveling and fighting. 
After Kagasuchi left, Mido and Mitsuo also left. After hearing Danzo's statement, they controlled themselves and refrained from doing anything excessive, otherwise, Danzo's corpse wouldn't even be here. Only Hiruzen and his friends remained. He looked towards Sakumo and said, go and arrange for Danzo's funeral. Inform all the clan heads about this, and also inform the Shimura clan. Sakumo nodded upon hearing Hiruzen's words and left to make the necessary arrangements. Soon, the entire Kanoha ninjas became aware of what had happened inside the Senju clan, and learned the reason why Danzo was killed. Recalling the dominance displayed by Kagetsuchi a few years ago, and Danzo's attempt to kill Kagetsuchi's granddaughter, it was clear that seeking one's own death was equivalent to such actions. A few big clan heads were already aware of the reason, so they didn't react as surprise, since they had already anticipated it happening when Kagetsuchi was involved. However, where Kagasuchi had hurriedly gone after arriving to Kanoha still remained a mystery to them. After an hour, a few Jonin and clan heads gathered for Danzo's funeral. Although his actions were controversial, Danzo was not a nobody. He hadn't been declared a rebel, and had served as the previous head of Root and a member of the Kanoha Council. Therefore, it was necessary for the clan heads to attend his funeral. The ceremony itself embodied a sense of simplicity, devoid of any elaborate pronouncements or grandeur. Yet, within the hearts of those in attendance, a myriad of emotions welled up, encompassing sorrow, reflection, and, indeed, mourning. However, the true extent of each individual's genuine lamentation for Danzo remained a matter of intrigue, concealed within the depths of their own thoughts and sentiments. The following morning, Kagetsuchi was prepared to depart and awaited the arrival of Kashina and the others. In that moment, Mido approached Kagetsuchi and expressed her concern, saying, Uncle, are you feeling well? After yesterday's battle, you must be tired. Why not take a few days to rest before leaving? I am fine, Kagasuchi responded. The fight with Madara was yesterday, and a night of rest is more than sufficient for me. Besides, I cannot afford to delay. I have personal plans to set in motion, and there is a possibility that certain information may have been leaked by someone. Thus, I must act swiftly. Mido nodded upon hearing Kagetsuchi's words and responded, Mitsuo has informed me about your plans, and honestly, I share the disappointment in the decisions made by Taburama and Hashirama. I am wary of this existence and fully prepared to depart without any regrets. I do not seek your sacrifice or anyone else's, Kagetsuchi clarified. As I have mentioned before, I will never sacrifice a member of my own family to achieve my goals. He continued, furthermore, you are not aware that it is not always the case that a Jinchuriki dies after the tailed beast is extracted from them. I have discovered a way to prevent the death of the Jinchuriki once the extraction takes place. At that moment, Kashina arrived alongside Mitsuo, Yuzumaki Hiroshi, and Yuzumaki Sakura. Observing that everyone was prepared, Kagetsuchi nodded in their direction and uttered, Now that everyone is ready, let us depart. After bidding their farewells, Kagetsuchi departed with Kashina and the rest, and Mido accompanied them until the gate of Kanoha village. Take care Grandma Mido. If all goes well, we will meet again soon, Kashina expressed while embracing Mido. Of course, you take care too, Mido replied affectionately. Afterward, Kagetsuchi and the others departed. At that moment, Hiruzen was reading the information in his hands with a solemn expression on his face, reflecting his seriousness. A few minutes earlier, as he was getting ready to bid farewell to Kagetsuchi as a gesture of goodwill, an Anbu ninja hurriedly approached him. What's the matter? Why are you in such a rush? Hiruzen inquired. Hokage-sama, please read this information. It will become clear, replied the Anbu ninja. I will read it later. Right now, I have an important matter to attend to, Hiruzen responded. You must read this, Hokage-sama. After reading the message, you will understand. It was sent by someone who identified himself as a messenger of Madara Chiha, the Anbu stated, nervously swallowing. If it were any ordinary information, Hiruzen would have disregarded it and prioritized seeing Kagetsuchi off. However, upon hearing that the message was sent by Chiha Madar, he had to take it seriously. He promptly took the scroll and, as he read it, he was shocked. The information revealed that the Yuzumaki clan, specifically Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi, was preparing to capture all the tailed beasts, and had made the necessary preparations. Now the pieces are falling into place. This must be the reason why Madara and Kagetsuchi fought. Madara must have desired the tailed beasts for his own use, but upon realizing that Kagetsuchi was also preparing to do the same, he was compelled to take action after years of hiding, Hiruzen said, coming to a realization. 
Pierzin wasn't the only one who received this information. All the other cage also received the same news, and came to the same conclusion as Hirzin. The wreckage, too, now understood the true meaning behind this statement. Perhaps you will have the honor of fighting me soon. Go and call all the clan heads for an urgent meeting. This matter needs to be discussed thoroughly, and some facts have to be presented before all the ninjas. Hirzin ordered the Ambu Ninja. The Anbu Ninja, utilizing the body flicker technique, disappeared from the Hokage's office to convey the message for the emergency meeting. Within half an hour, every Jonin was present at the Chunin exam venue. As usual, Hirazan didn't arrive last, in fact, he was already present before anyone else even arrived. This caused considerable confusion among the Jonins, wondering what had made the Hokage so serious. Hirazan, what has happened that you called for an emergency meeting? Asked Kahir. You will find out once the meeting begins, said Hirzen. Today, I'm sure you are all quite perplexed as to why I have called for this emergency meeting. However, the matter at hand is incredibly serious and demands the utmost caution, explained Hirzen. Some of the sensory ninjas should have detected a significant chakra fluctuation originating from the Earth country. You might have assumed that this fluctuation was a result of a tail beast conflict. However, it was caused by a clash between Madara Chiha and Kagetsuchi Uzumaki, clarified Hirazan. Just as Hirazan's voice trailed off, the Jonins below began muttering and engaging in discussions amongst themselves. They posed basic questions, such as how this could be possible, and whether Madara Chiha wasn't already deceased. Numerous queries of this nature filled the air. In the midst of this, the clan head of the Chiha clan stood up and exclaimed in astonishment, What? How is this possible? He died decades ago at the hands of the first Hokage, Senju Hashirama. That battle was witnessed personally by me, as well as all the other cage of the major villages. We observed the fierce confrontation between Madara Chiha and Kagetsuchi Uzumaki, and the outcome of the battle was the defeat of Madara Chiha. However, he managed to escape from the battlefield, explained Hiruzen. But how is this possible? Said the clan head of Ichiha. For now, I am not inclined to delve into further details. The specifics of the battle will be shared with all the Jonin, so that we can be prepared for any future encounters. Just be aware that Madara is indeed alive, and this has been confirmed, clarified Hiruzen. While the initial information I provided is significant, it alone doesn't warrant an emergency meeting. The second piece of information that I received just an hour ago is far more alarming and demands our immediate attention, added Hiruzen. Upon hearing Hiruzen's words, the Jonin and everyone present were utterly bewildered. They were at a loss for words and couldn't fathom what the second information could entail. The second piece of information is that Kagetsuchi Uzumaki is plotting an attack on every major village, with the intention of capturing the tailed beasts. This information was conveyed by Madara Chiha himself, disclosed Hiruzen. Hiruzen, what are you talking about? Are you implying that the information you received came from Madara Chiha, and you chose to believe it? Questioned Humer. Yes, we cannot simply believe the information sent by Madara Chiha and assume it to be correct, stated Kahir. Hiruzen raised his hand, silencing others, and continued, Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have believed this news either. However, consider this. Madara, who has been in hiding for many years, suddenly emerges and risks exposing himself to engage in a battle with Kagetsuchi, ultimately killing him. Why would he take such a significant risk? According to my theory, it is likely that Madara received information about Kagasuchi's plan to capture all the tailed beasts. Perhaps Madara's own goal was also to capture the tailed beasts, and therefore, he sought to eliminate Kagasuchi as an obstacle. Upon hearing Hiruzen's words and his reasoning, every Jonin fell silent, deep in thought. Each Jonin arrived at the same plausible conclusion put forth by Hiruzen. When everyone was engrossed in discussion and deep in thought, Nara Shinichi, the clan head of the Nara clan, stood up and declared, I agree with Hokage-sama's theory. There can be no better explanation for this. Hokage-sama, what should be our next course of action? Inquired Shinichi. I would offer any preliminary remarks. Once all of you have reviewed the battle details of Kagetsuchi Uzumaki and Madara Chiha, we can then proceed with further discussions, replied Hiruzen, his expression filled with uncertainty. Alright, after you have all examined the battle details, we will reconvene for another meeting at noon, announced Hiruzen, concluding the gathering. Such meetings took place throughout the ninja world. Even small ninja villages like the Rain Village, received news of Madara being alive, as Hanzo was present during the battle. 
However, upon witnessing the arrival of the five cage from the major villages, Hanzo chose not to make an appearance. He decided to abandon the idea of attacking Kanoha for the time being, and instead observe how events unfolded in the ninja world. Meanwhile, the major villages commenced discussions on countermeasures for the impending attack by Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. In the evening, a short distance away from the Yuzumaki country, an army of red-haired Yuzumaki clan members could be seen swiftly advancing. They were led by Fuso, heading towards Kanoha. Suddenly, Fuso felt a signal and promptly instructed everyone to halt. Those with keen sensory abilities understood the signal, while those without such abilities were left confused but complied nonetheless. Finally, Kagetsuchi and others came into view. Fuso moved forward and greeted, Grand Uncle, it's good to see you and father well. When you left in such a rush, I thought something had happened to Kashina that necessitated your immediate departure. Hmm, everything is fine now. But why do you have an army with you? Questioned Kagetsuchi. I thought you might need assistance, so I gathered the army to support you, replied Fuso. No need for that. Return to the Yuzumaki country, and we will discuss things further there, stated Kagetsuchi. Fuso nodded and issued the order for the army to return to the Yuzumaki village. Finally, it has been a span of two hours since Kagetsuchi's return. Within this time frame, news of the events in Kano has swiftly circulated, reaching the ears of everyone. They became aware of the intense battle between Kagetsuchi and Madara Chiha, which significantly altered the perception of the Yuzumaki clan members regarding Kagetsuchi's strength. Although they already recognized his power, they never anticipated his victory over Madara Chiha, who had been renowned as the sole contender capable of challenging Hashirama in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Mitsuo's account shed light on the situation, indicating that Madara had further amplified his abilities, potentially surpassing even the formidable Hashirama Senju in his prime. In the meeting room, Kagetsuchi sat in the main seat, with Fuso and Mitsuo beside him. The remaining attendees consisted of both new and older elders, the latter having devoted themselves primarily to the development of sealing tools. Now that everyone is gathered, we will discuss a few crucial matters pertaining to our plan's advancement, Kagetsuchi began. Firstly, regarding the sealing tools that I had requested you all to research and create, how is the progress? One of the older elders spoke up, saying, it has been completed and can be used to seal the tailed beast without any issues. Good, Kagetsuchi nodded in approval. Now, what is the status of our army? How much progress have they made in their training? Kagetsuchi inquired. Fuso, who was seated beside Kagetsuchi, responded, We have an army consisting of 3,500 ninjas, out of which 400 are Yuzumaki clan members. The rest are civilians who have been trained to work for us. Among these 400 Yuzumaki clan ninjas, only 120 individuals are capable of utilizing the fire secret technique. Hmm, that is also commendable. It is a source of pride to have 120 individuals who have mastered the fire secret technique, along with the accomplishment of training such a large number of ninjas. Kagasuchi praised the Yuzumaki clan members who had mastered the fire secret technique, and expressed his appreciation for their efforts in training the vast number of ninjas. Everyone had smiles on their faces after receiving praise from Kagasuchi. Although it is more than enough for me alone to single-handedly defeat and capture every village and tailed beast, doing so would undermine the power and battle experience of our trained ninjas. As you know, battle experience holds great significance for a ninja. Therefore, I am assigning you the task of capturing the Seven Tails, Kagasuchi declared. The Seven Tails is currently under the control of Takigakur, which is the only small village aside from the major ones to possess a tailed beast, Fuso explained. Correct. I want you to capture the Seven Tails and bring it to the Yuzumaki country, Kagasuchi affirmed. What about the others? Mitsuo inquired. I will handle the rest, Kagasuchi stated. But going alone doesn't seem like a good idea. I will accompany you, Mitsuo offered. I'll be blunt, Mitsuo. If you were to follow me, you would only hinder my progress. I am more than capable of handling this task on my own, Kagatsuchi responded. Although Kagatsuchi's words may have seemed harsh, they held truth. Understanding this, Mitsuo replied, I understand, uncle. Very well. The day after tomorrow will mark the beginning of our plan, Kagetsuchi announced. Everyone in the room nodded, wearing solemn and serious expressions. While Takigakur posed no threat to their cage-level ninjas like Mitsuo and Fuso, the main challenge lay in minimizing casualties among the lower-ranking members of the army, such as the Genin and Chunin. 
After the conclusion of the meeting, everyone left the room, except for Kagetsuchi, Fuso, and Mitsuo. However, before they could depart, Kashina entered the room and expressed her desire to participate in the upcoming war. Grandpa, I also want to be part of the upcoming war, she said. Why? Kagetsuchi questioned. I am aware of my weaknesses. Despite my rigorous training and ability to defeat anyone below the rank of elite jonin, I have never faced a truly life-threatening battle, except for the encounter with the root ninjas. That experience made me even stronger, and I believe I can surpass my previous self, explained Kashina. That's a valuable realization. You will indeed participate in the war, and if any unexpected situations arise, I will be there to support you if needed, Kagetsuchi assured her. After discussing a few matters and sharing recent experiences, everyone departed to their respective homes. At the same time, inside Kamagakur, Nabui entered the Reikage's office and said, Reikage, I have brought a messenger from Awagakur to meet with you. With that, the messenger from Awagakur entered the Reikage's office. Greetings, Reikage-sama. My name is Daichi, and I am here on behalf of the Tsuchikich with a message, Daichi introduced himself. Go ahead, said the Reikage. Tsuchikich acknowledges the formidable power of Kagetsuchi, and recognizes that defeating him is nearly impossible. Therefore, he suggests that we form an alliance and face Kagetsuchi together. To discuss this matter further, the Tsuchikich has called for a five-cage meeting, and extended an invitation to you, Daichi explained, while presenting the Reikich with an official scroll containing the invitation. The Reikich turned his gaze towards Mabui, his eyes filled with anticipation, and he calmly asked, What are your thoughts on this matter? Mabui, taking a moment to gather her words, replied, The sentiments expressed by the Tsuchikich resonate with the minds of every cage from the major villages. Therefore, it is crucial that we engage in a comprehensive discussion to devise a strategy to combat Kagetsuchi, and safeguard our precious tailed beasts from falling into his clutches. The Reikich, visibly acknowledging the gravity of the situation, nodded approvingly. His gaze then shifted towards Daichi, and with a firm tone, he inquired, Very well, I will make it a point to attend this cage meeting. However, could you enlighten me on the proposed schedule for this gathering? Daichi, fully aware of the urgency surrounding the issue at hand, responded promptly, Given the unpredictable nature of Kagetsuchi's potential attacks, the Tsuchikich emphasized the need for expediency. He suggested that convening the meeting as early as tomorrow, would be the most prudent course of action. A pensive expression crossed the Reikage's face as he mulled over Daichi's words. After a brief moment, he spoke decisively, understood. We shall indeed hold the meeting tomorrow as suggested. Expressing his gratitude, Daichi bowed respectfully and said, Thank you, Reikage sama With your permission, I would like to request leave. Granting the request with a nod, the Reikage bid Daichi farewell, and the latter left the Reikage's office to attend to his other responsibilities. Meanwhile, news of the impending meeting reached Kanoha, prompting Hirazin to make the decision to participate. The invitations extended by Wagakur had been dispatched to all the major villages, aiming for a unified front against the threat of Kagetsuchi. Although Noki had initially entertained the idea of inviting Hanzo as well, the Iron Country vehemently opposed it, citing their long-standing animosity with the Megakur and specifically Hanzo. Consequently, Anoki relented and restricted the invitations to the five major villages alone, ensuring a focused gathering of key leaders. On one hand, as every cage from the major villages made their way towards the Iron Country for the five-cage meeting, preparations for battle were underway in the Yuzumaki village. Kagetsuchi himself was present, observing the military preparations, and the Yuzumaki ninjas greeted him respectfully from time to time, receiving nods of acknowledgement in return. Amidst this, a ninja approached Fuso and whispered something in his ear. Fuso's expression changed immediately, prompting him to rush over to Kagetsuchi. He addressed him urgently, Grand Uncle, there is news from Konoha, or rather, news from all the major villages. Curious, Kagetsuchi asked with interest, hmm, what kind of news? I'm quite eager to know what's happening in the major villages, especially since they have discovered my plans to capture all the tailed beasts. I'm confident that Madara has ensured this news spreads. Fuso replied, your prediction was correct. The major villages have indeed received news that you are planning to capture all the tailed beasts, and interestingly, Madara himself sent the message. As a result, the major villages have concluded that the conflict between you and Madara revolves around the tailed beasts. Kagetsuchi nodded, acknowledging the accuracy of his guess, and inquired further, hmm, anything else? 
Fuso continued, the major villages have decided to convene a five-cage meeting, and it is likely to take place today. Kagasuchi's eyebrows arched in surprise, and he remarked, Shinobi allied forces against me, eh? The thought brought a chuckle to his lips, reminiscent of the scenario that unfolded when Madara was resurrected. Fuso, what does this mean to you? Asked Kagasuchi. It means that the major villages would attack us before you can attack them, and if they bring the fight here, it will affect your mentality. You will be conservative while attacking them because you will have to think of the safety of the Yuzumaki people, said Fuso. By this time, Kashina and Mitsuo also arrived and heard Fuso's words. They nodded, agreeing with Fuso's statement. You are right. But ultimately, it comes down to them declaring war on me, said Kagasuchi. Then he turned towards Kashina and said, what do you think? How will an elephant feel, react, and be when challenged by an ant? Kashina pondered for a moment and said, the elephant will show disdain towards the ant at first, but it will also feel humiliated that an ant dares to challenge him. Exactly. How dare they declare war on me? Only I have the right to declare war on them, said Kagasuchi. It seems that I will have to go there uninvited. Where did you say the meeting is being held? Said Kagasuchi. It will take place in the neutral country, the iron country, replied Fuso. Hm, get ready and win this battle. Don't let me down, said Kagasuchi. Fuso nodded and went to the high platform from where he could see the members. Addressing them, he said, You all have trained very hard and have received resources thanks to our elder Yuzumaki Kagasuchi. Now is the time for us to show him that the resources he gave us were not wasted, but were invested in a good place. So, tell me, are you all willing to give your all to make our Yuzumaki country stronger than ever before? Yes, we are willing to give our lives to make our country stronger, everyone replied in unison. Fuso nodded at this and, after getting permission from Kagatsuchi to depart, they left. Finally, the army from the Yuzumaki country departed. This was seen by spies from different major villages, who also left in a hurry. Although they were noticed by the Yuzumaki family members, they were left alive on purpose, due to an unwritten rule between the major villages. If they killed the spies from the other major villages, their own spies would also be killed by those major villages. In the tranquil evening, inside the majestic main building of the Iron Country, where the highly anticipated meeting was to take place, the third Tsuchikage, Anoki, was comfortably seated in the meeting room, patiently awaiting the arrival of the other esteemed cages. Behind the thick regal curtains that adorned the meeting room, the imposing figure of Rashi, the four-tailed Jinchuriki, stood as a formidable guardian alongside Katsuchi, Anoki's loyal son, who had assumed the duty of protecting his revered father. Their presence added an air of strength and vigilance to the room. Similarly, concealed behind the velvety curtain behind the third Kazakiage, stood Pekura and Rasa, two trusted individuals entrusted with the vital task of safeguarding the Kazakiage. Their watchful eyes surveyed the surroundings, ever ready to spring into action should any threat arise. Just as the atmosphere brimmed with anticipation, the entrance of Hokage Hiraz in Saratobi, brought a sense of importance and authority. Accompanied by his dedicated guards, Sakumo Haddock and Arachimaru, Hiraz and exchanged nods of acknowledgement with the assembled leaders. Sakumo and Rachimaru discreetly positioned themselves behind the curtain, providing an additional layer of protection to their revered leader. Following in swift succession, the Mizukage made his grand entrance, flanked by two lead members of the renowned Seven Swordsmen. Taking his rightful place among the esteemed gathering, the Mizukage gracefully settled into his seat, while the Swordsmen gracefully retreated behind the cascading curtains, vanishing like ethereal shadows. Last but not least, the Rekage made a commanding entrance, accompanied by his trusted guards, including his indomitable son A and his efficient secretary Mabu. Displaying unwavering unity, the Rekage and his entourage assumed their designated positions, with the guards silently taking their positions behind him, poised and alert. As the five cages found their seats, the room took on a symmetrical elegance, forming a harmonious U-shaped arrangement. Seated in the midst of this distinguished assembly was the General of the Iron Country, radiating an aura of authority and purpose. Flanking him were his two steadfast guards, who stood tall and unwavering, prepared to defend their leader at all costs. Breaking the hushed silence, the general of the Iron Country rose from his seat, his voice resonating with confidence and respect. I extend my warmest welcome to each and every one of you, esteemed guests, to this auspicious five-cage summit. The purpose of convening this momentous gathering is twofold. To deliberate on a comprehensive strategy for protecting the tailed beasts from falling into the clutches of Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi, the formidable fire god. 
and to engage in profound discussions concerning the strengthening of our sacred alliance. With these words, the stage was set for a crucial exchange of ideas and strategies that would shape the fate of the shinobi world as the leaders of the five great nations prepared to navigate the treacherous path ahead. Anoki cleared his throat, drawing the attention of the room, and said with conviction, This five hookage summit was called by me, and the reason, as you all know, is that based on the information we receive, it has become abundantly clear that Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi is meticulously planning to capture the formidable tailed beast, for his own nefarious purposes. Allow me to be brutally honest. If Kagetsuchi were to launch an attack on Uwagakur, solely to acquire the tailed beast, the sheer magnitude of destruction it would inflict upon our village would be catastrophic, leaving little chance for survival. With a scowl etched across his face, Rakich retorted disdainfully, HMPH. Since when did you become such a spineless coward, Anoki? Fueled by anger, Anoki's voice reverberated throughout the room as he shot back, who are you calling a coward? It's as if you conveniently forgot about the momentous battle between Kagetsuchi and Madar. That fight transcended anything we have ever witnessed before, pushing the boundaries of power and resilience. And let us not forget, you lack the audacity to even confront Kagetsuchi, who valiantly clashed with Madara for an extended period, even though he wasn't at the pinnacle of his strength. Yet, here you stand, labeling me a coward. Standing upright on his seat, his voice dripping with intensity, Anoki continued, I am well aware that my ability to overcome Kagetsuchi's might relies heavily on his momentary vulnerability, allowing me to unleash my particle style. It is only through exploiting such an opening that I stand a chance against him. Looking around the room, Anoki proposed, therefore, I propose that we consolidate our forces, pulling our collective strength and resources, and confront Kagetsuchi as a united front. Only by combining our might can we hope to withstand his onslaught and emerge victorious. What say you, esteemed Hokage? I wholeheartedly agree with the Tsuchikage's perspective. It is only through the unification of our individual strengths that we can harbor even the slightest hope of effectively combating Kagetsuchi Uzumaki. Moreover, it is our Kanoha village that has bored the brunt of his malice the most, intensified the urgency of our collective response. Therefore, I firmly support this proposition, and am clearly prepared to stand shoulder to shoulder in battle, voiced Hiruzen, his conviction resonating in his words. Though I must confess my personal dislike to the notion of fighting alongside others, I recognize the stark reality that this represents our sole opportunity to safeguard our village, and the precious Jinchuriki within it, conceded the third Drakage, his sentiments tinged with reluctance. In light of the danger looming over us like a sword poised to strike, I concur with my esteemed counterparts that it is crucial, at least for the time being, to set aside our inherent differences and laser focus our collective energies on neutralizing the imminent threat named Kagetsuchi, affirmed the third Kazakiage, his voice echoing with the weight of responsibility. As an eyewitness to the calamity that transpired, I wholeheartedly align myself with this consensus. Our shared objective is to forge a united front against our common adversary, leaving us with no alternative but to join forces and courageously withstand whatever trials may lie ahead, Third Mizukich declared, his words carrying an air of unwavering determination. At that precise moment, when every individual present was enthusiastically voicing their agreement, an unexpected occurrence unfolded within the confines of the meeting, room an unprecedented space rift materialized before their eyes. Witnessing this extraordinary phenomenon, Hiruzen swiftly rose from his seat, while Sakumo and Arachimaru positioned themselves protectively in front of him. Simultaneously, the guards representing various villages assumed their positions, steadfastly prepared to defend their respective cages against any potential threats that might arise. This is indeed a grave situation, expressed Hiruzen, his tone laced with concern. Puzzled by the gravity of the situation, Enoki inquired, What do you mean, Hokage? With a measured voice, Hiruzen uttered a name that sent shivers down the spines of all who heard it, Kagetsuchi Uzumaki. The mere mention of Kagetsuchi's name elicited a chilling response from the assembled individuals, prompting a tangible sense of trepidation to pervade the atmosphere. Each person stood ready, their nerves tightly wound, prepared to defend themselves at a moment's notice. Finally, the enigmatic figure of Kagetsuchi emerged from the mystical breach in space, moving deliberately and purposefully towards the seat occupied by the General of the Iron Country. As Kagetsuchi locked eyes with the General, an overwhelming wave of fear washed over him, compelling the General to yield his esteemed position to Kagetsuchi, an act born out of sheer intimidation. 
After comfortably settling into his seat, Kagetsuchi cordially addressed the group. It appears that you all have been engaged in an important discussion. Please take your seats, as there is truly nothing to be nervous about. Upon hearing Kagetsuchi's words, each individual dutifully sat down. However, their cautious nature prevented them from blindly accepting Kagetsuchi's reassurances, causing them to remain vigilant and alert in his presence. Once everyone had taken their seats, Kagetsuchi inquired, Pray, tell me, what was the nature of your discussion? And what events led to the convening of this esteemed five-cage summit? Silence permeated the room as Kagetsuchi's question hung in the air. Yet, amidst the quietude, the third rakage found the courage to speak, might it be true that you harbor intentions of capturing all the tailed beasts? Yes, indeed, I am meticulously devising a plan to apprehend every single tailed beast, Kagetsuchi confirmed with conviction. Or, I should say, the wheels of this plan have already been set in motion. Although a wave of confusion washed over the assembled individuals, compelling them to seek clarity on Kagetsuchi's cryptic statement, they collectively suppressed their curiosity. In that moment, Anoki mustered the courage to pose a query, what prompts your need to secure the tailed beasts? Ah, there exists two rather straightforward reasons, Kagetsuchi calmly elucidated. Firstly, due to my inherent strength, I am more than capable of wresting the tailed beasts from your grasp. Secondly, I am driven by a desire for my Yuzumaki clan to reign as the most formidable force, even in my absence or demise. Thus, the room remained filled with a blend of intrigue, uncertainty, and a deepened understanding of Kagetsuchi's. To be completely honest, I came here after receiving accurate and reliable information that all of you were gathering with the purpose of attending an important meeting. Interestingly enough, right after my intense confrontation with Madara, I had a premonition that Madara would undoubtedly spread news about me. So, it didn't come as a surprise to me that you all received the news from him, said Kagetsuchi, his words resonating deeply within the minds of all those present. I couldn't care less about your actions or intentions, but the mere thought of you challenging me was not only unexpected, but also somewhat unacceptable. It's akin to how an elephant would feel when faced with a challenge from an ant. The elephant would undoubtedly feel a profound sense of discomfort and dismay, wouldn't it? Continued Kagetsuchi, his tone filled with a mixture of arrogance and disdain. Despite the humiliation each cage felt upon being compared to an insignificant ant, none of them dared to display any form of dissatisfaction. They understood all too well that expressing their discontent could result in instantaneous death at the hands of Kagetsuchi, who possessed formidable power. Consequently, I have taken it upon myself to make a specific announcement today. I hereby declare war on all of you, and I offer you the liberty to choose any battlefield you desire. However, be forewarned that if any harm comes to my clan members, you shall undoubtedly face severe consequences. Furthermore, let it be known that on this battlefield, a strict rule shall be enforced. No major village is to engage in attacks against each other's villages, until the battle reaches its conclusive end, declared Kagetsuchi, his fiery riots irradiating an intense heat that permeated the entire room. The sheer temperature alone had the potential to incinerate nearly everything within its vicinity. With conviction, the third rakage stood up and voiced his agreement, stating, I wholeheartedly support this rule. Following the rakage's endorsement, the remaining cages also voiced their support for the rule set forth by Kagetsuchi, acknowledging its necessity in these trying times. After much deliberation, it was decided that the battle would take place precisely one week later, allowing ample time for preparation and strategizing. As the meeting drew to a close, Kagetsuchi rose from his seat, exclaiming, I challenge you all to surprise me in the impending battle, for I eagerly await your futile attempts to outwit me. With those final words, he tapped his crutch in the air, causing the atmosphere to ripple like water. Suddenly, a rift in the fabric of space materialized before him, and with a confident stride, Kagetsuchi stepped into the rift, disappearing from the iron country, and leaving behind an air of anticipation and uncertainty. All the cages there breathed a sigh of relief as soon as Kagetsuchi left the conference room. The air seemed to relax, giving the worn-out leaders a temporary break from the tension. After standing since Kagetsuchi's entrance, the general of the Iron Country finally gave in and slumped onto a separate chair. He was unable to take Kagetsuchi's previous position because of the weight of fear that had been hanging over him. Just then, a soldier snuck up behind the general and leaned in to sneak a private word into his ear. The general nodded in agreement as though the soldier's remarks had touched a nerve inside of him. He made a purposeful but quiet movement to clear his throat, in an effort to get everyone in the room to pay attention. 
There are members of Anbu from each village who deliver news from the Yuzumaki country, he said, addressing the audience in an assertive manner. Quick to react, the Rekage immediately said, bring them in, without delay. The soldier quickly left the room in response to the Rekage's order, only to return a short while later with the Anbu members. Each Anbu agent entered the cage's chamber with an attitude of the utmost respect while wearing their distinguishing outfit. Each Anbu agent had a whispered conversation with their superior, a communication that served as a measure of trust and truthfulness. They weren't given permission to proceed until their identities and loyalty were established. The cages looked at one another as their expressions changed in response to the news. What are the plans of Yuzumaki country? The wreckage asked, breaking the stillness. Anoki's statement, yeah, that doesn't align with the direction of any big villages, showed how perplexed the cages were. Everyone in attendance was perplexed. At this point, Arachimaru moved close and spoke to Hiruzen, you appear to be forgetting something, sensei. The major villages do not hold all of the tailed beasts. Everyone in the room was moved by Arachimaru's comments, and a sudden insight hit them all. Takikakur was pronounced by the cages almost simultaneously. The third Kazukiich commented, it appears that Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi is training his clan members, instead of joining them. They must be seeking to catch the seven-tailed beast. What should we do? The Mizukich asked, his voice filled with confusion. The third Reikich firmly said, nothing should be done. We just don't have the luxury of diverting our attention away from the impending conflict with Kagetsuchi. His remarks exuded determination and urgency. The cage reached a unanimous decision. Each leader recognized the validity of the Reikich's point of view, seeing the critical need of devoting all of their efforts toward battling Kagetsuchi, rather than being involved in extraneous things. As I previously stated, I am confident in my capacity to defeat Kagetsuchi, if we can somehow contain him, Anoki, the Tsuchikich, remarked. Despite the difficulties they were facing, his tone was upbeat. The Reikich responded with a reasonable concern, saying, Well your confidence is commendable, have you not noticed his mastery of space-time ninjutsu, which allows him to travel long distances with ease? The most difficult challenge we must overcome is restraint. His statements were realistic and unsettling. This remark seemed to increase Inoki's rage, prompting him to react forcefully. Do you have a superior answer, then? His speech was filled with rage and defiance. Hiruzen, the Hokage, stepped in to try to calm the situation down. Rather than indulging in pointless debates, we should rely on our village ninjas and speak with our village clans. We can create a comprehensive plan if we work together. Let's get together in two days to complete our strategy. His words were loaded with knowledge and diplomacy. The cage nodded in response, convinced by Hiruzen's diplomatic approach. Anoki took a dramatic step, rising from his chair and declaring, Today's five cage summit has come to an end. We will reassemble in this room in two days to choose the best terrain for our combat with Kagetsuchi on that day. Every cage present nodded silently, the weight of their obligations obvious in their eyes. They departed the conference room one by one, bidding farewell to the Iron Country, and beginning their respective journeys back to their villages. Finally, the next morning in Kanoha, Harrison sat with the heads of various clans and some elite jonin inside the Hokage's office. Everyone had a scroll that contained all of the information from the Five Cage Summit. I would like to hear your opinions on this matter, Hiruzen said after everyone had finished reading. Nara Shinichi stood up and spoke his mind, saying, Given Mido and Mensama's power, it shouldn't be impossible to temporarily restrain Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. If all of the cage unleash their most powerful attacks within that time frame, there is a good chance of inflicting significant damage on Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. Tsunade stood up and announced something on behalf of her grandmother. All eyes were drawn to Tsunade, eager to hear what she had to say on Mido's behalf. My grandmother expressed her dissatisfaction with the darkness that has descended on our village. She lacks the will and courage to confront her uncle in a dark village where everywhere there is politics. As a result, she will not take part in the battle against her uncle. This decision, however, only applies to her and not to the entire Senju clan. The Senju clan will take an active role in the battle Tsunade's identity was revealed. The room fell silent as everyone absorbed Tsunade's words, reflecting on the significance of Mido's decision. Hiruzen wasn't taken aback by this decision, he had anticipated it. He had seen it coming, and although the reason given was blunt, he had already suspected that Mido would refuse to fight Kagetsuchi. Nodding, Hiruzen said, we understand. Inform her that she won't need to battle her uncle. Tsunade settled back into her seat upon hearing the response. 
the Haru interjected, but if the Nine-Tailed Jinchuriki doesn't participate, we will already be at a disadvantage from the beginning. No need for further discussion. We cannot afford any internal conflicts at this point, declared Hiruzen. Since we now know that Mido-sama will not participate, we must plan accordingly, added Hiruzen. Subsequently, a series of debates ensued to determine the strategy, taking into account the actions of other villages. Every move was carefully considered as they prepared to fight Kagasuchi as an alliance. Simultaneously, discussions were underway in all the major villages, including Takikakur. Takakid-sama, the Uzumaki clan is moving towards our village and will likely arrive soon, informed one of the ninjas standing before the Takakid, a man in his fifties who currently held the position of Takakid in Takikakur. But what could they want from us? Have you discovered anything? Takakich pondered deeply. The ninjas in the room went into deep thought, and silence ruled. However, the sound of a knock on the door soon broke the silence. A ninja entered the Takakich's office and announced, Takakich sama a ninja from the Uzumaki clan, has expressed the clan head's desire to meet with you. Takakich nodded and inquired, is our army prepared? Yes, Takakich sama the army is ready, and we stand prepared to engage at a moment's notice, replied one of the ninjas, who appeared to be a jonin of Takigakur. And Takakich nodded and instructed the newly arrived ninja, go and inform them that I am willing to meet the head of the Uzumaki clan. However, he must come alone and unarmed. Similarly, I will stand before our respective village armies, maintaining a safe distance. The ninja nodded and departed to carry out the given instructions. Quite a significant distance away from Takigakur, situated in a remote location where the esteemed higher-ups of the Uzumaki clan had assembled, one of the elders respectfully addressed Fuso, the esteemed clan head. Clan head, may I inquire as to what we are awaiting? Why don't we initiate an assault on Takigakur and capture the formidable Seven Tails? To this, Fuso calmly responded, No, if it is possible to handle the situation peacefully, there is no need to resort to force. However, the elder persisted, eager to express their viewpoint. Before they could continue, Fuso interrupted, emphasizing, Although we have been entrusted by Grand Uncle to refine our skills, it does not necessarily imply that we must engage in battle. Opportunities to enhance our abilities will arise countless times, and this sentiment is not exclusive to me, but shared by respected Grand Uncle. The elders and other dissenting members, harboring dissatisfaction with Fuso's initial pursuit of a peaceful resolution, reluctantly remained silent, adhering to Kagetsuchi's final decision. An hour later, two imposing armies stood face to face, their warriors poised for confrontation. Taking the forefront were Fuso, the indomitable Yuzumaki clan head, and Hizoka, the esteemed Takakich of Takigakur. Curiosity Pete, Hizoka initiated the conversation, inquiring, what has brought the Uzumaki clan members here, accompanied by their formidable army? I fail to discern any transgression on Takigakur's part that would warrant such an assertive stance. In response, Fuso compositely stated, your esteemed village possesses something that the Uzumaki clan requires. Should you be willing to relinquish it, we shall depart without causing any harm. Hizoka, maintaining a resolute expression, responded with unwavering determination, You came seeking the coveted holy water, did you not? However, we shall never yield it to you. Instead, we shall confront you fiercely, prepared to fight until our last breath. Fuso, shaking his head disappointingly, elucidated, I acknowledge the potent effects of the holy water, yet its adverse side effects render it akin to poison. Hence, we did not venture here seeking that elixir. We specifically arrived for the seven tails. Should you choose to surrender it, we shall depart peacefully. However, should you resist, the consequences will rest solely on your shoulders. As Yuzo's authoritative voice echoed, his chakra erupted, radiating an intense energy. Following suit, his father Mitsuo unleashed his own formidable chakra to its fullest potential, triggering a chain reaction throughout the Yuzumaki clan's ranks. Each and every jonin, imbued with determination, released their chakra simultaneously, resulting in a palpably tense atmosphere. Observing this display of power, Hizoka couldn't help but be drenched in a cold sweat. He could discern the strength possessed by two cage-level warriors and over 50 battle-hardened jonins, while within his village, he stood as an esteemed elite jonin, with a modest group of approximately 20 comrades. The realization dawned upon him that victory was improbable, but he couldn't fathom allowing a foreign adversary to invade their village and seize the coveted tailed beast. Thus, Hizoka reached a resolute decision. I categorically reject your proposition. 
We shall never relinquish the seven-tailed beast and shall valiantly fight until our last breath, declared the unwavering Takakage. With a solemn nod, Fuzo acknowledged Hizoka's response, uttering the words, as you wish. With that, both leaders returned to their respective armies, preparing for the imminent clash that would determine the fate of Takigakur and the Yuzumaki clan's ultimate objective. When Hizoka returned to the camp, he addressed his comrades, saying, You must have heard the intentions of the Yuzumaki clan. Do any of you believe that my decision was erroneous? No, Takakich-sama. You made the right choice, and we stand prepared to fight until our last breath, responded one of the Jonins. Witnessing the unwavering support from his fellow warriors, Hizoka nodded in appreciation. With a resolute expression, Hizoka retrieved a bottle filled with water and proclaimed, This is our village's only hope. He proceeded to divide the water into 20 small flasks, and distributed them among the Jonins of Takigakur, stating, for the future of our village. Grasping the flasks firmly, the Jonins nodded, their determination shining brightly. Fuso said, it appears that we are destined to engage in battle with them, and so be it, after going back to where the Yuzumaki army was stationed. He turned to the elders and declared, with conviction in his voice, let's split up our powerful army into four sections. I'll be in charge of the first section, and the respected elders will be in charge of the other three. Additionally, the third and second armies of our troops will combine with the fourth section of our forces, which will tactically assemble behind Takigakur. By using this tactical plan, we can guarantee that no Takigakur ninja will be able to escape our grasp. Fuso drew them in and firmly said, should our foes chose to engage, they must be ready to pay a huge price. The warriors present nodded in agreement and recognition as his words rang forth. Fuso looked at his father with curiosity and asked, Father, are you really positive that you won't need additional teams to capture the Seven Tails? Mitsuo answered with a confident tone, No, my son, there is no need. Kashina, a few skilled Yuzumaki Jonins, and I have the skills required to capture the Seven Tails. It's also important to note that this war is being fought with the participation of the entire Takigakur Ninja Army. Even if Kashina set out on this errand by herself, she would definitely infiltrate Takigakur and leave without running into any difficulties. But she would find that capturing the seven-tailed beast was an impossible feat. Therefore, it is my responsibility to carry out this project. You just focus on your own fight while I take care of the seven tails. Following that, Mitsuo gathered Kashina and their dedicated team, embarking on their mission to capture the seven tails. In the meantime, Fuso, commander of the Yuzumaki army, launched a ferocious attack on Takigakur's forefront, the Takakage's home territory. In accordance with their predetermined strategy, a section of their men stood steadfastly by Fuso's side to serve as a defense, while the remaining soldiers expertly dispersed to launch simultaneous attacks on Takigakur from the left and right flanks. The Yuzumaki ninjas presented a mesmerizing picture to keen onlookers who fixed their focus on them. A group of ninjas moving steadily forward with purposeful movements, all in an effort to get to the Takigakur's rear. Here, in the heart of the battlefield, the overwhelming dominance of the Yuzumaki ninjas becomes strikingly evident. It was an absolute massacre, where the Yuzumaki clan members showcased not only their formidable sealing abilities, but also their unparalleled physical strength. And if these extraordinary traits weren't enough, each Yuzumaki ninja carried an abundance of explosive tags. Even the mere deployment of these explosive tags alone would suffice to utterly decimate the opposing ninjas from Takigakur. Fuso started a merciless killing spree in the midst of this chaotic show, slaughtering Chunin and Jenin with unrestrained violence. With each ferocious punch, his engulfed in flames, fists dealt fatal blows, leaving a trail of crumpled Chunin and Jenin in his wake. To everyone's surprise, his adamantine ceiling chains showed a strange sentience, slithering through the air as if they had their own eyes, and easily entangling and strangling unwary ninjas within their grasp, sealing their fates with unshakable finality. Takakich was one of the spectators of this incredible exhibition of strength, and when he saw how pointless it would be to fight Fuso, he became aware of his own inadequacies in this dangerous situation. Takakich turned to the holy water in a last-ditch effort to change the course of events, taking a firm hold of it, and downing it in one determined swallow. The holy water he drank caused such an incredible chakra surge, that the ground underneath him shook and cracked. Takakich hurried towards Fuso after realizing that time was a valuable resource that he could not afford to waste. He was motivated by an unshakable will to face his foe head-on. Fuso was aware of this burst of chakra, which caused him to quickly whirl around and strike Takakich with a powerful fist. 
both combatants momentarily backed away as the earth under them cracked as a result of their fists colliding. Fuso saw a chance, so he summoned several fireballs and shot them at Takakich. The Takakage's use of chakra was similar to Hayuga clan's revolving heaven technique, which allowed him to effectively defend himself from the attack. It was not that Takakage lacked knowledge of ninjutsu, quite the contrary, he excelled in water-style ninjutsu. However, if his chakra could serve as a defense and safeguard him against ninjutsu attacks, then why waste time with evasive tactics? With this in mind, Takakage charged at Fuso, effortlessly deflecting each fireball with his bare hand. Closing in on Fuso, he unleashed a powerful punch to Fuso's chest. To his surprise, Fuso neither dodged nor defended against the blow, but allowed it to connect. For a fleeting moment, Dao crept into Takakage's mind regarding the wisdom of Yuzumaki clan's leader. However, his doubts swiftly vanished when his fist struck Fuso, resulting in that specific area of Fuso's body being engulfed in flames, and his fist went through. Witnessing this unexpected turn of events, Takakage was left in a state of shock. Initially, he contemplated the possibility of an illusion, but then he realized that his chakra's manic state rendered him immune to such deceptions. His questions were soon answered as Fuso retaliated, delivering a powerful punch that sent Takakich hurtling backward. Not only that, but Fuso also pursued him relentlessly, with several adamantine chains emerging from his body, attempting to ensnare Takakich. Aware of the dire consequences of falling into Fuso's clutches, Takakich resolved to avoid being captured at all costs. Fuso and Takakich's intense battle raged on for another 10 torturous minutes. Takakich's breaths became heavier, indicating his increasing exhaustion, while the once formidable chakra code enveloping him faded away. The obvious signs were clear. The potent hero water's effects were wearing off. Fuso, on the other hand, remained unaffected, with the stamina and determination to fight at full speed for at least another hour. Takakage's expression revealed a deep sense of regret as he faced Fuso. It was caused not only by his failure to defeat his opponent, but also by the grim realization that victory for Takigakur was now nearly impossible. Takakage witnessed Takigakur's forces being encircled by members of the formidable Yuzumaki clan, his ruthless efficiency in killing Takigakur ninjas, left no doubt about their superiority. When he decided to engage in combat with the formidable Yuzumaki clan, he expected to be able to inflict some damage alongside the village's skilled jonin. Despite their consumption of the potent hero water, none of the jonin who drank it, were able to defeat their Yuzumaki opponents. Even with the increased chakra levels obtained from the hero water, they were still inferior to the Yuzumaki family members in every way, as the latter possessed an even greater abundance of chakra. While Takakich was contemplating this disheartening reality, he was abruptly interrupted by an audible boom emanating from within the village. Not only did the resounding boom reach his ears, but it was accompanied by the mighty Seven Tails reverberating roar. So you sent your father to find the Seven Tails. That explains why I didn't see him on the battlefield. However, I'm perplexed as to how you found the Seven Tails, given that it's been sealed, and no perception technique can find it, Takakich inquired, his bewilderment evident. In the presence of the Yuzumaki clan, you're discussing sealing, Fuso remarked, shaking his head. He then continued speaking, let's bring this battle to an end. You're also nearing your limits. You're correct. I'm reaching my limit, but I refuse to surrender. Prepare yourself for my ultimate attack, Takakich declared resolutely, his voice filled with determination. Embarking upon a sequence of hand seals, Ram Horse Bird, subsequently unleashing his ninjutsu, the water release. Tornado of water. And since this particular ninjutsu encompassed nearly every ounce of Takakich's chakra, the resulting water tornado grew immensely in size, and surged towards Fuso. On the opposing side, Fuso refused to be outshone and swiftly performed hand seals, invoking the power of fire release. Fire tornado. Consequently, two colossal tornadoes materialize, one blazing with the intensity of fire, and the other surging with water. Despite water's innate advantage in suppressing fire, Fuso's mastery of fire nature chakra, greatly augmented by Kagasuchi's aid, elevated the temperature of his fire release to unprecedented levels. Consequently, the water tornado struggled to quell the ferocious might of the fire tornado, leading to the continuous evaporation of water from the watery cyclone. Gradually, the ninjutsu dissipated, and as it faded away, Takakich gradually descended to the ground. His entire body lacked any trace of chakra, and even his breath began to slow its rhythm. The side effects took hold, signaling Takakich's impending demise. 
He knew that the chakra boost he had obtained had come at the cost of his life force. Takakic addressed Fuso in a weak voice, saying, Please let my village go. Had you heeded our advice earlier, we never intended to bring ruin upon your village, Fuso responded. Takakic found solace in his final moments after hearing Fuso's words, and he died peacefully. For the next 15 minutes, the battle raged on until not a single Takigakur ninja remained alive on the battlefield. Fuso found solace in the tranquility as the noise from Takigakur village gradually faded. It appears that our father has successfully apprehended the seven tails, he murmured under his breath. Following the war conclusion, the Yuzumaki clan diligently assessed their casualties, and began the laborious task of organizing the remnants scattered across the battlefield. Finally, Fuzo occupied the largest tent in a makeshift campsite erected by Yuzumaki clan members. At that precise moment, a respected elder approached him and said, Fortunately, no members of the Yuzumaki clan have died. However, our civilian ninjas, whom we had trained, met a tragic end. Approximately 30 people were killed in the battle, and another 40 were severely injured. Even if they survive, their dreams of a lifelong ninja journey are crushed. Fuso acknowledged the statement and expressed, the outcomes are indeed impressive, and the families of the deceased ninjas will receive a substantial pension. Moreover, if their children show potential to become ninjas, their pension will be further augmented. The elder affirmed this, noting that the decision had been made prior to the war. At that moment, Mitsuo and Kashina, accompanied by their team, entered the camp. Mitsuo held a pot in his hands as Fuso stood up to welcome his father, remarking, It appears that the capture went smoothly. Congratulations, father. Mitsuo acknowledged the remark and responded, Although it presented difficulties, we were ultimately successful in capturing it. Fuso nodded and turned to the elder, stating, Our objectives here have been accomplished. We will rest here for the night and depart promptly tomorrow morning. Having heard Fuso's words, the elder nodded and exited the tent to make the necessary preparations. The army of the Uzumaki clan joyfully made their way into the Uzumaki country after two days, where they were warmly welcomed by the enthusiastic members of the Uzumaki country. As they set foot on the land, the soldiers wore genuine smiles on their faces, exuding excitement and anticipation. The people of the Uzumaki country eagerly extended their greetings, filled with joy and gratitude for the arrival of their clan's army. In the Uzushiakich building, Kagasuchi sat in the main seat of the meeting room with his eyes closed. At that moment, Mitsuo entered the office with Fuso and others and approached Kagasuchi. Mitsuo placed a pot on the table in front of Kagasuchi and said, Uncle, in this pot, the seven tails is sealed, which we have captured. Kagasuchi opened his eyes, looked at everyone, nodded, and said, It's good to see you all back, including the Uzumaki clan members who have returned alive. As for the civilians who lost their lives, we will create a memorial for them. The memorial stone will be erected, bearing their names and achievements. It won't be limited to them alone, but also to those who contributed to the prosperity of Yuzushiagakur before their passing. That's an excellent proposal, Grand Uncle. I will definitely implement it. The memorial stone will not only honor those who fought for Yuzushiagakur, but also those who contributed to its growth. It will be an honor for them and their families for generations to come, inspiring creativity and leading our Yuzumaki clan to prosper," said Fuso. Then Mitsuo stepped forward and asked, Should we seal the seven tails in a Yuzumaki clan member train for it? Kagetsuchi shook his head and replied, No, first I need to make sure these tailed beasts understand the consequences of disobeying the orders of their hosts. The best way to do that is to make them feel pain. What I need is a perfect Jinchuriki, not a flawed piece where the tailed beasts rebel from time to time, causing losses. The tailed beasts must cooperate perfectly with the Jinchuriki. As a member of the Yuzumaki clan, the Jinchuriki will be specially trained to be a perfect host, capable of handling them. We will then have 9 cage level powerhouses, even stronger than the average cage level powerhouse, explained Kagetsuchi. After saying that, Kagetsuchi picked up the pot in which the Seven Tails was captured, used Shunpo to leave the Yuzushiakich building, and finally departed from Yuzushiagakur. After traveling quite far, he reached a remote corner of the Yuzumaki country, where he unsealed the pot and released the Seven Tails. As soon as the seal was undone, the Seven Tails emerged from the pot, returning to its massive size, and let out a loud roar. Kagetsuchi was able to sense frustration and unwillingness in the Seven Tails, but he calmly said, Quiet down. Nine formidable adamantine chains emerged from his very being as a result of his words. 
The kunai-like pointed tips of these adamantine ceiling chains impaled every feather, body part, and sinew of the seven tails, firmly fastening it to the ground. The seven tails yearned to be free, but its efforts were futile, because the adamantine ceiling chain restrained even its own maw, preventing any movement. Now that you are quiet, I will tell you that you have been captured by the Yuzumaki clan to be sealed inside a Jinchuriki's body, further increasing the strength of Yuzushi Agakur. You have two choices. Either you become companions with the Jinchuriki and live a good life where both of you are respected by the members of Yuzushi Agakur, or I will destroy your consciousness, leaving you as a core of chakra that can be used by the Jinchuriki as they see fit, said Kagasuchi calmly. To allow the seven tails to speak, Kagasuchi removed the adamantine chain from its mouth. Never. Even if you kill me, I will be reborn again. You can't threaten me, said the seven tails as soon as it was able to speak. Your confidence comes from the sage of six paths, correct? Said Kagasuchi. As soon as his voice fell, the seven-tailed beast was shocked and asked, How do you know this? I know many things that you can't even imagine, said Kagasuchi. I wanted to make things easier for you, but if you don't want that, so be it, said Kagasuchi, while tightly tying up the seven tails. He then stood in front of it and tapped the tip of his crutch on the head of the seven tails. As soon as Kagasuchi's crutch touched the seven tails head, nothing happened, and the seven tails felt disdainful towards Kagatsuchi, thinking, all talk and nothing happens. But within seconds, its whole body was engulfed in flames, directly affecting its soul. The pain was unimaginable, to the point where the seven tails couldn't even speak. You will endure this torture for the next 24 hours. This will show you that I have the capability to strip you of your consciousness. If even after this you refuse to surrender to Yuzushi Agakur, then you know the consequences, Kagatsuchi said, after which he sealed the seven tails back into the sealing pot. After returning the seven tails to his seal, Kagatsuchi made his way back to the Yuzushi Akic building, and handed the pot back to Mitsuo. He advised, take good care of this and prepare the other pots as well. I'll need them for tomorrow's battle. Mitsuo nodded, wanting to say something to convince Kagatsuchi not to participate in the battle alone, but he stopped himself. He knew that no matter what he said, Kagatsuchi wouldn't listen. Just then, one of the Yuzushi Akage's guards entered the meeting room and bowed to everyone. He announced, a ninja from Kurigakur has arrived and delivered this scroll, stating it's for the fire god. Bring it here, Kagatsuchi commanded. The guard swiftly handed the scroll to Kagatsuchi. Kagatsuchi opened the scroll and read its contents. After finishing, he passed it on to Mitsuo, who also read it. Mitsuo remarked, so they've chosen a desolate area between Kumagakur, Awagakur, and Sunagakur as their battlefield. Hmm, well I don't wish to escalate the bloodshed, as it may breed lasting animosity, it's necessary for the future. We must demonstrate the consequences if anyone dares to defy Yuzushi Agakur, Kagatsuchi stated calmly. Let's see just how much trouble they can cause me, Kagasuchi added with a smile. At this time, in the Shinobi Alliance camp, in the largest tent where all the cages were sitting together, Reikage said, We have received news that the Yuzumaki clan has captured the Seven Tails. Hokage, to reach the Kigakur, they have to pass through the Fire Country. However, you, Kanoha, didn't stop the Yuzumaki clan. As I mentioned before, the one who has had the most dealings with Kagatsuchi is Kanoha. We know that if we had stopped the advancement of the Yuzumaki army, Kagatsuchi would have arrived in an instant. I have no shame in admitting that Kanoha alone can't stop Kagatsuchi, replied Saratobi Hirzen. We should stop these pointless discussions. We in Kanoha have formulated some battle plans that we would like to share with all of you, said Hirzen, turning towards Nara Shinichi. Nara Shinichi nodded and stepped forward, saying, time is of the essence here, so I will get straight to the point. First, I will talk about the strong points of each cage in their village. Rekage excels in close combat, Suchikage is best at long-range attacks, Mizukage is skilled in swordsmanship for close quarters, Kazakiage is proficient in long-range attacks, and Hokage is skilled in long-range attacks, and can also fight in close quarters with his summon, Enma. And one thing that is clear is that the main role in this battle falls on the cages of the major villages and s rank ninjas, so we should focus on this only, continued Nara Shinichi. Now, let's discuss the different abilities that Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi possesses, and how we can counter them. First, his close combat prowess. He is not only skilled in swordsmanship, but he has also effortlessly defeated Haddock Sukumo. I don't need to tell you how powerful Sukumo Senpai's swordsmanship is. 
Secondly, even after being over 100 years old, Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi has the strength to destroy a meteor with his fist. Therefore, I suggest that Reikage, Haddock Sakumo, and Mizukich engage Kagetsuchi in close quarters, and Hokage will join in close combat if he sees an opportunity. The other cages will provide assistance with their long-range attacks from behind, said Narashinichi. This proposal is good, but the biggest problem is his fire. The temperature of the fire he releases is very high, said the third Reikage. Yes, I was going to come to that. Kurigakur is skilled in water ninjutsu, and Sunagakur excels in wind release ninjutsu. If we combine water release ninjutsu and wind release ninjutsu, we can create a large area of ice. The ninjas from Uwagakur can form an earth wall barrier, which will shield other ninjas from being affected, said Narashinichi. This is a good strategy, but it will only be enough to hold him back for a few moments. We can't defeat Kagetsuchi, said Anoki. Yes, you are right. However, this is the time that the Nara clan needs. When you are able to hold him back, we will be able to bind him with our clan's jutsu, and Suchikage will use this opportunity to launch his dust release on Kagetsuchi to finish him off, said Narashinichi. A good plan indeed. We can follow this. I agree with this plan, said the third Reikage. I have no objections either, said the Mizukage. I agree too, said the Kazukage. Everyone agreed to the plan proposed by Narashinichi. Lastly, I would like to request that if we can use the Jinchuriki in the battle, it would be for the best. I know that most of you are considering protecting your respective Jinchuriki by keeping them sealed in a safe place. However, I must remind you that if Kagetsuchi wins, even if we hide the Jinchuriki at the end of the world, he will find them. So, what we need to focus on is fighting Kagetsuchi with all our strength, and having the Jinchuriki will boost our strength even further, said Narashinichi. That reminds me, where is Senju Mido? Shouldn't she be here? Asked the Rikage. She will not be taking part in the battle. As you know, she fought Kagetsuchi in the past, and Kagetsuchi sealed the Nine Tails soul, preventing Mido-sama from fighting for her life again. We decided to keep this a secret at the time for obvious reasons, said Nara Shinichi, as this was the best explanation they could come up with for Mido's absence. They can't say Mido won't fight because of village politics. The other cages nodded after hearing this, and they believed the reason given by Kinoha was reasonable. It is understandable that no village can reveal its weaknesses. However, some cages, like Inoki and the third Reikage, regretted not attacking Kinoha. They believed that such an attack would have at least resulted in gaining a significant amount of resources for their villages. As you mentioned the Jinchuriki, currently, no village has a perfect Jinchuriki. If we were to bring the Jinchuriki to the battlefield, there is a high chance that they would go berserk and harm our own village ninjas. Instead of being helpful, they would become a nuisance, so it is best to seal them, said Inoki. Yes, I agree. Utilizing Jinchuriki or tailed beasts would do us more harm than good, Reikage concurred with Inoki. After every cage rejected the proposal, Narashinichi wasn't disappointed as this was also within his calculations. He stated this mainly so that no other village could claim that Kanoha didn't utilize its Jinchuriki in the battle. Following that, the positioning of the army was discussed, and the meeting concluded. Each cage returned to their tent with heavy hearts, knowing that they might not survive tomorrow, or that many of their village ninjas would die. The whole world was anxiously awaiting the outcome of this war, as it would determine the future of the ninja world. The direction in which the ninja world moved depended on the result of this battle. The next day, at noon, the entire Shinobi Alliance army was prepared for battle, and the cages stood at the front, ready and waiting for the arrival of Kagetsuchi. They had been waiting since morning. At the peak of noon, the clear sky suddenly changed, becoming cloudy with thunder rumbling. A tear in the space opened up, and a pillar of flame descended from the sky, connecting with the ground. Standing within the pillar of flame was Kagetsuchi. Slowly, the space rift closed. Surrounded by ninjas from all major villages, Kagasuchi spoke, It seems that you have prepared well for this battle. Let me test how ready you truly are. As Kagasuchi's voice faded, the fire pillar began to shrink vertically while expanding horizontally. From a distance, it appeared as if a large pillar was falling, and the fire spreading horizontally, resembled a wave of fire traveling towards the Shinobi Alliance. The height of the fire wave was almost 3 meters tall. Immediately used a combination of water and wind, a voice resonated in the minds of all the Jonins, leading the teams for the combined attack. It was clearly the work of the Yamanaka clan members. 
Upon receiving the order, the Jonins quickly commanded, use combination ninjutsu, and demonstrate to the fire god, that fire can be defeated by water, or even ice if necessary. Orders like these echoed throughout the battlefield, and the ninjas from Karigakur and Sunagakur, who were already prepared, immediately employed water release and cooled the water with wind release. Finally, when the fire wave and the chilled water wave collided, a massive amount of water vapor was released, covering almost the entire battlefield. This continued for nearly a minute before both the water and fire waves dissipated. As the chief commander said, this man is truly a one-man army, said one of the ninjas. Yeah, we are mere support. The real battle force is the cage of all the villages, added another. Having witnessed just a random attack from Kagatsuchi, the allied shinobi army was forced to cooperate in order to counter it. The cages nodded to each other and launched their attack on Kagatsuchi. In a meticulously orchestrated plan, the third rakage launched the initial assault, cloaking himself in crackling lightning. His lightning release chakra mode granted him incredible speed, yet Kagasuchi effortlessly countered every strike with remarkable ease. Sensing the need for reinforcement, Sukumo swiftly entered the fray, his sword slicing through the air toward Kagatsuchi with deadly precision. Kagatsuchi deftly parried Sukumo's onslaught, their weapons clashing in a display of raw power. Though the crutch in Kagatsuchi's grip remained unscathed, the ground beneath them trembled and cracked, testament to the immense force unleashed by their clash. Seizing this opportune moment, the rakage redoubled his assault, his punches aimed true. However, with each strike, instead of landing on Kagatsuchi, Rekich experienced an excruciating pain reverberating through his own body. Kagatsuchi's masterful technique was unveiled he infused his fingertips with Ryatsu. Each time Kagatsuchi deflected the Rekich's attacks, he retaliated with precision, his fingers grazing Rekich's form. The slightest contact caused injuries that pierced through the lightning release chakra mode's regenerative capabilities. The Rekage's body, although healing rapidly, was inundated with the agonizing sensation of each wound inflicted by Kagatsuchi's deceptively simple fingertips. As the battle raged on, another element gnawed at the Rekage's spirit, intensifying his pain. He had grand ambitions of demonstrating to the world his body's impranability, and why his body is known as the strongest shield. Kagatsuchi, on the other hand, effortlessly breached his defenses, puncturing his formidable physique with his ordinary-looking fingers. The humiliation coursing through the Rekage's veins overtook the physical pain. You have the audacity to be so absent-minded in my presence, especially while engaged in combat with me, Kagasuchi mocked, his voice tinged with amusement and contempt. With those taunting words, he seizes the opportunity to deliver a pinpoint strike, his clenched fist slamming into the Rekage's stomach with ferocious force. The Rekage convulsed as a spray of blood erupted from his mouth as his body was propelled backward, airborne for a brief moment before crashing to the ground. The battlefield echoed with the collective gasps of onlookers, witnessing the once invincible Rekage crumple before their eyes specifically ninjas from Kumagakur. Although Rekich was sent flying, the rest of the cages did not stop to check on him, because they were in combat, and couldn't afford to lose their rhythm. Irizen sprang into action after Kagatsuchi's powerful punch knocked the Rekich to the ground. He quickly extended his adamantine staff from the side and struck Kagatsuchi from behind, catching him off guard. Kagatsuchi, on the other hand, quickly regained his composure, using Shunpo to vanish from Hirazen's attack and reappear beside him, fist clenched and poised to strike. Reacting with lightning speed, Hirazen instinctively increased the size of the adamantine staff, holding it steadfastly in front of him as a defensive measure. With a thunderous impact, Kagasuchi's fists collided with the staff, sending shockwaves through the air. Though the adamantine staff managed to withstand the force of Kagatsuchi's blow, a few hairline cracks appeared on its previously unblemished surface. Despite the staff's fortitude, the sheer magnitude of Kagatsuchi's attack proved overwhelming. Hirazen was propelled backward, his body soaring through the air, like a kite caught in a strong gust. The force of the impact rattled his bones and temporarily disoriented him. Hirazen surveyed the damage done to his trusted adamantine staff, as he struggled to regain his composure. The few cracks that marred its once impenetrable form, served as a stark reminder of his opponent's formidable strength. Emma, are you okay? Hirazen inquired. During the intense battle, the Kazakiyage noticed that two fellow cages had been knocked out, so he decided to attack Kagatsuchi until they were healed. He quickly performed his signature move, the Iron Sand Gathering Assault. He shaped the Iron Sand into formidable high-density constructs, poised to strike his opponent, Kagatsuchi, with masterful control. 
However, Kagatsuchi, ever vigilant, anticipated the Kazukiji's move. With an explosive impact, the ball pierced through the construct, tearing it asunder. The iron sand, no match for the devastating power of Kagasuchi's attack, disintegrated in the wake of the lightning's passage. Realizing the vulnerability of his ninjutsu against Kagatsuchi's overwhelming assault, the Kazakiage swiftly adapted. He swiftly conjured a large sphere made of tightly compacted iron sand, forming a protective barrier around himself. Simultaneously, he deftly shifted his position, evading the path of the lightning bolt. He knew that while the sphere could only partially slow down the incoming attack, it would not be enough to completely block it. Despite his efforts, the lightning bolt managed to pierce through the right shoulder of the Kazakiage, inflicting a painful wound. The Mizukage infused his sword with water, shaping it into a formidable drill. With lightning speed, he materialized before Kagatsuchi, thrusting his weapon towards his opponent, as if attempting a lethal stab. However, Kagatsuchi swiftly countered by driving his cane directly at the Mizukage. The force of the impact not only shattered the water drill, but also devastated the Mizukage's right upper torso. When Reikage and Hokage, who had been healed by Tsunade and the medical team, returned and saw Mizukage's death, they were stunned, as were Noki and Kazukiage, who were unable to comprehend what had just occurred, because Hokage and Reikage, who had been hit by Kagatsuchi, were fine, but Mizukage was killed as if he was some weak genin. And it's not like Mizukage was frail or anything, but it appears that Kagatsuchi purposefully used his full strength to kill him. The first cage was killed in today's battle, and the rest of the cages were solemn, because they didn't know when Kagasuchi would decide to fight them and kill them in an instant. Everyone in the cage looked at each other and nodded. Third Reikage used lightning chakra mode, and his hand was covered in black lighting, while Hiruzen used multiple shadow clone jutsu to create four shadow clones, and Anoki floated in the air, ready to fight Kagatsuchi. Anoki used Earth Release. Earth Corridor first, causing the earth around Kagatsuchi to rise up, creating a cavern and leaving two small openings. Here is an use water release. Exploding water colliding wave in the first opening, and Rekich used lightning release. Black Panther and Panther made of black lightning in the second opening that Anoki left. And Kagatsuchi, who was and outside the earth cavern, every cage was waiting for the outcome of their combined attack, and Kazukiich wasn't standing there doing nothing. He reinforced the outer area of the cavern with his iron sand, and by creating a solid shape, he closed the only opening of the cavern. Just as the cages and all the ninjas were standing there with expectations, the cavern began to shake, and cracks began to appear on it. Kazakiich tried his best to reinforce the outer part of the cavern with his iron sand, but it proved useless, and the cavern exploded, and Kagasuchi was standing in the middle unharmed, with his fiery Ryutsu releasing with full force, and as soon as his Ryutsu spread to the battlefield, the weak ninjas began to fall to the ground, and the majority of them became unconscious. I find myself struggling even to maintain a standing position, what is happening to me? Gasped one of the Iwagakur ninjas, a tone of bewilderment in his voice. A sense of desperation filled the air as another Karigakur ninja spoke up, we are unable to withstand the sheer pressure emanating from his ore. How can we possibly hope to defeat him? The overwhelming Ryutsu emitted by Kagatsuchi had an astonishing effect on those who managed to remain on their feet, leaving them in a state of panic, as if their very souls were being commanded to surrender. The sensation was akin to a voice resonating within, compelling them to acknowledge the futility of their efforts. In the midst of the chaos, Nara Shinichi observed the situation calmly, unfazed by the turn of events. This had occurred before in their homeland, Kanoha, and he had already taken precautions, surrounding himself with members of the Yamanaka clan. Their exceptional mental strength provided some immunity to Kagatsuchi's formidable ore. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Shinichi gave clear instructions to the Yamanaka clan ninjas, gather all the Nara clan members immediately. This might be our best chance to turn the tide in our favor. Let us not miss this golden opportunity, for it may not come again. The Yamanaka clan ninja responded with a solemn nod, understanding the urgency of the situation. With swift determination, they left to carry out their mission, knowing that time was of the essence. Disappointment tinged Kagasuchi's voice as he remarked, Is this truly the best you can do? Despite planning for an entire week and aligning your efforts, the outcome is underwhelming. A heavy sigh escaped Kagatsuchi, his regret evident as he continued, I had hoped for better. I thought that with ample time, you would devise ingenious plans that could catch me off guard. Upon hearing Kagatsuchi's words, the faces of each cage turned somber, realizing that their combined efforts were not enough to harm him. 
His formidable aura alone shattered their attempts to restrain him. In that crucial moment, the Yamanaka clan ninja returned, accompanied by the rest of the Nara clan. Strategically stationed miles away from the battlefield, the Nara clan had anticipated Kagatsuchi's aura's impact, which caused some unfortunate ninjas to faint. They couldn't afford to lose even one ninja's support, as their combined strength was paramount to containing Kagatsuchi. Addressing the other Nara clan members, Nara Shinichi spoke with conviction, This is a golden opportunity for our clan to become heroes not just in our village, but in the whole world. Let us show the world the indomitable might of the Nara clan. Together, we can rise above this challenge and emerge victorious. With a unified sense of purpose, the Nara clan prepared to face Kagatsuchi once more, driven by their determination to safeguard their village, and prove their prowess to the world. Yes said the Nara clan, and some of them even started imagining themselves as heroes. Whenever they passed by the streets, the people bowed towards them with respect. Nara Shinichi shattered their imaginations, saying, Now, let's assemble and remember what we have practiced. As soon as Nara Shinichi's voice fell, every member of the Nara clan started assembling in the planned formation. After everything was ready, Nara Shinichi said, Now go. As soon as Nara Shinichi's voice fell, the shadows of every Nara clan member extended and started moving in the direction of Kagatsuchi. They touched Kagatsuchi's shadow completely, and many shadows, like thin needles, attached themselves to Kagatsuchi. The Nara clan members used mainly two techniques. The shadow imitation technique to stop Kagatsuchi from moving, and the shadow sewing technique to bind Kagatsuchi from different sides and sew him to the ground, stopping Kagatsuchi. It wasn't like Kagatsuchi didn't observe the Nara clan coming and their movements, but he let them do what they wanted, because he wanted to see them try their best and destroy them at their best. He needed proper obedience after the war, and that could only come when they fell to spare. The best way was to let them do their best and fail again and again, and when he showed them his real strength, they would realize how childish they were even to think of fighting him. Anoki nodded, flew up in the air, and used us release. Detachment of the Primitive World Technique a massive cube was formed, trapping Kagatsuchi. Every cage waited in anticipation, and then the sphere inside the cube blasted with a boom. After the dust settled, the cube was empty, with nothing inside but blank space. No one. Is it over just like this? Said Drakic with a sluggish and unbelievable face. A few minutes ago, when they were unable to defeat Kagatsuchi, they were in despair, thinking they were going to- The Nara clan contributed the most, said one of the Nara clan members. The other members of the Nara clan also started cheering, with happy smiles on their faces. Nara Shinichi also nodded and had a proud smile on his face. Hiruzen also smiled because it was due to their Kanoha contribution and strategy that they were able to win this war. What made you all laugh? Please tell me the reason so that I can also become happy. As soon as this voice fell, the smiles on everyone's faces became stiff, and they looked stiffly towards the source of the voice. When everyone looked towards the sky, Kagatsuchi was standing there with his crutch, without even a scratch, and with a calm face. In disbelief, Anoki questioned, how is this even possible? You were clearly trapped inside the cube. Kagatsuchi calmly responded, are you certain that you trapped me inside? Because I used a move called Kukenteni, which allowed me to transfer the space I was standing in from inside the cube to the outside. Here is an interjected, we are absolutely certain that you were trapped inside the cube. How did you manage to leave without breaking the cube's wall? You didn't even use the space movement technique you used when you arrived on the battlefield. Such a move was unheard of in their entire lives, leaving them at a loss for words. Before anyone could respond, Kagatsuchi presented an ultimatum, I'll give you all one more chance. Surrender the tail beast to me, and I'll stop here. You won't suffer any further damage. However, if you choose to resist, I will fight with my full power. The room fell into silence as everyone contemplated the options. They realized that defeating Kagatsuchi would be an almost impossible task, and the idea of surrender began to take root in their hearts. Then, a voice spoke up, it was Shio from Sunagagur, acknowledging Kagatsuchi's power, but expressing the concern that surrendering all the tailed beasts would grant him control over the entire world. She refused to become slaves to the Yuzumaki clan, and chose to fight for her own and Sunagagur rights instead. Another Jonin from Sunagakur declared, Yes, we will fight for our rights and face the consequences, rather than becoming slaves. Another ninja stepped forward, his voice resolute, For the future of our family and the prosperity of our village, we shall fight you to the very end. 
Another added, displaying unwavering courage. Death doesn't scare us. We will fight even if it costs us our lives. A chain reaction followed, with every ninja present raising their voices in unison. We will fight until our last breath. The respective cages observed and heard this show of determination from their ninjas. The third rakage asserted, you have your answer. We won't surrender, we will fight to our last breath. The third Kazuki echoed the sentiment, abandoning the fight is not an option, we shall fight until our last breath. The third Suchikich explained, handing over the tailed beast would dishonor the sacrifices of our ancestors who founded our village. Gerizin tightened his grip on his adamantine staff, declaring, my mentors established this village and distributed the tailed beasts to maintain balance. I will not allow you to disrupt that equilibrium. Kagasuchi chuckled dismissively, stating, I may be seen as a villain now, but I care not. My goal is the prosperity of my village and its people, along with peace in the world. This can only be achieved if there's a single ruler to maintain order, not multiple factions fighting and causing chaos and war, which inevitably affects innocent civilians, and kills villagers merely for supplies to support their wars or villages. He continued, reflecting on his earlier show of mercy, initially, I wanted to rule with limited animosity toward me or the Uzumaki clan. However, you've reminded me of something I had forgotten. If I allow you to engage in war, you won't hesitate to massacre entire villages full of innocent people, merely because you seek strongholds or supplies to further your conflicts. He concluded with conviction, but now, I have no reason to hold back. You will witness the full extent of my strength. After Kagetsuchi's voice subsided, he removed his Heiori, bearing his upper body for all to see. His crutch ignited, emitting an intense heat that caused everyone, including the cages, to take notice. Slowly, a magnificent katana with a purple handle was revealed, and a fiery Ryutsu emanated from his body, enveloping each of the cages. Such intense heat. What kind of flames are these? Wondered the rakage. Gripping the katana's handle, Kagetsuchi whispered, reduce all creation to ash. His words were followed by a tremendous release of fire from Raijin Jaka, engulfing the surroundings. The cages found it difficult to withstand the scorching heat without their chakra coats, prompting them to retreat from Kagetsuchi. The gravity of the situation settled upon the faces of the cages, fully aware that combating the heat unleashed by Raijin Jaka carelessly would lead to almost instant death. Narashinichi urgently called out, now, use your most potent ninjutsu to create ice. Don't hold back on your chakra if you want to survive. Prompted by Shinichi's instructions, the ninjas from Karigakur and Sunagakur unleashed their strongest water release techniques, abandoning any reservations about their chakra usage. Simultaneously, the ninjas from Uwagakur employed the earth release. Great mud wall technique, creating massive earthen walls to hold the water that the Karigakur and Sunagakur ninjas were generating. The stored water began to cool down and transform into ice, with the Sunagakur ninjas contributing their own ninjutsu to expedite the process. The battlefield became a scene of intense elemental manipulation, as the ninja alliance desperately countered Kagetsuchi's overwhelming fire, with their most powerful ice and water techniques. Seeing the ninjas of major villages combining their ninjutsu to counter his fire, Kagetsuchi had disdain in his voice, my fire is not something that you can stop. After saying this, Kagetsuchi waved his sword, and a wave of fire was released. As the wave of fire passed over the ice, the ice didn't even turn liquid, it didn't convert into water, but was completely evaporated. Retreat. Leave the area immediately, shouted Narashinichi. But how could the ninjas here be faster than Kagetsuchi's fire? Before they could escape the fire after destroying the mud wall completely, the fire covered these ninjas. Oddly, no sound of shouting or cry for help was heard. Everything was quiet, and listening to the quietness, the whole battlefield also became silent. When the fire finally disappeared, there was nothing but ashes of the people who died. They turned to ashes before they were even able to react to the pain they got, said Narashinichi, with fear and horror on his face. What must be the temperature of the fire to be able to burn those people into ashes within a fraction of seconds? Said the Kazakij with fear. Although we don't know the exact numbers, according to Mito Sama, the temperature of the fire was too much for her even in her Nine Tails form. The fire was capable of burning even the chakra of the Nine Tails, and even after combining the amount of her chakra with the Nine Tails chakra, she wouldn't have been able to fight Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi for more than an hour. And according to Mito Sama's experience, the temperature of the fire is almost six to seven times that of normal fire release, said Hirzen. 
Hearing this, the face of every cage became solemn because they knew they were unable to fend off such a huge temperature. The best method to defend themselves was to resist such attacks and then fight accordingly. However, only two cages were able to defend themselves and fight at the same time. The third Reikage and the third Kazakiage. Even the Kazakiage would have difficulty fighting Kagetsuchi, as what he wields is iron sand that can be easily melted by Kagetsuchi's fire. Kagetsuchi didn't care about the horror and fear of the other ninjas, he continued his attack and used the Netsuchi Goku, Flames of Hell. Eight pillars of flame were erected around different corners of the army, trapping the soldiers inside. Nara Shinichi was also caught within it, and the other ninjas tried to save themselves with water release, but to their horror, they couldn't even conjure water. The Kurigakur ninjas attempted to use hidden in the mist technique, but they couldn't activate it even once. The temperature was rising rapidly. What is this place? It seems like we are standing in a furnace, said one ninja, falling to the ground as his body burned. I don't want to die. I want to live. Let me live pleaded another ninja, his unwillingness to die evident in his words. Before he could say more, his body turned to charcoal. Some smart ninjas tried using earth release to create a dome of earth around them, but this proved even more painful, and they died more agonizingly than the other ninjas who were outside in direct contact with the fire. Almost half of the Shinobi Alliance army was trapped in the flames of hell, causing the cages great pain in their hearts. Why are you attacking our army? If you have guts, then fight us fair and square. Why kill all the weak ninjas from our village? Shouted the third Reikage. Kagasuchi didn't say anything and remained quiet. Seeing this, the Reikage clenched his fist in frustration. The third Reikage, using his lightning release lightning chakra mode to shield himself from the flames, said with determination, I'll create an opening for the ninjas inside to let them out. Don't be foolish, Reikage. The ninjas are a lost cause and can't be saved even if you create an opening for them. Just by coming near the wall of flames, they will die. They are not like us, who can shield themselves, said the Hokage. Damn it. Then how am I supposed to watch all my subordinates die inside like this, said the Reikage, with even more intensified chakra around him. I know exactly what to do, said the Kazakiage, determination on his face. With his iron sand wing, he left the place. This didn't escape the perception of Kagetsuchi, he wanted to see what the Kazakiage had in mind. After a few minutes, as soon as the fire hell subsided, leaving only charred bodies and molten earth all around, the Kazakiage also returned. The Kazakiage landed quite close to Kagetsuchi as the fire around Kagetsuchi calmed down. He threw a man at the feet of Kagetsuchi and said, This is the Jinchuriki of the One Tail, and the One Tail is inside him. I am also willing to withdraw ninjas from Sunagakur. I just request that you let my Sunagakur ninjas leave. The other cages became angry at the Kazakiage, and the first to shout was the Reikage, Have you gone mad, Kazakiage, that you are giving your Jinchuriki to the Uzumaki clan? And what about our alliance? I haven't gone mad, but rather my eyes are open now. Just think about what we are doing right now just standing there defending ourselves like turtles, and watching our village ninjas die one by one. We don't have any plan on how to counter any of Uzumaki Kagetsuchi's abilities. So, instead of watching my village ninjas die one by one to extinction, I'm very willing to sacrifice one tailed beast for other ninjas of my village, and the future of my village, retorted the Kazakiage. Just as the Reikage wanted to retort, one more voice was heard, esteemed fire god I am an elder of Karigakur, and am very capable of making decisions on behalf of the Mizukage. We, Karigakur, are also willing to retreat and surrender the Jinchuriki of both the tailed beasts. The decisions of the Kazakiage and Karigakur Elder were also approved by the ninjas of their respective villages, all because of fear of Kagetsuchi and hopelessness to fight against him. These bastards, Reikage clenched his fist after seeing this, but at this time Mabui came near him and said, Reikage Sama, please stop and think with a cool hat first. Defeating him is almost impossible for us, and even for you, it is impossible, so please try to understand. Never. I am not going to sacrifice my nephew for this. I will fight with my life on the line. I am not a coward like these two bastards, said the third Reikage, pointing towards the Kazakiage and elder of Karigakur. Seeing the stubbornness on the face of Reikage, Mabui sighed and didn't speak any further, because she knows that Reikage will not listen to her in this matter. At this time, the Tsuchikage was also not going to give up because of the will of stone that he had followed since his childhood, and the first Reikage had taught him this. 
But at this moment, a few elderly looking people came to Inoki, and one of them stepped forward, saying, Suchikich, you have to understand that it is impossible to win against Uzumaki Kagasuchi. We all suggest that sacrificing the tailed beasts for the well-being of the village isn't a bad option. Inoki looked at them, and anger was clearly visible on his face. You all are saying this when you were the ones who wanted to fight more than anyone, shouting that you all would die, but never surrendered the tailed beasts to the Uzumaki clan. At that time, we had confidence that, with the combined strength of the cages of major villages, Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi would surely lose, not to mention your Kekei Tota dust release, on which we had confidence. But even after being hit by your dust release, he wasn't harmed in the slightest, said another elderly looking person. After listening to this, Anoki fell into deep hesitation and thinking. His thinking was interrupted by the voice of another elderly man. Yes, now is not the time to think much. Before Uzumaki Kagetsuchi goes on another rampage, make a decision quickly, Suchikich. Okay, bring both the Jinchurikas to the battlefield, said Anoki. Anoki also realizes that rather than fighting Kagetsuchi blindly, it is best if they give up on time and save their remaining forces, or else Kagetsuchi will go to their village later to destroy it, which he cannot watch as at Suchikich. We have already ordered to bring the Jinchurikas to the battlefield. They will reach here any moment, said the elderly man. Anoki clenched his fist in anger as they brought the Jinchuriki without his permission and said, I will deal with all of you later. After saying that, he also went in front of Kagetsuchi and said, We, from Uwagakur, are also willing to surrender our tailed beast. Here, only the Hokage and Rakage remained on the battlefield. The Rakage looked towards the Hokage and said, Are you also going to give up, Hokage? Although I hate to say it, I don't think we have any option after this. In our hearts, after seeing the battle between Madara and Kagetsuchi, we were clear that defeating him was close to impossible. We had hoped that if we cages united and fought with Kagetsuchi, giving our all, then there might be a chance to win this battle. But now that three of the cages have already surrendered, and due to some internal matters of the village, I am sorry, but I can't afford more losses in my village, said Hiruzen with an apologetic tone. After saying that, Hiruzen also left, leaving Reikich alone here. Hiruzen stepped forward in front of Kagetsuchi and said, I assume that you have already talked with Mido-sama, and the way she behaved, she had confidence in you that you will not lose. So, I can only say that we, from Konoha, surrender and will not fight you any further. Kagetsuchi nodded, and then he looked towards the Reikage and said, What is your decision? Will you continue fighting me? I will never just as the Reikage was about to declare that he would never give up, and would fight Kagetsuchi to his last breath. He was interrupted by a voice, we, from Kumagakur, also surrender. The Rakage looked in the direction of the voice and saw Blue Bee coming towards him. What are you talking about? You don't have to do such a thing. I am not a coward who gives up on my village members, said the Rakage. I know, but you have to understand that if by sacrificing myself, I can save ninjas of Kumagakur, then so be it, replied Blue Bee looked towards the ninjas of Kumagakur. Do they look like they are willing to sacrifice themselves? They are also unwilling to die here. Hearing this, the Rakage clenched his fist and still didn't want to admit his defeat. He wasn't as saddened that he might lose his nephew, as much as he was hurt, due to the fact that he had to admit defeat in front of his enemy. You don't have to feel guilt. Remember, the well-being of the village is more important than one person's life, and you, as the Rakage, know this better than me, said Blue Bee. The Rakage then looked towards the ninjas of Kumagakur, and they also had hope in their eyes. It was clearly visible that they didn't want to fight either, like the other village ninjas. The Rakage finally sighed, filled with helplessness, and went in front of Kagetsuchi. He said, I also surrender the tailed beast of my village, and am willing to retreat with the rest of my army. As the Rakage spoke those words, the weight of defeat settled heavily upon his shoulders. His decision to surrender the tailed beast was not taken lightly, but he knew it was the best course of action to protect his village and its people from further devastation. After the Rakage announced his surrender, the battle came to an end without a doubt. Kagetsuchi also took back his Shikai, and his Ryajin Jaka once again became a simple-looking crutch. Within a few minutes, all seven tailed beasts were present in front of Kagetsuchi, and each tailed beast was in its sealed form. First, Kagetsuchi came in front of the monk in whom the one tail was sealed. The seal placed on the monk to hold one tail inside him, was quite childish from Kagetsuchi's point of view. He immediately broke the seal placed on the monk, and one tail came out from the monk's body with a loud roar. 
As the one tail was observing everything from inside the monk, as soon as he came out, he shouted with a roar, you want to capture me easily. HMPH, you're dreaming. Just as the one tail finished speaking, a chain pierced his head from above and pinned him to the ground. Other chains followed and bound the one tail in place. It was adamantine sealing chains of Yuzumaki Kagasuchi. Now, it wasn't that hard, was it? Said Kagasuchi. Roar. Let me go, shouted the one tail. Kagasuchi didn't say anything to the one tail and used a summoning technique. As soon as he used the summoning technique, seven pots appeared in front of him, and on every pot, there was a number written in Japanese from one to six and eight. Then Kagatsuchi looked at the one tail and said, My fire can burn even the soul of a creature. So, well in the pot, you will go through intense pain. Remember that the pain I am giving you is to let you know that I can destroy your consciousness whenever I want. If you dare to disobey the Yuzumaki clan and your next Jinchuriki host, then I will reduce you to just a lump of chakra with almost no intelligence that can be used to power the Jinchuriki. And this was not only heard by the one tail, but also by all the other tailed beasts in the cages. After the cages heard this, they looked towards each other and had only one thought. Yuzumaki Kagasuchi is going to create the perfect Jinchuriki, which is what they have been trying to do for decades now. Except for Kumagakur, no village has the ability to produce a perfect Jinchuriki. After saying that, Kagasuchi made a hand seal, and the one tail was dragged into the pot with the number one written on it, and the lid of the pot was closed. Finally, Kagasuchi did the same thing to every other tailed beast, and he did it with ease. No tailed beast was able to resist the adamantine chains of Kagatsuchi and his sealing. When Kagatsuchi was finally done, some people had a look of pity for the Jinchuriki of their respective villages, who died after the tailed beast was extracted from them. Obviously, it was just pity, they were not sad or anything for the death of the Jinchuriki, except for the Reikich, who lost his nephew. But to the surprise of everyone, the Jinchuriki were not dead. They looked weak but were not dying, which should have been the case, as soon as the tailed beast was extracted from the bodies of the Jinchuriki. Kagasuchi explained, seeing the confusion on the faces of everyone present there, I have sealed a small portion of the tailed beast's chakra inside them, due to which they will not die. That chakra can also be used as a trump card for these Jinchuriki, as it can boost their physical prowess and chakra for a short period of time. But remember, it is only for one time use, as after you burn the tailed beast's chakra, you will die immediately. The cages were shocked as they didn't know such a method even existed. Just because of this reason, the way the Yuzumaki clan can manipulate the tailed beast chakra with the help of their sealing technique, the other villages coveted the sealing techniques of the Yuzumaki family. But these cages didn't know that the Yuzumaki clan and Kagatsuchi himself focused on all this after Kagatsuchi took charge of the Yuzumaki clan again. Now that all this is done, I announce that after three days, there will be another meeting, and in that meeting, I will announce some important things concerning future of your major villages, said Kagatsuchi. After saying that, Kagatsuchi reverse summoned the pots and started leaving, but at this time, the elder of Kurigakur asked, if I may ask, then it seemed that you killed our Mizuki specifically. May I know the reason? The reason is simple. He was being manipulated by Chihemidar, so he died by my hands. Do an autopsy, and you will understand the rest. After saying this, Kagasuchi opened a tear in space and disappeared into it, and the space tear also closed behind him. After Kagatsuchi left, everyone stood here confused and silent. So, what do you think he will announce during the meeting? Asked Inoki. How would I know, but obviously, it will be about what is going to happen with us next as losers, said the Rikich. The elder of Kurigakur ordered the immediate autopsy of the Mizukij, but as soon as the ninjas from Kurigakur got near the Mizukij's body, it exploded with a boom. Seeing this, everyone present here was stunned because as soon as they wanted to collect the corpse of the Mizukij, the corpse exploded. It seems that what Yuzumaki Kagatsuchi said is correct. Damn it, just because of Madar, we of Kurigakur became enemies with the Yuzumaki clan, said the Kurigakur elder, and other high-level members of Kurigakur, also shared the same emotion as the Kurigakur elder. No one blamed themselves for their greed in seeking the sealing techniques when they attacked the Yuzumaki clan. Instead, they dumped everything on Ichihemidar. Kagatsuchi soon reached Yuzumaki village, and directly teleported to his house where Mitsuo, Fuso, and Kashina were waiting for him. As soon as everyone present in the room saw Kagatsuchi, they felt relieved to see him unharmed. It's good to see you fine, uncle, said Mitsuo. Why wouldn't I be fine? I didn't even use my full strength, and they lost. 
My purpose of showing them the disparity in our strength was achieved, said Kagetsuchi while sitting down on his seat. Mitsuo and the others also nodded after hearing this, and Fuso brought all the pots that Kagetsuchi had reverse summoned, and placed them in front of him. Kagetsuchi looked at the pots and said, Tomorrow, seal every tailed beast inside the Jinchuriki, and as for Kashina, after I extract the nine tail from Mido, I will plant it myself on her. Kurama is a tailed beast who is on a whole other level, and handling him will be very difficult for you guys. Fuso replied, Yes, Grand Uncle, I will make sure that it is done first thing in the morning. Kagetsuchi nodded and said, Make sure that the seal is designed in stages, so that it can be opened gradually. Even if the tailed beasts cooperate, there is a high chance that their negative emotions will affect the Jinchuriki, and the Jinchuriki may lose control. Yes, Grand Uncle, we are taking special care of this, replied Fuso. Now, Mitsuo there is an important task I want to assign to you, said Kagetsuchi. Yes, uncle, please tell me, said Mitsuo, ready for the task. I want you, along with the other retired elders, to research a sealing method by which a tailed beast cloak can be bestowed upon every Uzumaki clan member using the chakra of the tailed beasts. This cloak should serve as a trump card for the Uzumaki clan members, without putting their lives at risk, said Kagetsuchi, seeking something similar to what Kurama did for the Shinobi Alliance army during Fourth Ninja War. This will further boost the strength of the Uzumaki clan. I am certain that I, along with the other retired elders, will work on it diligently, said Mitsuo. And this will boost the strength of the Uzumaki clan members by at least two times or even more. However, remember that with this power, the members of the Uzumaki clan may become arrogant. So, do whatever is required, but I don't want arrogance among the Uzumaki clan members, similar to the Ichiha clan members, said Kagetsuchi, while explaining, but his voice also contained a hint of warning. Fuso understood the seriousness and consequences if clan members became arrogant. Don't worry, Grand Uncle. I will make sure nothing like this happens within the Uzumaki clan members. After the discussion was done, Kagetsuchi said, Leave, I need to rest. As Kagetsuchi said this, everyone started leaving, but Kashina felt quite dejected. After the incident in Konoha, Kagetsuchi was disappointed in her, and hadn't talked much to her as he usually did in the past. Just as Kashina was about to leave the gate of Kagetsuchi's house, Kagetsuchi's voice came, Kashina, come tomorrow morning. I want to check how far you have progressed. Kashina's saddened expression turned into a smile as she happily turned around and said, Yes, Grandpa, I will surely come tomorrow morning. After saying that, Kashina left with Mitsuo and Fuso, and both Mitsuo and Fuso were also happy to see her in high spirits. The next morning, all the tailed beasts from the one tails to the eight tails, were sealed into the chosen Jinchuriki, including Sakura and Hiroshi. Hiroshi became the Jinchuriki of the eight tails, while Sarada became the Jinchuriki of the seven tails. After being burned by Kagetsuchi's fire, all the tailed beasts were exhausted and unable to move much, making it easy for Fuso and the others to seal them. Even if they could move, the tailed beasts wouldn't have resisted because they understood that they would surely die at the hands of Kagetsuchi, if he wanted to kill them. A few minutes ago. In a spiritual space, all the tailed beasts gathered with Kagetsuchi standing in the middle. So what have you decided? Asked Kagetsuchi. Do we even have a choice here? I don't mind, said Jayuki. I also don't want to die, so I agree, said Shukaku. After that, everyone nodded. Before, they were arrogant because they knew they would never die permanently. Even if they were killed, they would be resurrected within few years, ensuring their immortality. Moreover, the villagers needed them, so they were certain that nothing will happen to them. But now the situation was different. The person standing in front of them was capable of killing them permanently. Kagasuchi nodded and said, good, before disappearing from the spiritual space. At present, all the Jinchuriki who were selected were among the best geniuses present in the Yuzumaki clan. Even within this group, the Jinchuriki were chosen based on their potential. Ninjas with more potential were made the Jinchuriki of more powerful tailed beasts. Meaning that the Jinchuriki of Jayuki, Hiroshi, was the best among them, and the Jinchuriki with the lowest potential was given the weakest tailed beast Shukao. The reason was simple. A Jinchuriki with a base strength of cage level, would be far stronger than a Jinchuriki of same tailed beast, with the base strength of a Jonin level. The stronger Jinchuriki would have a more significant power boost compared to the weaker ones. Ding ding, the sound of metal clashing, was heard in the courtyard of Kagetsuchi's house. Kashina was attacking Kagetsuchi, who was simply defending himself. 
Kagasuchi noticed a flaw in Kashina's sword move and swiftly countered, placing his sword at her neck. Since morning, Kashina and Kagasuchi had been practicing, and this was not the first time Kashina had lost to Kagasuchi. Kashina sat on the ground, panting heavily. She was tired from fighting for the past four hours. You have improved quite a lot in this short amount of time. It seems that your fights with Root Ninjas and the Seven Tails have helped you significantly, said Kagatsuchi, also sitting on a chair. Thank you, Grandpa. I will surely work even harder to become more powerful, said Yuzumaki Kashina. Hm, not at Kagatsuchi. I will teach you a new jutsu called True Fire of Samadhi. This fire can be extinguished by wind or water release, and it can burn a person at such a speed, that even if they have high regenerative abilities, it will still burn them faster than they can regenerate, said Kagasuchi. Such a powerful jutsu. I have never heard of it. Did you invent it on your own? Asked Kashina with bright eyes. I wouldn't say that I am the creator of this jutsu, but I have taken inspiration from someone. With my mastery over fire, I was able to create the ninjutsu on my own, said Kagasuchi. Wow, that's amazing, said Kashina. Watch the hand seals carefully and follow my lead, said Kagasuchi, and Kashina nodded in agreement. Kagasuchi performed the hand seals, tiger dog horse rat. After that, Kagasuchi started explaining how to make the fire more potent, and taught the method to master the true fire of Samadhi. For the next two days, Kagasuchi continued teaching Kashina as he usually did in the past. As told by Kagasuchi, every cage arrived at the Yuzumaki village. When seen by the members of the Yuzumaki village, although no one was happy to see these cages, as each of the cages was, in a way, trying to erase their existence, they were ordered not to show hate towards the guests, as they were invited by Kagatsuchi himself. Although the people of the Yuzumaki village tried not to show anything, how could they hide their dissatisfaction from the cages of different villages? The cages also felt quite embarrassed by this. They were coming to a village they had considered worthless in the past, and had thought this village could be crushed by them any time. However, due to Kagatsuchi's presence, everything changed, and now they were on their knees, uncertain of the decisions Kagatsuchi would make for them. Every cage had come prepared to die, as they didn't know if they would survive today. They had already announced the next cage in line if they were to die in Yuzumaki village. In a hall prepared for the meeting of all cages with Kagatsuchi, one by one, cages started arriving, and everyone was greeted by Fuso himself. When the Hokage arrived, Yuzumaki Mido also arrived. Seeing her, many old people had mixed feelings about her, but they didn't know what to do as Kagatsuchi had clearly prohibited her from entering Yuzumaki country. Seeing their embarrassment, Mido said, Don't worry, I didn't come here to meet you. But according to the agreement, I came as the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails. After hearing Mido's words, the embarrassment of everyone present disappeared. Come with me, and, let's go to my house. Father and Kashina will be happy to see you, said Fuso. No, as I said, I came here with the Hokage as a Jinchuriki. I can't go to your house as it will make uncle's words false, Mido rejected Fuso's offer. Okay, and, as you wish. Fuso then guided her and the Hokage to their respective seats. After a few minutes, when all the cages were seated, Kagasuchi arrived with Mitsuo and Kashina. After Kagasuchi sat down, he said, I will not waffle and will get right to the point. I know you all have doubts about whether you will live or die or what will be the fate of your village, but you don't have to worry. Sparing your Jinchuriki's life is the best proof. My only motto for attacking you was to establish peace and make my Yuzumaki clan far superior to anyone, so that even if they get into the same situation as in the past due to their weakness, they can still come out on top. And lastly, to establish my strength, as for what I am going to announce next, said Kagasuchi. Now let's talk about why I called you here. I want to create all the major villages as holy places for the ninjas, a place specifically for the ninjas and their families. Additionally, I want to demolish the system of daimyos, as even though they are weaker, they rule over the ninjas. The daimyos will be responsible for taking care of the affairs of all the civilians, said Kagasuchi. As soon as Kagasuchi's voice fell everyone who were present here changed. However, that is impossible, those daimyos will never submit to these rules. Kazuki had stated. But when did I say that you have to beg the daimyo? Said Kagasuchi. You all know very well why Daimyo are able to rule over you, and that is because of the money they have. If they don't have money, then they are nothing. Till now, they were able to rule over you. The reason is simple. You don't want to disobey them due to the rules from the warring states period. 
At that time, Daimyo had money and resources, due to which they were able to hire any clan. No matter how powerful a clan may be, they can't oppose multiple clans at a time, so the clans feared the Daimyos. Even after the Sengoku era was gone, the ninjas didn't oppose the Daimyo, even now. There is also another reason that if, by chance, one major village wants to take over the daimyo, then the rest of the villages will not allow this, so that the power equality remains always the same. On top of that, most of you have lived through the Warring States period, and not to mention the elders in your villages who share the same opinion and always respect the daimyos, said Kagasuchi. But now, this has to be changed, the power and money will be concentrated in one place, said Kagasuchi. Hearing Kagasuchi's words, all the cages fell into hesitation, except for the Kazakiage, as it will be best for his son Agakur if money and resources are concentrated in one place. Seeing the hesitation on the face of every cage present here, Kagasuchi tapped his crutch on the ground, and, while releasing his Ryutsu, he said, Don't forget, I am not asking you, but I am telling you. As soon as the cages felt the pressure, the hesitation on their faces completely disappeared, and everyone agreed with Kagasuchi immediately. Now that we have concluded the matter of the daimyo, let us address another critical concern, the main reason for the ongoing battles between all of you. The imbalance of resources and restricted access to them. With the daimyo under your control, you won't face any problems of restriction, and the resources can move freely. Different countries, renowned for their abundant resources like food, minerals, and other commodities, can trade equally without any limitations. All of this will be managed by a committee, comprising cages from each major village, and led by the clan head of Yuzumaki clan. If there are matters that cannot be decided by you all, only then will I interfere, otherwise, I will refrain from meddling, explained Kagetsuchi. At this moment, Mitsuo, who stood behind Kagetsuchi, hesitantly spoke up, Forgive me, uncle, if I am being presumptuous, but granting them so much power could be very dangerous. It might lead to a situation similar to when it was Senju Hashirama. I understand your concerns, but the circumstances will be entirely different with me. I am destined to live for the next 1000 years without any issues. Moreover, as time passes, I won't weaken but grow stronger, Kagetsuchi confidently asserted. The words of Kagetsuchi left everyone present in shock. But Mitsuo attempted to argue, but Kagetsuchi raised his hand to stop him from speaking further. I know you find this hard to believe, and I don't expect you to trust me blindly. However, let us not forget that we have nine Jinchuriki, and on top of that, a perfect Jinchuriki. The difference in strength between a perfect Jinchuriki and an imperfect one is vast, Kagetsuchi added convincingly. Mitsuo nodded in agreement and stepped back, allowing Kagetsuchi to continue. With a reassuring tone, Kagetsuchi said, If any of you have any doubts or concerns, feel free to ask. Anoki, being inquisitive, asked, What cost do we have to bear? The final cost will be decided during the committee meeting led by the Yuzumaki clan head, Kagetsuchi replied. All the cages nodded in understanding and acceptance. I must reiterate my primary goal. Peace. However, let it be known that anyone who dares to disturb this peace will face my wrath, Kagasuchi declared, his gaze fixed on each of the cages. After conveying this powerful message, Kagasuchi departed, leaving the cages to contemplate the unexpected turn of events. The following day, the central topic of discussion revolved around the war compensation that other villages would have to pay to the Yuzumaki village. Yuzo proposed an alternative approach, suggesting that they pay taxes to Yuzumaki country on every transaction made. A new rule was established that any transaction conducted without the consent of the governing committee, would be deemed illegal. Governing committee was name given to the committee formed by five cages and Yuzumaki clan head. While the cages expressed a satisfaction with the prospect of a permanent tax burden throughout their lives, they also realized that refusal would lead to dire consequences at the hands of Kagetsuchi. They now understood the purpose behind Kagetsuchi's display of strength to the world, it rendered them powerless even when dealing with a mere representative of Kagetsuchi. At a remote place in Yuzumaki country, Kagetsuchi, Mido, Mitsuo, and Kashina were standing. Kagetsuchi nodded, and Mido stood in front of him. Kagetsuchi placed his hand on her stomach and slowly extracted the nine tails from her, leaving a small part of Kurama's chakra inside her. As soon as Karam emerged, its huge towering size of over 300 meters, could be seen from within the Yuzumaki village. Karam roared in anger, Mido, are you really going to trade me off? I am not trading you off. Instead, I have grown old and will not live much longer. 
Therefore, you need a new host to live within, and Kashina is the best host for you, said Mido, supported by Mitsuo as she weakened after the nine tails were extracted from her. Stinky fox, do not resist, it's of no use, came a voice inside Karama's head. What are you doing here, little Tanuki? Said Karama with disdain in his voice. What he's saying is correct. There's no use in resisting in front of that old man, or else you will suffer for a torturous 24 hours, came another voice, it was Jayuki. Huh? You're here too, Jayuki? Said Karama. Soon, Karama sensed and felt that all the tailed beasts were present in the Uzumaki village. What is happening here? How is it possible that all of these tailed beasts are captured by Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi? And the villagers willingly handed over the tailed beasts to Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi. Kurama was confused by this. Kurama didn't know anything about it. After Mido mentioned that she was ready to give up Kurama at any time to Kagetsuchi, Kurama became angry. After those events, Mido sealed Kurama completely and cut off Kurama's perception of the outside world. You don't have to be confused, nor do you have to submit willingly. I will force you into submission, said Kagasuchi, who had been watching Karama's antics. After saying that, all nine adamantine sealing chains appeared from his body, binding Karama completely, and rendering him completely immobile. Then, Kashina brought a sealing pot, and like the other tailed beasts, Karama was also placed in the specially made sealing pot for him. Today's events were carefully carried out without any hindrance. The next day, Kurama was sealed inside Kashina. At this time, Mitsuo asked, Uncle, I understand that after these tailed beasts are sealed, they behave well. But if they rebel and somehow have the thought to die with the Jinchuriki, then we might lose both the talented ninja and the tailed beast. The seal I placed on them is not simple. If they try to break the seal on their own, they will be suppressed by my fire immediately, so they can't overpower the Jinchuriki ever, said Kagasuchi. Mitsuo nodded in understanding and silently praised Kagetsuchi for his foresight. After Kurama was sealed inside Kashina, Mido stood in front of Kagetsuchi and said, Uncle, I have a request. Um? Speak, what request do you have? Asked Kagetsuchi. I want to take Kashina with me. I have been Kurama's Jinchuriki and can guide her properly in this way. Also, I am quite alone in the Senju clan with nobody to talk to. So, if Kashina is with me, I will have someone by my side, said Mido. Hmm, I don't have any problem with Kashina going with you. Now, what she requires is experience in the field. Ask her if she wants to go with you. If she agrees, then you can take her with you, said Kagasuchi. At this time, on the terrace of one of the guest rooms in the Yuzumaki village, what do you think, Reikage? Will we ever break free from the influence of the Yuzumaki clan? Said Inoki while looking in the direction where Nine Tails appeared. As long as Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi is alive, it's impossible for us to make even the slightest move, replied Reikich. I understand that much, but even if Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi is not present and somehow he manages to make all the tailed beasts loyal to the Yuzumaki clan and produce perfect Jinchuriki, it will still be challenging for us to change our current situation, remarked Inoki. You're right about that, but there's nothing we can do. We've tried our best, but we face defeat, said Reikich. Let's see how those elders and clan heads react to this governing committee suggested Inoki. HMPH, what can they possibly contribute? The second Inja war happened because of those idiots. After witnessing the battle between Kagetsuchi and Madara, we cages knew that it would be impossible for any of us to win, even if we combined our forces. However, we had to appease them, or they would have created instability in the village. They believe that if the five cages united, Kagetsuchi could be defeated, but the reality is right in front of us, explained Reikich. Yeah, every cage chose to fight just to maintain political stability. Otherwise, why would we foolishly confront Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi? Added Inoki. But your expression was priceless when Yuzumaki Kagetsuchi effortlessly evaded your dust release. One moment you were laughing, and the next it seemed like you were about to cry. Haha, <laughs> Reikich taunted Inoki, making fun of him. Anoki's face turned red with anger, and he clenched his fist as if he were about to attack Reikich immediately. The next day, all the cages left the Yuzumaki village, and Kashina also agreed to depart with Mido after Mido's request to her. After the cages returned to their respective villages, the entire ninja world was once again filled with turmoil, as the cages began implementing Kagetsuchi's orders, taking control of the daimyo and assuming command of the country's finances. The turmoil and chaos persisted for almost a month, but eventually, everything calmed down in the five major countries, just as before. 
However, smaller villages also followed the lead of these major villages, and began staging coups against their respective daimyo, leading to significant unrest in those areas. Witnessing this situation, the Uzumaki clan took action and intervened in the matter. The Uzumaki clan members clearly defined their roles. The administration would be overseen by the daimyo, while military power would be held by the generals who were previously the village Hetzer generals. For important decisions that concerned the future of their country, the permission of both the daimyo and the general would be required. If they were unable to reach a consensus, they could present their arguments to the governing committee which would then make the final decision. If there is any rebellion or unrest caused by the actions of either the daimyo or the general, both of them will be removed from their positions, and new daimyo and general will be appointed for that country. In the end, Kagetsuchi realized his vision of creating a system similar to the Gate 13, which would allow him to maintain balance in the ninja world. After all of this occurred, Kagetsuchi also relaxed, knowing that he no longer had to worry. He understood that in order to resurrect the Ten Tails, all nine tailed beasts were required. Without the revival of the Ten Tails, Kagaya would remain dormant, and aside from Kagaya, no one possessed the strength to oppose him. Moreover, he had significantly altered the timeline of the Naruto world. Time passed under these conditions, until a new period dawned. During this time, prosperity reigned as all the countries thrived. Numerous ninjas received training, even guiding some less skilled individuals in learning ninjutsu applicable to their everyday routines, enriching their lives. This idyllic existence continued throughout the entire ninja world, with its inhabitants experiencing genuine happiness. However, there were also those foolish enough to challenge the regulations established by the governing committee, attempting to foment civil unrest. Such individuals were swiftly quelled by the governing committee through resounding and forceful measures. Somewhere in the universe, above a planet, the silhouette of two individuals was visible, both possessing the Byakugan. It appears that Kagaya has betrayed Isiki, and the leader has commanded us to proceed to the planet where Isiki and Kagaya were, stated one person. Hanashiki Sama, then we should depart immediately, it will take us a long time to reach there, remarked another person. You are correct, Yoshishiki. However, we must wait for this god tree to mature. It will take at least two years, and then another six years to reach the planet where Kagai resides, explained Hanashiki. Yoshishiki nodded after hearing Hanashiki's words, as Hanashiki held a superior position. By the way, how are you faring with your new body? Have you mastered its strength to his peak? inquired Hanashiki. I have grown accustomed to my new body, but it will take me some time to fully harness my peak strength. By the time we arrive at Kagaya's planet, I should be able to utilize my full strength, replied Yoshishiki. Hanashiki nodded. Yoshishiki was sacrificed to the Ten Tails in order to harvest the chakra fruit from the planet. Prior to the sacrifice, he implanted a comma on one of the individuals. Due to this, upon returning to life, he did not regain his peak strength, and will require some time to reach it. On Earth, eight years have passed since Kagetsuchi captured all of the tailed beasts, and the governing committee assumed control over the world's governance. The number of ninjas in major countries has dramatically increased, which is beneficial for their strength, but it has also led to some issues. Those who have become ninjas often look down upon those who are not, creating a sense of inferiority among the non-ninja population. Although the governing committee noticed this problem, they themselves held a similar belief, so they didn't treat it as a grave concern. However, if left unresolved, this issue could potentially cause future complications. Unbeknownst to them, two immensely powerful individuals appeared above Earth. Hanashiki utilized his Byakugan to observe the planet, and, after a few minutes, he spoke with a mocking smile, what a fool Kagai is. Yoshishiki inquired, what did you witness with your all-seeing eye, Hanashiki-sama? Kagaya, who arrived with the Siki, betrayed him and inflicted serious injuries upon him. Following this, she created a chakra fruit which she consumed herself. After that she gave birth to two children, ironically, she was sealed by them on the moon. Yet, I found one intriguing aspect Kagaya's actions seemed to have involved Mama Shiki and Kenshiki as well, explained Hanashiki. This could complicate matters, Hanashiki-sama, cautioned Yoshishiki. You say that as if we are weaker than Mama Shiki and Kenshiki, retorted Hanashiki. Let's proceed to observe the ten tails of this world, suggested Hanashiki, as they entered the atmosphere and swiftly soared in a single direction. In a simple house within the Uzumaki village, Kagetsuchi opened his eyes, causing the fiber that had been surrounding him to vanish. Ding. Congratulations on increasing the template progress by 0.01%. 
testing. Congratulations on increasing the Genryu Sai Shijikuni Yamamoto template to 90%. Ding. Congratulations on unlocking the ability Bankai Zanka no Tachi. Although Kagasuchi was happy after having his Bankai unlocked, his face was solemn as he emerged from his house and gazed toward the sky. Was it an illusion? No, it can't be. With my strength, I can't have illusions. Someone very powerful must have entered Earth's atmosphere. Kashina Kagatsuchi's voice reverberated throughout the Uzumaki village. Kashina, who had been in conversation with a yellow-haired person none other than Minato stood up. Grandpa is calling me. It's been a long time since Grandpa even appeared in front of anyone. It seems something important must have occurred. I'll come as well, said Minato. Kashina simply nodded, and her entire body immediately became covered in yellow chakra the Karama chakra mode that she had successfully mastered. With blinding speed, she appeared in front of an ordinary house located quite a distance away from the Yuzumaki village. Minato also appeared beside her. Kashina entered the house and saw Kagatsuchi sitting on a chair, holding his crutch. Even after so many years, his face remained unchanged, but what had evolved with time was Kagatsuchi's presence it had grown even stronger. Kashina could sense that instead of weakening, Kagatsuchi had become more powerful. Grandpa, you called me. It seems there is a very important task to be done. Tell me, and I will start working on it immediately, said Kashina. Hmm, today I sense that someone very powerful has entered Earth's atmosphere. I want you to inform every major country to be on the lookout for anything abnormal that might happen. Also, inform the scientific department to search for any abnormalities in the atmosphere, said Kagasuchi. Grandpa, is that person even stronger than you? Asked Kashina. I can't be sure whether they are more powerful than me or not, but one thing is certain. That person is at the very least on my level. There is a high chance that they are even more powerful than me, said Kagasuchi. Upon hearing this, Kashina's mouth fell open in shock. To her, there was nothing her grandpa couldn't handle, and no one who could surpass his power. However, hearing this directly from Kagasuchi left her astounded. I understand that this is surprising for you, but time is of the essence. Now, go and report to me if anything abnormal occurs, said Kagasuchi. Kashina nodded and immediately left Kagatsuchi's house to inform her father about this. Minato also bowed slightly towards Kagatsuchi and departed using the Flying Thunder God technique. He was able to sense our presence. As expected of the strongest person alive on this planet, said Hanashiki. At your orders, I can kill that person in an instant, said Yoshishiki. It will not be that easy, said Hanashiki. Is he that strong? Asked Yoshishiki. Hm, Hanashiki nodded in response. Soon, Hanashiki and Yashishiki appeared above the mountain. Hanashiki gave the order, destroy this mountain. Yashishiki clenched his fist, which was covered with red chakra, and punched the mountain. Initially, it seemed that nothing had happened, but soon the entire mountain began to crumble. All that remained were rocks and rubble. If someone had witnessed this attack, they would have been shocked. It was reminiscent of the gentle fist technique of the Hayuga clan, but on a much higher level. The mountain had been destroyed from the inside, giving the appearance that nothing had occurred on the outside. Just as Yashishiki was about to blast away the rubble, from beneath the ground came a massive repulsive force that sent the stones and debris flying outward from the center. As everything calmed down, a large hole could be seen from the outside, shrouded in total darkness. However, within this darkness, a pair of purple eyes with concentric circles emerged Rinnegan. Hanashiki and Yashishiki descended into the hole, where they found an old man with Rinnegan, seated before the Jido statue, Madar. People from the Hayuga clan. Madar inquired, confusion evident in his tone. HMPH, just because of Kagai, these inferior creatures have gained abilities akin to our clans. Although nothing compared to us, it truly infuriates me. She deserves punishment, stated Hanashiki. Madara was taken aback by the mention of this name. He hadn't shared anything about Kagaya, and the fact that they were discussing punishing her, the mother of the Sage of Six Paths, bewildered him. Is this the husk of the ten tails that Kagaya brought to this planet? Hanashiki questioned. You, who call yourself Black Setsu, come out, commanded Hanashiki. No response followed Hanashiki's words. Observing this, Yoshishiki grew angry and shouted, How dare you disrespect Hanashikasama? Yoshishiki targeted Madara's shadow with an attack, but Madara intercepted it, using the almighty push. Though potent enough to halt Yoshishiki's advance, it couldn't force him back. Yoshishiki materialized before Madara, delivering a punch to his face. 
Madara was sent hurtling, and if Hanashiki hadn't advised Yashishiki to hold back at the last moment, Madara might have met his end. Black Setsu seemed inclined to escape, but before it could, a black rot impaled the viscous entity, pinning it in place. Hanashiki emerged before Black Setsu and inquired, Kagaya's will resides within you, correct? Are you from my mother's clan? Black Setsu asked. Yes, the very clan she betrayed, replied Hanashiki. Yashishiki, keep these two alive. We will need them to revive Kagaya. Our leader has instructed us to capture her, directed Hanashiki. Hm. There seems to be a rat here, Hanashiki said. A few minutes ago, Minato, who was following Kagetsuchi's orders and searching for anything abnormal in the direction of the rain country, was resting on a tree to recover his chakra. He had used a lot of chakra by continuously employing the flying thunder god technique. Just as Minato was about to leave to resume his search, he heard a big commotion, and saw a huge mountain crumble before his eyes. Atop that mountain, there were two people. Minato decided to investigate this occurrence because destroying that mountain was no ordinary feat. When he reached the site, he was shocked to find Madara present. The way Madara was decimated within seconds astonished him. It wasn't that Madara was weak, the technique used by Madara was very powerful. However, it didn't even phase the man fighting against him. The words spoken by them were quite confusing for Minato. Not good, I was discovered, said Minato, immediately using the flying thunder god technique to escape. He knew he couldn't survive an attack from these people. And he was correct, just as he left, a lightning arrow struck the exact same spot, causing a massive explosion that nearly vaporized the area. Should I follow him? Asked Yoshishiki. No, let him inform the person he intends to inform. It will save us the trouble of searching for that person. He's the one who possesses all the tailed beasts, and we need those tailed beasts to revive Kagai, said Hanashiki. Within seconds, Minato found himself over 500 kilometers away from his last location. Kashina, who had been searching in close proximity, approached Minato and asked, What happened? Why are you running? Yes, I might have found the individuals whom Kagetsuchi-sama wanted us to locate, replied Minato. What? exclaimed Kashina. Where are they? We need to gather information about them. No, even though you possess great power, they operate on a completely different level. Kagasuchi-sama was correct, they are at least as formidable as he is, explained Minato. Kashina nodded and said, we should inform Grandpa about this. I'll share my chakra with you. She transferred chakra to Minato, so that he could utilize the flying thunder god technique. In less than 10 seconds, they stood in front of Kagasuchi's house. Grandpa, we've brought news as you requested. Please come in, Kagetsuchi's voice emanated from within. Minato and Kashina entered Kagetsuchi's house. Tell me about your discoveries, Kagetsuchi requested. I was investigating in the rain country as per your orders. I heard movement and went to investigate. There were two people attacking Madar. They easily defeated Madar, and they discussed punishing someone named Kagaya. They identified themselves as members of the Atsutsuki clan. As they spotted me, I had to escape, Minato recounted. Kagasuchi shook his head and explained, it's as I anticipated. You didn't really escape, they allowed you to flee. They can travel faster than light, all they need to do is predict your location, and you'll be gone in an instant. Grandpa, you're familiar with them? Kashina inquired. Yes, I'll provide you with a brief overview of the Atsutsuki story. Around 1000 years ago, a woman named Kagaya Atsutsuki, consumed the chakra fruit, becoming the first individual in this world to possess chakra. She gave birth to two children, Hagoromo Atsutsuki and Hamara Atsutsuki. Hagoromo had two sons, Indra and Asur. The Chuha clan descended from Indra, while from Asur emerged two families, the Senju and the Yuzumaki. In essence, our abilities are significantly toned down versions of what the Atsutsuki are capable of, and Kagaya was not even a powerful member of Atsutsuki clan. Kagetsuchi elaborated. They possess this level of power. Exclaimed Kashina in shock. This situation is not a mere concern. If only that were the case, I wouldn't be worried about losing. The primary reason for my concern is their ability to employ something called Shinjutsu. These are abilities that are entirely unpredictable. For instance, some Shinjutsu can reflect the very attacks directed at the user, while another type Kashina had been experiencing increasingly shocking revelations since the morning. Send out orders to every village and country. Instruct them to evacuate the population from an area as large as the fire country. Take the location where I will be engaging the two Atsutsuki as the center, and if possible, expand even further. 
If the civilians don't retreat as quickly as possible, they won't stand a chance of survival. They'll perish, declared Kagesuchi. Will the area of effect truly really be that extensive? Questioned Kashina. Yes, in this battle, I will unleash a level of fire that surpasses anything before. Its power will encompass an area as vast as the fire country, evaporating water within and thinning the air, making survival impossible for civilians, Kagesuchi clarified. Perhaps this battle will be my final one. I entrust the care of the Yuzumaki clan to you. Don't worry, the tailed beasts will be sealed with safeguards. If they dare to break those seals, their demise is certain, Kagesuchi reassured. Grandpa, let me accompany you. I have considerable power, Kashina pleaded with a concerned expression. No, you'll understand why I must forbid it. Remain here, you'll serve as my last line of defense in case they resort to underhanded tactics by taking hostages, Kagesuchi commanded. With that, Kagesuchi's entire body became enveloped in flames, and he soared away. His departure was witnessed by many, and within moments, his speed approached that of light, leaving behind only a luminous trail. At this moment, in the cage office of Yuzumaki Village, there were several officials from the village seated. In the main seat sat the current cage of Yuzumaki Village, Yuzumaki Fuso. What did you say? Granduncle went to fight alone, and you didn't go with him. Why? Asked Fuso. I wanted to, but it was Grandpa's instruction that I should remain here and protect Yuzumaki Village, in case those enemies use any underhanded tricks, replied Kashina. And we don't have time to talk right now. Father, inform every country about Grandpa's instructions, so that they can make appropriate preparations to protect themselves from the aftermath of the battle between Grandpa and those two Atsutsuki, urged Kashina. Do not worry, I have already informed them to prepare a conference call with all the cages, so that we can have a proper discussion, assured Fuso. Just at that moment, a ninja approached Fuso and said, every cage is on the line for the discussion. Fuso nodded and left to speak with the cages. He entered a room with many TVs, each displaying the cages and leaders of different countries who were members of the governing committee. What happened, Fuso? Is there something major that occurred? Inquired the third rakage. Yes, this morning, the individuals you were instructed to search for have been found. In fact, there are two of them, and Grand Uncle has confirmed that they are at least as powerful as him. He has left to confront them, and has instructed the evacuation of all citizens and weak ninjas from the vicinity of the rain country and other countries as far as possible. Otherwise, there will be an unimaginable loss of civilian lives, so we need to act swiftly, explained Fuso. Why our country? Questioned Hanzo at this time. It can be helped, they landed in the rain country and obviously treat the humans of the world as inferior creatures. So, they don't care about the life and death of us humans. The main point is that Grand Uncle said he is going to use a move that will affect his surroundings as large as the fire country, said Fuso. Shouldn't we go and help? Hiruzen asked. No, Grand Uncle clearly stated that it would be useless for us to get involved in this fight, replied Fuso. Who is this enemy anyway? Inquired the Rikage. Fuso then explained everything about the Atsutsuki that Kagetsuchi talked about. There is such a being in this universe, said Hiruzen in shock. Not only him, but the other cages were also shocked by this revelation. After that, the cages wasted no time and went to evacuate the civilians as far as possible. By this time, due to scientific research progress, almost every town or village had a way to contact each other. An hour later Hanashiki-sama, should I go and drag him here myself? Yoshishiki asked. No need, he is coming here himself, replied Hanashiki. Just as Hanashiki's voice fell silent, Kagetsuchi appeared, covered in fire. You made us wait for quite a long time, don't you think? Were you trying to buy time for the evacuation of all the civilians? Rest assured, after killing you, I am going to suck this planet dry and watch everyone die, maybe even let you watch it, said Hanashiki with a smile, but his smile contained ruthlessness. Hmm, as expected of Atsutsuki. I won't expect anything less from you both, remarked Kagetsuchi. From your behavior, I can say that you haven't moved a bit from here, but you still know everything happening in the world. It seems your ability is somewhat related to watching everything in the world or maybe listening, perhaps, said Kagetsuchi with a calm expression. From your talk with your granddaughter, I also concluded one thing. That you know many things about Atsutsuki, about Shinjutsu. After observing your whole life, I know one thing for a fact. That you were in no contact with any Atsutsuki, and by any chance, you never went into any dimension of Atsutsuki, neither did you know anything about Kagaya from anywhere. So, for you, it is impossible to know about us. 
This means only one thing. That you also awake in some kind of shinjutsu, and that too at your dying age. Am I correct? Asked Hanashiki. Hmm, maybe you are correct about that. I did awaken something during my old age, Kagasuchi admitted. Interesting, Yashishiki, our objective has changed. Now we have to capture him alive rather than killing him. For someone to awaken Shinjutsu with such a low concentration of Atsutsuki blood is rare. We must present him to the leader, said Hanashiki. Yes, master, replied Yashishiki. You are good at swordsmanship, right? Well, guess what? I am skilled at handling swords too, Yashishiki said. A yellow sword made of chakra appeared in his hand, and with his fast speed, he appeared in front of Kagetsuchi and slashed at him. Kagetsuchi easily defended the attack with his crutch. The power behind Yashishiki's attack was not small, although it failed to move Kagetsuchi. However, it destroyed the forest behind Kagetsuchi in a 20 meter range. Yashishiki retreated, and Kagetsuchi's crutch caught fire, transforming into a katana with a purple handle. While unsheathing it, Kagetsuchi said, You may be good at handling swords, but you can never best me at swordsmanship. After saying this, Kagetsuchi made a slash at Yashishiki, sending a red sword slash in his direction. Yashishiki thought it was a chakra attack, so he raised his right hand to absorb it. However, he was very wrong, and he couldn't absorb the attack. It hit Yashishiki directly, leaving a deep cut mark on his body, and blood started to spill from the wound. Yashishiki was surprised at first, but then he smiled. Kagetsuchi fell perplexed by Yashishiki's behavior even after being struck by his attack. Instead of being angered, Yashishiki was smiling. However, Kagetsuchi's expression suddenly changed when he noticed that the wound on Yashishiki's body was vanishing. But what truly really caused his expression to change was the sight of blood dripping from Yashishiki's clothing. It appears your ability is to reflect the injuries you receive back onto your opponent, Kagetsuchi remarked calmly. Take him seriously, he possesses regenerative abilities, Hanashiki advised. Understood. Yashishiki replied, swinging his sword vertically, unleashing a large yellow slash that headed straight for Kagetsuchi. Kagetsuchi easily deflected Yashishiki's attack with a swing of his sword. He then utilized Shunpo to appear in front of Yashishiki, and attempted to decapitate him with a single strike. However, Yashishiki, an experienced sword user with incredible reflexes and speed, parried Kagetsuchi's attack, resulting in the creation of a massive crater, where their blades collided. Both Kagetsuchi and Yashishiki continued their intense sword fight, leaving nothing but destruction in their wake. Your strength is impressive for an old man, Yashishiki remarked while clashing swords with Kagetsuchi. You haven't witnessed the full extent of my power yet, Kagetsuchi responded. He seized an opportunity and slashed at Yashishiki's chest again. His blade easily cut through the right side of Yashishiki's chest, causing him to bleed. However, just as before, Yashishiki's wound was once again transferred to Kagetsuchi. It's futile, no matter how many times you wound me, nothing will happen to me, Yashishiki declared. You're correct, even though nothing will harm you directly, transferring your injuries consumes chakra. The more significant the injury you endure, the more chakra you expend to transfer it to me. That means I simply need to inflict severe injuries on you repeatedly, until your chakra is depleted, and you can't fight," Kagetsuchi explained while healing the injury he received from Yoshishiki. You're quite adept at analyzing my ability and identifying its weaknesses. However, you also need chakra to heal the wounds I inflict upon you. Can you really compare to me in terms of chakra? Yoshishiki countered. There is a distinction. I typically don't rely on chakra when I fight, so even if you surpass me in terms of chakra, your chakra consumption is far greater compared to mine," Kagetsuchi replied. With that, he grasped his Ryujin Jaka and declared, reduce all creation to ash. A tremendous amount of fiery Ryutsu emanated from Kagetsuchi's body. What is this energy? It's definitely not chakra, it directly affects the soul. Interesting. I'm more and more inclined to capture this person now, remarked Hanashiki. Kagetsuchi lightly swung his sword, creating a wave of fire that engulfed Yashishiki directly. The temperature of your flames is exceptionally high, I must admit. However, it won't work on me. We've traveled across the universe and encountered stars with even higher temperatures, Yashishiki boasted. I'm aware, but you're not immune to this, are you? You must continually use your chakra to withstand this level of heat, Kagetsuchi pointed out. Kagetsuchi encased Yashishiki within a flame pillar. In response, Yashishiki slashed heavily with his chakra sword, creating an opening in the flame pillar. 
But as soon as an opening appeared, Kagetsuchi materialized in front of Yashishiki, and attempted a diagonal slash from his left shoulder to his right waist. At the last moment, Yashishiki managed to dodge, leaving only a deep diagonal cut on his body, which, as always, was transferred to Kagetsuchi. Why didn't you allow yourself to be cut in half this way? Wouldn't I be dead? Or is it that you can't regenerate your body parts, and will you die after my sword strikes? Kagetsuchi inquired. Yashishiki's expression turned solemn because Kagetsuchi was speaking the truth. Small injuries to his soul could be easily healed, but if any body part were severed along with the soul from his body, he wouldn't be able to regenerate it. Moreover, he would be unable to transfer the injuries he received on his soul to Kagetsuchi. You've disappointed me, Yashishiki. Even after fighting him for so long, you haven't managed to inflict any significant damage on your opponent, Hanashiki remarked. I'm sorry, Hanashiki-sama. I have failed to meet your expectations, Yashishiki replied, lowering his head in shame. Hanashiki vanished and reappeared in front of Kagetsuchi in an instant, holding a spear made of red lightning. He launched an attack at Kagetsuchi, who used his sword to defend himself. However, as Kagetsuchi's sword made contact with the red lightning spear, it didn't actually touch it, but phased through it. Suddenly, the spear materialized and Hanashiki stabbed Kagetsuchi. A similar ability to Kamui. Kagetsuchi pondered. The impact sent Kagetsuchi flying, and the red lightning spear exploded with a resounding boom. At that moment, high above the battlefield where Kagetsuchi and the two Atsutsuki warriors clashed, a few birds were seen in the sky. However, there was a notable distinction. Each of these birds wore a collar with a camera attached to it. Additionally, they carried a small bag on their backs, which transmitted the images of the ongoing battle. These feathered messengers were broadcasting the intense combat to all the major villages. This was created by the scientific department under Rachimer. As the villagers and ninja from various regions watched the battle unfold, they were left utterly stunned. What shocked them the most was witnessing Kagetsuchi sustaining injuries, a sight they had never expected to witness and had never witnessed. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.